land and the territory on west. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. <laughs> Gunsmoke, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Wanted for murder. Wanted for murder. Clay Richards. Clay Richards. Age 31. Height six feet. Eyes brown. Hair red. Eyes brown, hair red. Hey, how'd you like me to print his picture on these notices? I got a woodcut. Well, let me show you. Ernie! Yep? That's your marshal a copy of that front page. Interviewing Clay's wife yesterday, I noticed a tintype on the mantle. Their wedding photograph. So, first thing you know, I snitched it. It's very thoughtful. Yeah. Oh, I'll take it, Ernie. Here. And then I propped it up in front of me and carved me this woodcut. Ain't she prime? Ain't she just elegant? Real elegant. Good likeness, don't you think? Of course, he was seven or eight years younger with the ten type. Yeah, right? it's a good likeness. Cuts his hair short. And Doesn't now, show what uh, makes a law-abiding uh, man like him try to rob a bank. Sort of Doesn't look like a man who it's murdered an old cashier and a Chinese remember. cook who just happened to sure be there. Sure, over it, though. But it's a good likeness. Yes, sir, it is. A picture like this sure dresses up the front page, don't it? Yeah, it's a little masterpiece, Mr. Hightower. A notable contribution to the culture of Dodge City. Well, thank you, Marshal. Does fetch the eye, don't it? I'm printing an extra 500 copies of the weekly, and I bet I sell them all. Too bad the cashier's shot went wild. If he'd managed to kill Clay or even wing him, why, I bet I could sell a thousand extra copies. We must be thankful for the blessings we do receive, Mr. Hightower. Oh, I am, Marshal, I am. Why, just before it happened yesterday afternoon, I didn't know what I was going to fill my columns with. And then, like manna from heaven, two murders and a bank robbery. Attempted bank robbery, Mr. Hightower. He turned and ran for he got his hands on so much as a dollar. Yes. Still as you say, like manna. Dylan, I... I just I'm could... talking business. What is it, Chester? Well, it can wait, I guess, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, print Clay's picture on those notices, Mr. Hightower. Now, where were we? Uh, eyes brown, hair red. Oh, yes. Also known as Red, Bricktop, and Sorrel. He, uh, didn't answer to no other nicknames, did he? No, that's what they called him. All right, then in big letters, $400 reward. Dead... And at the bottom, apply Matt Dillon, Marshal, Dodge City. Mm -hmm. I print 200 copies. How soon can I send Chester over for him? This afternoon. Good morning, Mr. Hightower. Chester. Think those posters will do any good? Richards is probably over the line into Oklahoma or Colorado by now. That strawberry roll of his is the fastest in the county. He has no money. He panicked and ran out of the bank before he got a penny. I think he'll try to get help from his wife or brother or a friend the first chance he has, maybe tonight. I say he's around here somewhere. I, uh... I'm sorry I turned on you like that, Chester. Why, that's all right, Mr. Dillon. Out all night with a posse, no sleep, man's bound to get touchy. No, it's not that. It's... It's the, the way... It's the way people use a thing like this. The men riding posse last night, they enjoyed it as though they were hunting fox or possum. High tower back there, he acts like it was a birthday treat, specially gotten up for him. Everybody finds a way to use it. Uh, what, what was it you wanted to tell me? Hmm? Oh! I, I got a kid, a, a little boy, locked up in the cell. Uh -huh. Run away from home, back in Cottonwood. 
Ed Slade turned him over to me when he come through on the stagecoach just now. Kid about 12 years old. Who's is he? Widow woman. Miss Bonnie. She runs a boarding house in Cottonwood. Ed says the kid's always running away a little while, I guess. He flagged Ed for a ride on the road halfway between there and here. Soon as Ed seen him stand there with his bundle on his shoulder, he knowed what he was up to. So he told the kid he'd help him and then turn him over to us when he got there. All right, we'll send a telegram to the mother to come fetch him. Well, come on in, Chester, and shut the door. Mr. Dillon? You're letting in every horse fly in Kansas. Mr. Dillon, I think you better cancel the order for them notices. What? The Dutchman's coming up the street, and he's leading a strawberry roan, and Clay Richards is draped across his back. Like a sack of wheat across the saddle. Last time I saw him, two days ago. He was standing at the bar laughing his head off. A sack of wheat across the saddle. And followed by half the saloon bums and loafers in town. All right, Chester, make him keep back. All right, now stand back, you fellas. Come on, now, back. Stand back. Ziegler. How did it happen, Ziegler? My goat, my old billy goat, he pushes open the fence last night and runs away. Forget your goat. What about Clay? Yeah, I, I tell you. This morning, I go to look for the goat. I walk here, there, from near the river. I see Clay. He sits there. I say, hello, Clay. The gates. You dirty he... Dutchman. You know the dog? Clay was your best friend. He helped you buy your farm, so you kill him for it. All right, all of you. Keep back, everybody. You Clay? Me? No, no. My brother, he was like... We was in the war together. Peter, listen. You killed him for the war. Not so. I killed nobody. Not not since Gettysburg. Clay is dead already when I find him. I don't even own a pistol. Ziegler, inside quick. Yeah, yeah. Chester, give me a hand with Clay. All right, all of you. Listen up. I will not tolerate a disturbance. You know me. I got him, Chester. Take his legs. All right, kick the door shut. Marshal, I don't kill Clay. On this table, Chester. What'd you do with Clay's gun? His holster's empty. Gun? Clay's? I ain't got it. I don't even own one. Chester, see if it slipped out. His we holster up. was empty coming up the street. First thing I noticed. Maybe it's yeah. over on the... Another customer? Who oh, has three in less than a day. Oh, bountiful harvest. My fees this month will keep me in luxury. In luxury! Doc, I uh, want to have an inquest as soon as possible. Well, as soon as I finish the autopsy. Shouldn't take long with the practice I've had this week, huh? <laughs> no. Uh, late afternoon all right with you? I'll take him up to my office right now. No, thank you, Chester. I can carry him all by myself here. You just open the door there like a good fella. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah, Marshal, tell the city fathers I'd like to make a deal when the corpses are as famous as this one. <laughs> Back in 53 in San Francisco, a fellow I knew earned a fortune, exhibiting the head of Joaquin Marietta. Tell them if they'll let me keep the remains... I'll do the autopsies for nothing. Shut the door, Chester. Ziegler, where is it you met Clay on the river? By the fort. This side, by the fort. Right out there, Chester, and see if you can find Clay's gun. Maybe he dropped it when he was shot. I did not shoot Clay. Sure. I did not. I had no reason to. I did not. I did not. Now you listen to me. Maybe you think Dodge has got so big, I don't know about everything that goes on here. Well, if you do, you're wrong. If you think I don't know about the bank having an overdue mortgage on your farm, you're wrong. $400 is reason enough for a struggling farmer like you. No. I could not do such a thing. I, I am a human being. To a peace officer, Ziegler, that's enough grounds for suspicion. But whether you did it or not, will be decided at your trial. In the meantime, you just stop yammering about it. Trial? Me? Even when I shoot somebody, I stand trial. If they find it's justifiable homicide, and they probably will, Clay being a wanted man, then he'll let you off. And if not... Please, I am permitted to go now. 
Go. Are you crazy? I found this stock. I, I must look after it. You sit right down. You want to be lynched? You're trying to get yourself murdered? Have you forgotten about Clay's brother, Adam? Adam would not believe I shot him. What difference does it make whether he believes it or not? His brother's been killed. Everybody's looking to him to do something about it, and he knows it. You want me to guess where he is right this minute? He's in one of them saloons lapping up courage to come in here and ask me to give you to him for a present. You want to know who's with him? Ever loafer, ever bum, ever slob in town. Slapping him on the back and telling him what a shame it is. Egging him on to kill you so that they can have some excitement and some fun. Well, maybe you deserve killing, but it's my job to uphold the law and I'm not letting you out of here. What? I tell you, you might that's... spend your time trying to think up a better story. That is, if you intend to stay in this town. All right, now think back. Didn't Clay go for his gun before you shot him? I tell you, I didn't. If I'm not under arrest, you have no right to keep me here. I got to look after my farm. I go. All right, Chester, lock him up. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Come on now, Ziegler. Help me, senior. Help me, senior. Step out, sonny. This cage is bespoke. Who's in there, Chester? Yeah, that little old runaway from Cottonwood. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Come over here, son. Come over here to me. I know who you are. <laughs> you do, do you? You bet. You're Matt Dillon. <laughs> I'm guilty. I knowed you right off. He was pointed out to me one day back home. Filler says you was the fastest gun thrower in Kansas. <laughs> Wyatt Earp wouldn't be awful interested to hear that, I'm afraid. Filler says you was faster than older. Faster than Wild Bill Hickok in Hay City and Fat Masterson or any of them. How many fellas have you killed? You don't keep score, son. It's something you try to forget. Not me. Someday I'll be famous like you, and for every filler I kill, I'll, I'll put a notch on my gun. People will see those notches, and they'll know they better not try Why'd it. you run away from home, bub? Don't you know your mother's likely to worry about oh, you? Oh, she won't worry. She's too busy working. You ain't gonna make me go back, are you? You wouldn't do that, would you? Well... Because it wouldn't stop me for long. I'd only run away again. Oh, where are you off to in such a sweat? Oh, Texas, California, Mexico. Fell can accomplish things there, not like living in old cottonwood. If you let me go, someday when I'm famous, you can tell people you helped get me started. <laughs> well, well, well that's, that's a pretty strong inducement. Um, I'll have to think about it for a while. And, uh, look, uh, while I'm making up my mind, I, I want you to give me your word. Word of a man who'll be famous someday that uh, you won't try to run away from me. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll have to have Chester lock you up again. Oh, I'll shake on that. <laughs> good, good. Uh, Chester, I want you to go look for Clay's gun. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. And uh, on the way, stop off and send that uh, telegram. You know? Hmm? Oh, that telegram. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. I'll Where's Ziegler? It's all right, Chester. Go ahead. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Where's that murdering dog? Oh, there you are, you... Not a single step further, Adam. I want him, Dylan. He murdered Clay, shot him down without giving him a chance. How do you know? Because Clay wouldn't have let anyone catch him off guard except a friend. A uh, friend. And that Dylan give me that Dutchman. Try to take him. It's like that? It's like that. And it's true what the fellas say. You made a deal with the Dutchman to give him the reward and to protect him if he'd kill Clay for you. That was the deal, was it? Yeah. The fellas say why I'd make such a deal? Dylan, it ain't no longer a secret around town that you and Francie warned each other. But Clay was in the way. You had him killed so you could get his wife. Do you deny it? No. No. It'll serve as well as any other crazy story to work you up. You think you're safe behind that star, don't you? Well, Clay have friends, lots of them. I'm coming back with them friends, and we'll get the Dutchman and you and anyone else who tries to stop us. All right, Adam. I'll be waiting. Yeah. You wait. I almost seen something pretty just then, didn't I, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, almost. Not another 
pint of whiskey ought to do it. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment, but first... Many radio shows win high popularity with the prizes and cash they give away. But there's one show that's tops because the head man gives away as little as possible. What other radio program could it be but the Jack Benny Show? So be listening. And now, now with now William Conrad starred as Matt Dillon, here's the second act of Gunsmoke. Son? You say something, Mr. Dillon? Uh, yeah, open my drawer in front of you there. You'll find a small bottle of oil in there. No, no, the one to the right there. Yeah, that's it. Now, bring a little brush, too, huh? Here it is. Thanks, bub. It's a right nice gun you have. Yeah, it's not bad, but a little stiff. Just a little stiff. Don't it have a trigger? I never seen no gun without a trigger before. Oh, you're a move a trigger or a tied back against a guard. And all you have to do is, uh... Thumb a hammer. Hey, like that. It's faster. <laughs> yeah, that's better now. Remove the trigger. I'll remember that. <laughs> what in the world for? Well, I remember everything you told me. About the Texas holster and the spring holster and the double roll and filing off the site. It's just me, Mr. Dillon. Oh, any luck, Chester? No, sir, not any. I went to the store first and asked Mr. Denton what kind of ammunition Clay Richard used to buy, and he told me Clay had a double action forty-four. I scarred that riverbank a half mile each way from the ford and not a sign of it. Uh, I got that telegram off. You know who ought to be here pretty soon. It's only seven, eight miles from... Is that a fire in town? Funeral services for Mr. Grinnell, the cashier. So soon? It's awful hot weather. Yeah. Um, any of your guns need oiling? Just I don't think so. You sure? When Adam left, he said he'd be coming back with some friends. I know. I stopped at the Oliphagante just now to rinse out my mouth. Adam was there talking mighty ugly and mighty big. He's got a sizable following. Uh, when do you think? Any minute now, Mr. Dillon. It want me to take Bob out of here to one of the hotels, maybe? I want to see No, him. I think you'll be safer here, Chester, behind stone walls and dodging about the streets rubbernecking. You keep your head down, sonny, you hear? There's a... Matt. Matt, i got to talk to you. She ought to be in mourning. If she cared for Clay at all anymore, she ought to be in black. Matt. Oh, Lord, I find her more beautiful all the time. Matt, have you heard what they're saying? What are they saying, Francie? That you and me, that, that you made Pete Ziegler kill him because of... I'm sorry that got back to you, Francie. It's all over Dodge. Adam almost strangled me before they dragged him off. Francie, I didn't shoot Clay. Francie, I pray you believe me. How is this? Shut up, Ziegler. Oh, Shut up or I'll pop you to death! Francie is just one of those crazy stories. They needed one and they made one up. But, Matt, everyone believes it. On my way down here, people were pointing, whispering. Old women clucking their tongues at me. They believe it. They'll forget it as soon as this is over. They'll remember that even if we once did go with each other, it was finished and done with even before the war ended, before... You even met Clay. No, they won't forget it. For the rest of my life, as long as I stay hold, here, I'll... Hold it a minute, Francie. Yeah, Doc, what is it? Oh, uh, am I interrupted? What is it, Doc? Uh, our topsy's finished. I examined his liver and lights as... This terribly... is Mrs. Richards, Doc. Oh, oh I beg your pardon, ma'am. I'm sure I have meant no disrespect for the departed. Well... Well, Clay was shot, all right, but from the nature of the wound and the coagulation of the blood, I'd say it happened sometime yesterday. I'd say the cashier's bullet didn't go wild after all. How could a dead man gallop away? Well, the wound wasn't what killed Clay. The ball hit the rib case and bounced off. Twenty-two caliber it was. And what did kill him was the stab in the back, right through the spine. Inflicted sometime this morning. Now, near as I can judge, by a small blade, oh, two or three inches long. It could have been a Barlow knife. Thanks, Doc. Yeah, please accept my condolences, Mrs. Richard. You call the inquest anytime you're ready, Marshal. Chester, close the door. You see? 
You see, I didn't do it. I didn't shoot him. All right, then you stabbed him, maybe. You said you never carried a gun. Look, Francie, go home and give matters a chance to simmer down. Matt, I'm going to ask you something. Yeah? Turn Pete Ziegler out into the street. What? Francie, they're itching to get their hands on him. Let him have him. It'll prove that story's a lie, that you didn't make a deal with him. Please, Matt, I have to live here. Tell me, I have to live here. Matt? Matt. Don't look at me like that. Go home, Francie. Go home or leave town or hang yourself or anything you like. Just go away. Away. Right now. I bought me a bottle at the Alifragans, Mr. Dillon. Would you care for a drink? No. I guess the funeral's over. There'll be others. Funny. No, I missed that bell. Awful quiet, ain't it? It's just... Wh- just about on schedule. Are you ready, Chester? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. I'd use a shotgun if I were you. It's more effective when there's a mob to be dealt with. Oh, yes, sir, I am. Ziegler, and you too, son. If trouble starts, lie down flat on the floor and keep your head down all the time. Don't gawk to see what's happening. You understand me? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. All right. Dylan! Dylan! Come out, Dylan! Come on! Chester, I want you to stand here in the doorway after I go out where you can cover the back door and me at the same time. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. All right, Chester. Open the door. Come on out. It's my duty. To warn all of you that you're in the breach of the peace. Uh, I've sworn to uphold the law. I've killed men in order to do it, and I'm prepared to do so again. Give us a Dutchman, Dylan. (laughs) Man! I ask you to be sensible and to leave quietly. But if you refuse to listen to reason, if you insist upon being fools, if you've already decided to act like wolves instead of humans, and there's nothing I can say to make you change your minds. All right, you want Peter Ziegler? Well, he's not more than 20 feet behind me, so come on and get him, any of you. One at a time or all at once. Come on. Which one of you wants to die first? You? You? You, Adam? Well, what do you say, Adam? You let him here. Don't let this star on my coat stop you. Come on. There, I'm not wearing it now. Well, come on, draw, Adam, draw! You all right, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. Get his gun. Man alive, I couldn't even see your hand move. Uh, uh, Marshal, oh, don't tell me. Don't tell Doc, me. Doc, you make one single funny remark and I'll knock you down. You just take him to your office and get to work. Well, I, I never do mean to offend, Marshal. In my line of work, well, bodies, they're just so much lumber. Make all the jokes about him you please, but not to me and not in my hearing. In my line of work, there's nothing humorous about death. Give him a hand, Chester. No, no, I can handle the marshal. Thank you. Thank you. Just a shame. Can you direct me to the marshal's office? Uh, yes, ma'am, right here. I'm Marshal Dillon. Well, I left Cottonwood as soon as I got your telegram. I'm Miss Bonnie. Where's my boy? Oh, we have him, ma'am, safe and sound. Here, let me help you down. Thank you. Hitch that horse, Chester. Right this way, ma'am. Oh, I'm so sorry he put you to all that trouble, Marshal truth of the matter is, he is a wild one, and no mistake. Takes after his father, one scrape after another. Uh, he was no trouble at all. I enjoy children. I like to have them around. Bub? Bub, your ma's here. Son? Chester, where's the boy? Did you let him slip past you? No, sir, Mr. Dillon. He never got past me. Look. 
The back door's open. He seen me and he hightailed it, the devil. <laughs> we'll round him up for you, ma'am. Don't worry. Oh, I don't know why I bother hauling him back. If he's run away once, he's run away a thousand times. This time he ran because I wouldn't buy him a gun. He wanted a real one. That boy's just gun crazy, I swear. I got him a nice Barlow knife instead. Barlow knife. I reckon it didn't signify, and off he runs. Barlow knife? A kid. Chester finds that kid. Marshal, has he done something bad with it? I told him to use it careful. He promised he'd use Wait, it careful. Uh, no, no, never mind, Chester. He's got Clay's strawberry ruin. We'd never catch up to him. Oh, I try to bring him up right. I tell him to be good, but he don't listen. He just don't listen. Now, calm yourself, ma'am. Just calm yourself. Here's your little bundle, Mr. Dillon. What? Yeah, give it to me. That's pretty heavy. <laughs> Here, you're better at knots than I am. Open it, will you? For the moment he was born, he's been nothing but tribulation to me. Now, please, ma'am. <laughs> What's he got in it, Chester? A shirt, stockings, a piece of sausage, and this. Forty-four double action. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. That's Clay's gun. Sonny didn't manage to keep it long, did he? Well, if he wants a gun that bad, he's bound to get hold of another one somewhere, somehow. Chester, call Mr. Hightower over. Hey! Hey, Mr. Hightower! Oh. Come on over. Mr. Dillon wants you. Marshal, could I have at least a drink of water? What? Oh, Ziegler, uh, I forgot all about you. Uh, uh, Chester, where are the keys? Yeah, right there on the desk. Oh. Uh, there we are. It'll be safe for you to go home now. I, I can go back by the farm. Yeah, that's right. I'll send for you for the trial. Oh, Duncan should. Duncan should. Watch where you're going, you dumb... With the, excuse me. With the, with the... Yes, Marshal. Mr. Hightower, it appears that we can do business after all. Get some paper and a pencil. I want some notices printed. Fire away. Wanted for murder. Wanted for murder. Uh, what's the boy's name? Bonnie. William Bonney. William Bonney. William Bonney. Age 12. Height about five feet. Hair light, eyes blue. Mm -hmm. I don't suppose he's known by any other name. I know. Everybody just called him Billy. Or the kid. Also known as Billy. The kid. <laughs> Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Walter Newman, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Don Diamond, Parley Bear, Harry Bartell, and Howard McNair, with Richard Beals, Paul Dubov, Georgia Ellis, and Mary Lansing. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Longtime favorites Amos and Andy are rising to new heights in their CBS radio series on Sunday nights. Heard on most of these same stations, Amos and Andy find trouble as constantly as ever and make it just as funny and as human as they have for more than 20 years. Be sure to hear Amos and Andy this Sunday, won't you? Right after the Jack Benny Show. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, there's fast, funny quizzing on the Bob Hawk Show every Monday evening. This is the CBS Radio Network.
very first broadcast occurred Saturday evening, April the 26th, 1952, 24 years ago tomorrow. The script revolved around a 12-year-old boy who was to become a legend in the West. Can you direct me to the marshal's office? Uh... Yes, ma'am, right here. I'm Marshal Dillon. Well, I left Cottonwood as soon as I got your telegram. I'm Miss Barney. Where's my boy? Oh, we have him, ma'am, safe and sound. Here, let me help you down. It's that horse, Chester. Right this way, ma'am. Oh, I'm so sorry he put you in all that trouble, Marshal. The truth of the matter is he's a wild one and no mistake. Takes after his father, one scrape after another. Oh, he was no trouble at all. I enjoy children... I like to have him around. Bob? Bob, your ma's here. Son? Chester, where's the boy? Did you let him slip past you? No, sir, Mr. Dillon. He never got past me. Look, the back door's open. He seen me and he hightailed it, the devil. <laughs> oh, we'll round him up for you, ma'am. Don't worry. Oh, I don't know why I bother hauling him back. If he's run away once, he's run away a thousand times. This time he ran because I wouldn't buy him a gun. He wanted a real one. That boy's just gun crazy, I swear. I got him a nice ball and knife instead. Barlow knife. I reckon it didn't signify an off he runs. Barlow knife? A kid. Chester finds a kid. Marshal, has he done something bad with it? I told him to use it careful. He promised he'd use Wait, it careful. No, no, never mind, Chester. He's got Clay's strawberry roll, and we'd never catch up to him. Oh, I try to bring him up right. I tell him to be good, but he don't listen. He just don't listen. Now, calm yourself, ma'am. Just calm yourself. Here's his little bundle, Mr. Dillon. What? Huh? Yeah, give it to me. It's pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah, you're better at knots than I am. Open it, will you? The moment he was born, he's been nothing but tribulation to me. Now, please, ma'am. <laughs> What's he got in it, Chester? A shirt, stockings, a piece of sausage, and this. 44 double action. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. That's Clay's gun. Sonny didn't manage to keep it long, did he? Well, if he wants a gun that bad, he's bound to get hold of another one somewhere, somehow. Chester, call Mr. Hightower over. Hey! Hey, Mr. Hightower! Oh. Come on over. Mr. Dillon wants you. Marshal, could I have just a drink of water? Huh? Oh, Ziegler, uh, I forgot all about you. Uh, uh, Chester, where are the keys? Yeah, right there on the desk. Oh. Uh. Uh, there we are. It'll be safe for you to go home now. Uh, I can go back by the farm. Yeah, that's right. I'll send for you for the trial. Well, Duncan should. Duncan should. Watch where you're going, you dumb. Mr. Excuse me. Mr. Mr. Yes, Marshal. Mr. Hightower, it appears that we can do business after all. Get some paper and a pencil. I want some notices printed. By the way. Wanted for murder. Wanted for murder. Uh, what's the boy's name? Barney. William Bonney. William Bonney. William Bonney. Age 12. Height about five feet. Hair light, eyes blue. Mm -hmm. I don't suppose he's known by any other name. I know. Everybody just called him Billy. Or the kid. Also known as Billy. The kid. <laughs> Return to the biography of Gunsmoke in just one moment. And now back to Gunsmoke. Billy the Kid was the first show by Walter Brown Newman. It received good reports, but nobody was quite sure upstairs whether we had a hit or a miss because our leading man didn't sound like a leading man. Bill Conrad was not playing that as a warm, understanding, paternal figure whatsoever. 
During the first few months, other writers were called in to mold the characters. Les Crutchfield was a, a writer who was to become one of the solid contributors to Gunsmoke, writing, oh, possibly 70 or 80 scripts. Les wrote a writer named Herb Purdom, Joe Murcott, Lou Houston, Tony Ellis, a cross-section of the better writers in town. But each week it meant that Meston had to do a little editing and a little fixing and a little adjusting on the script. And after about a year, John said that he didn't quite know why he was working this hard and not having the fun of writing them himself. So he left CBS, left an extraordinarily good job with a great deal of promise, as a matter of fact, on what was really a gamble, because who knew how long Gunsmoke would go. So for the next three or four years, until the television series started, John wrote basically every Gunsmoke, writing anywhere between... 40 and 52 scripts a year, so he was a, he was a busy man. Colorado-born John Meston had his own views about the West and how the Gunsmoke characters should be developed and portrayed. Well, I don't like phony stuff, and, and uh, I know something about the West, sure. The way people are, the way they talk, the way they behave. And uh, I never liked heroes much. So we kind of reversed everything. So we did away... I tried to do it why we did with narration, which was sort of an innovation, I think, at the time. Well, we tried to make him honest, just an honest character, not a... not a crook like, like Wyatt Earp and people like that who were just bums. Tried to make him an honest guy, and... and uh, the guy with a sense of tragedy. The guy didn't particularly enjoy the job. He did it. But then it took a, quite a while because, you know, we, we put you know, Walter put Chester in. We had to work towards on him a great deal for a long time, and, and uh, Kitty and Doc had to develop, and Matt had to develop, and we did this over a long period of time. You know, we worked very closely. Uh, I used to go. I didn't go around hang around TV much, but uh, in the radio, I was there all the time. Well, I'm always hired. The very best actors, no question of that. You know, they couldn't read a line. They'd, they'd let me know with great pleasure, and they're generally right. I learned how to write dialogue so it could be read and short. I always wrote short dialogue. I never wrote speeches like that, or I don't, never, you know, unless it's absolutely necessary. Occasionally, for an effect. But the characters were developed very slowly. We'd go on. After the shows, Conrad and Norm and I and whoever else was around, Parley, whoever was interested in sitting around, discuss the show. And we were all interested in, in discuss character and this and that. Whether you should do this or that, how I should behave. And it was kind of a joint effort. Meston once expressed his views in detail. Here's Gunsmoke announcer George Walsh reading a classic Meston letter addressed to the editor of the New York Tribune. It isn't often that a writer or any man is given an opportunity to destroy a figure he's always hated, a character that all his life has cluttered his landscape like a slum. And to be able to do so and get paid for it to boot is to be doubly blessed. My hated figure is the Western hero who rides along, thumping his guitar, nasally singing a synthetic ballad, and looking for all the world like a fugitive from a cheap circus. I spit in his milk, and he'll have to go elsewhere to find somebody to pour the lead for his golden bullets. Now, the best way to destroy something bad is to write it down with something better. And I've got a guy I think outclasses any of these phony big hats. His name's Matt Dillon, and his hair is probably red if he's got any left. He'd be handsomer than he is if he had better manners, but life and his enemies have left him looking a little beat up. And I suppose, having seen his mother back about 1840, struggling to take a bath in a wooden wash tub without fully undressing, left his soul a little warped. Anyway, there'd have to be something wrong with him, or he wouldn't have hired on as a United States Marshal in the heyday of Dodge City, Kansas. Dodge at that time was the wildest town in America, and it was populated by men 
just as warped and more so than Matt Dillon. Consider this. The West, just after the Civil War, was in a sense a kind of arena for frustrated gladiators. Homicidal psychopaths gathered along the frontier and had themselves a real circus with little or nothing to stop them from happily mowing one another down. And that more men didn't die in this senseless slaughter may be laid to their comparatively primitive weapons and certainly not to any civilized tendencies on their part. It ended finally. The murderers killed one another off and gradually disappeared from this section of the American scene. But the end was partly hastened by a few strangers who happened to get their satisfaction killing on the side of the law. Sheriffs, marshals, and the like. I'm sure a few of these men had a hazy sense of what the coming of law and order meant, but for the most part, they looked on their role in the play of progress simply as a job, and they went ahead and did their job, often in the face of unbelievable odds, and then picked up their paychecks and went their way. Heroes? To us, now they were heroes, but to their contemporaries, the biggest hero was he who, by whatever means, murdered the greatest number of his fellow men. The rules were childishly simple. If the other man went for his gun before you did, you were free to kill him with immunity. And anyway, if there weren't too many unfriendly witnesses about, you could always claim he did and probably get by with it just as easily. Matt Dillon, because of obvious reasons, he's a cut above the usual lawman I've described. But he's not, I trust, so far above the real thing as to be pure fiction. And the hardest thing for me, the writer, is to keep him, on paper, from goofing off into the never-never land of pure heroism. And the hardest thing for Norman MacDonald, the producer-director, and Bill Conrad, the star, is to translate the script's attempt at authenticity into the living character of Matt Dillon. But we try, then try, and keep trying. Our attempt to create as realistic and entertaining a program as possible is not, of course, the only one of its kind. But we did precede and were on the air trying before the release of such pictures as High Noon and Shane. And we're still on the air. And we're still trying. Certainly, one of the reasons for Gunsmoke's hold upon its audience was Meston's style of writing. To try and analyze uh, John Meston's contribution to the writing style of Gunsmoke would be difficult because John's writing is not flashy, it's not uh, filled with purple prose, it's not... If anything, it's understated and simple. John and I always felt that good Western writing didn't necessarily mean double negatives and so on, that it really required research and understanding of the cowboy. And uh, John was an avid researcher. Also, of course, uh, his boyhood in Pueblo, Colorado helped color his scripts. But John used a great deal of the language that came from the cowboys that he had known and the friends he had known in Colorado. For instance, there was one phrase that John always loved particularly. A cowboy was talking about his mare to another cowboy who asked if the mare was a fast runner. And the first cowboy looked for a moment and then said, yes, she's swift. She could, uh, she could run a hole in the wind. She set her mind to it. Well, this was the kind of phrase that John loved because it was the, the man of the earth and the country using the things that he knew and using the things that he saw around him for descriptions, which gave the dialogue or the, or the speech patterns a richness and a fullness, was a strange combining of words and a strange combining of emotions that uh, gave John's dialogue, as written in the Gunsmoke scripts, a special meaning that was hard for anyone else to duplicate. Meston always had a, a feeling about names, too. He felt that a name was a whole indication of the character that was to come. 
A friend of Matt's who arrives in town, if I remember correctly, was a, a ex-lawman or a lawman, and a friend of Matt's. Meston called him Nick Search, which is a marvelous way of painting the man's whole background just with a couple of words, or other names like Toke Morlin, or a funny little fellow who was running a town and was a crook, but a kind of a pathetic little crook. His name was Joe Fye. There was a doctor who came into town and got in trouble because he, well, because of the laudanum that he was putting in his medicinal bottles. His name was Professor Loot Bone, which is a marvelous name for a doctor, or the buffalo hunter called Gatliff. John never gave Gatliff any name because he felt that Gatliff was enough. But he did mention that he was a man with speckled eyes, which is a beautiful way of describing a man. There was a family who lived out on the prairie who lived in a sod hut, a sad excuse for a home, and they were called the Beatles. As a matter of fact, John called the script uh, Smoking Out the Beatles. When it was done on television, it was changed to Smoking Out the Nolans for some reason that nobody yet has been able to figure out. John Muston was uh, a thorough technician and a writer of great integrity and accuracy. This is Parley Bear, the talented and versatile actor who portrayed Chester Proudfoot. And I think that since that era was probably the most colorful in Western history, that he strove to create and paint the most accurate image of the times that he could. And I, I think he succeeded. Now, so far as we know, you know what, what a genius uh, John had for picking out names that described the character. Matt Dillon was uh, so faithfully written and so impeccably reproduced by Royce the way he uh, built it that at one time we had a letter from the then Secretary or President of the Chamber of Commerce in Dodge City wanting to know since they had already determined that Matt Dillon had lived in Dodge City did we have accurate knowledge as to when he lived in Dodge City. Now, unless uh, it was just a, a matter of coincidence and conjecture that there had at one time, according to the archives and the historical pages of Dog City's history book, that there had been a Matt Dillon there, but so far as we knew, and so far as John Meston knew, uh, Matt Dillon was uh, completely a, a brainchild, uh, as well as the name. And it was very flattering for Dog City Chamber of Commerce to assume that uh, we would know when he had lived there, when, so far as we knew, he never had. People came west for a variety of reasons, and chiefest among them, it seemed like, was a, a tragedy that had occurred either back east or in Europe, or people came west, it's true, to forget or to hide something that... Uh, some malfeasance of their own in the more civilized sections of the country. And uh, I think the West, as it was developed, indeed our whole country, was developed as a result of disappointment elsewhere, and uh, his pen had the ability to, to pick that up. There's a kind of trite expression, I don't even know who originated it, the whole world belongs to the actor for his use only, not to keep. He must give it back. And uh, when you analyze that, it's, it's kind of true. You, I know that I've seen lots of people, and I think my he would be fun to play. And uh, then you're not above uh, plagiarizing a little bit of that man's uh, character, a little bit of his life, a little bit of his way of speech, a little bit of his background. And John uh, did that. Uh, Chester and, and Matt were talking, and Matt asked Chester why he got up so early. And he said, well, I... I, I can't sleep. He said, it's a trait I have. As soon as the sun up, my feet start to sweat, and then I get uncomfortable and get up. Well, John knew a person who said that. Uh, some old codger he had met said that he got up because there was something about the sun coming up caused his feet to sweat, and he became uncomfortable in bed, so he got up. Well, that, that was a good line for Chester to have. Humanisms. John did those things. 
Chester acquired this dog that he loved dearly, and the dog liked everybody but Chester, and after he had bitten him soundly, Chester's only comment was, he'll come around. <laughs> John Meston wrote realism. You could see the mud. You could see the, the slough that they were in. You could see the filth. But it was done because it was adroitly painted in. Have you found him, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. I thought I'd better come along. You, you see... Toby's dead, is that it? Yes, sir. All right. Well, Gatliss down there in the middle of the hollow. But we can't get anywhere near him as long as he's got that Sharps rifle. He's killed a small herd of buffalo in there, and now he's lying out in the center of them. Well, that's the darndest thing I ever heard of, Mr. Dillon. He must have gone crazy, just like Toby said. Yeah. <laughs> What's he shooting at now? <laughs> Mr. Dillon, the way he's facing them shots. Yeah, that's the signal for help, Chester. Come on. Hey, maybe this is a trap. Uh, be ready to take cover behind one of these animals. It might be. Mm -hmm. Sounds like he's been hurt. Yeah. Keep your head up. There he is. Behind that big bull. Yeah, I see him. Well, Mr. Dillon, he... He's all... There have been horses in here. Indians. My goodness. Come on. his last effort, Chester. He's dead now. Mr. Dillon, that's awful. Yeah. Come on, let's get out of here. I don't know how the Indians caught Gatliff. He'd gone a little mad, and maybe that made it easy for him. But they finally got themselves a buffalo hunter. And into their unbelievably savage torture of him had gone all the hatred and desperation of a race being slowly starved and driven from their homeland. And then they'd put him there, surrounded by his own bloody slaughter. And they'd gone off with a gesture of contempt, leaving his rifle and his ammunition by his side. And having seen what they did to him, I'll never know how he managed to fire even one of those shots. For all of his evil, Gatliff had died harder than any man I'd ever seen. Chester and I rode back to Dodge. And it was never mentioned between us again. <laughs> John is a most unique talent, a lovely man who is a great bleeder. He bleeds for everybody, and perhaps that is the key to the success of that show, is that it is so filled with uh, the repulsion of man's inhumanity to man, seasoned and highlighted by red streaks of magnificent violence, and uh, yet the final total compassion with whatever the problem was. You add all of those up, and uh, they spell mother under any conditions. The people were human beings. Georgia Ellis, who portrayed saloon madam Kitty Russell, Kitty was human. 
And uh, some of them had, had very homely touches in them, like uh, perhaps a dress fitting or a Howard fussing about how to kill a pain in the tooth, which might even have consumed a minute or two minutes. It was not continuous action or bloodletting or a mystery or anything. You had a, a sense of continuity. You could almost taste the dust in the streets, perhaps. The beer wasn't very cold, but at least it was beer. And the cowboys were not clean. And the horses were sweaty. And uh, not everybody was pretty and beautiful and wore white hats. Supporting player, John Dater. Each show had to do, yes, with Matt Dillon, but Matt Dillon in relation to some one individual, some one family that comes to town or that lives in town that has a problem. Which means that uh, you didn't have so much plot as you had character, interesting people to listen to, you see. And this is what happened with the television uh, Gunsmoke 2. It was a novelty. We were all so used to... Uh, Ohio Silver is a way that, uh, that this was a total departure into the area of serious examination of people and their problems. And then when you get that kind of writing and that kind of concept, it's a glorious thing for actors because this is the very thing that an actor wants to play a person, a human being. Running through many of John's scripts is a, a thread of the dignity of man, and yet at the same time, so frequently man's inhumanity to man or the inescapability of life and problems in the western frontier one of the things that John did in his scripts was to paint the the difficult position of a of a woman nowadays we're inclined to to say well if life's that difficult why didn't they go somewhere else and as John had his characters explain uh, where was there to go? They had no money. Uh, the household probably consisted of one mule, and uh, you can't ride too far on one mule and no money. And if the woman did get into town, what was she going to do? She couldn't suddenly find work in a boutique. She either was a dance hall girl or something less. So the frontier life was a hard and unforgiving sort of life, as John pictured it, and I think quite, quite accurately. One script that uh, perhaps illustrates what I'm saying was a script called The Cabin. I remember parenthetically that uh, John wrote this to go on the air after a particularly soft Christmas show, and he said, we can't have people think we're going to do soft shows, so he wrote The Cabin. Simply, the story was uh, Matt finding himself almost uh, isolated in a blizzard, approaches a cabin, where he finds a young girl has been savaged by two men who have killed her parents. They've been with her for a week during this extended blizzard. Matt, by the end of the show, is able to, uh, well, I shouldn't say able to kill them, but he does, gets them out of the way. And the closed scene is, is indicative of a Meston honest approach. Marshal? Marshal Dillon? What? Oh. Morning, Bell. Come on out in the kitchen, Marshal. It's warm there and I got some hot coffee waiting. Uh, that sounds good. Uh, I say, it looks like the storm's lifted. It has. The wind's gone, but it's mighty cold out. Well, I don't mind the cold. It's that wind that breaks a man down. There. Get some of that in you. Uh. Mm. Oh, you make mighty good coffee, Bill. <laughs> Tell me something, Marshal. Hmm? Tell me the truth now. Oh, uh, sure, Bell. What is it? Are you married? I'd make a poor husband, Bell, for any woman. Why? Well, in my profession, it's... It's too chancy. Thank you, Marshal. 
Thanks for putting it that way. No, Bill, I, I didn't mean... Forget it. I'm leaving this place, Marshal. What? As soon as you go, I've packed what I need and I'm clearing off. Where'll you go? I got three horses. I'll ride up to Hayes City and sell them. Then what? I'll buy some pretty clothes and... And I'll find a place. Won't be hard after this. I, uh... I wish I could help you, Bell. You have. Oh, but I mean... I can take care of myself, Marshal. I just want to get away from here, that's all. Sure. Uh, I'll stop at the nearest ranch and tell the men to come over here and take care of Hack and Alvy as soon as it warms up. Whatever you like, Marshal. Well, goodbye, Bell. Goodbye, Marshal. Look me up in Hayes City next time you're there. Sure. Sure I will. But, uh, Bell, don't let all this make you bitter. There are a lot of good men in the world. So they say. So long, Marshal. I, uh... So long, Bill. A few minutes later, I'd saddled up and was on the trail to Dodge. The sky was low and the slate gray all over, but there was no wind. The blizzard had gone... Even the land still and white and bitter cold. There wasn't a sign of life anywhere. It was like riding through a vast tomb. I found myself feeling like a trespasser. As though something had gone wrong. And I wasn't supposed to be there at all. John Meston had a very firm, fixed feeling about Matt Dillon's character. and He often said that Matt didn't want to see America grow west and uh, with the sound of trumpets and uh, flags flying. He, he always said that Matt was a very honest, real man who was doing a difficult job the best way he knew how. Writer John Dunkel. I think that he was a typical hero in the sense that he was a pretty intelligent, a very compassionate man, probably the ideal lawman. There was certainly the way Bill played him, a tremendously pathetic quality to uh, Dylan. His opening line was, uh, it's a chancy job. Parley Bear. I think probably uh, Dylan trusted Chester and Doc and Kitty as much as he dared trust anyone. He knew that... uh, if he needed someone to stand at his back, Chester would be there. But I'm sure that in the back of his mind, he wasn't sure that Chester would function at all times. I think he had the same uh, feeling about Doc. Doc was dependable, but every now and again, he'd get sauced up, you know. And uh, maybe at, at the moment of removing the appendix, uh, Doc could have been a little snockered. Chester was dishonest with many people, but had to be completely honest with, with Dylan. And there was Dylan's strength. Everybody had to be honest with Dylan. Because insofar as a human being is concerned, I think probably of the whole, the whole cast, uh, Dylan was the one who was most completely honest in his dealings with lawbreakers, in his dealing with the town, in his dealing with his everyday associates. The woman in Dylan's life was Kitty Russell, owner and operator of the Long Branch Saloon, played by Georgia Ellis. She was very generous loving human being. She adored, of course, the four men in, in her life. Was Matt, uh, predominantly, and then uh, Chester, Doc. Not to say that she didn't have a certain kind of a of a ambivalent feeling towards Matt, 
I do think that she uh, considered him sort of the boss man, and she adored him dearly, and I'm quite sure they were very compatible. Yes, they were lovers, the best kind, because they really, truly understood one another. So there wasn't need for too much talk. I don't think there was any forgiveness to be done, because I don't think Kitty uh, was available to anybody else but Matt. Undoubtedly, she had wild dreams from time to time, which she realized were completely unrealistic, of uh, Matt and Kitty and uh, some large spread... But doing what? Who knows? Because Matt would never be happy doing anything but what he was doing. And she knew she would never be happy with Matt if he were not happy. So, no, she was resigned to, to uh, serving booze and and, uh, and saying, be careful, Matt. And she didn't have anything left in the East or wherever she came from to go back to. So what the hell? She was stuck in Dodge City. She was a good girl. She made a lot of it. There was a character in the first Gunsmoke script identified only as Townsman. Thanks to Bill Conrad, that Townsman became Chester. Parley Bear recalls the story. Bill Conrad named Chester. He said, Norman, I can't say, hey, Townsman, come here. He said, he's got to have a name while I was playing him uh, as I played Chester. And so Bill said, call him Chester or something like that. And so Chester he became. Then I gave Chester his last name. I had a, a broken speech, and I, this was... Weeks after we were on the air, I became just Chester. And uh, I had a broken speech that read something like, Well, as sure as... And Bill just let me flounder. He didn't uh, stop me. We used to do that to each other quite a bit. And so I just added, As sure as my name is Chester Wesley Proudfoot. And that's, uh, that's how Chester Wesley Proudfoot was was uh, named. And I can remember Bill as there's a Chester Wesley Proudfoot. Where did that come from? I said, Well... Got a broken speech and cut in on me there where like you're supposed to, and I won't come up with those names. So it was Chester Proudfoot. Gunsmoke TV producer John Mantley once referred to Chester as a dim witted town loafer. But Parley Bear, who created and portrayed the character on radio for nearly 10 years, disagrees. I don't think he was uh, a dim witted town loafer at all. He was lazy, but he still did his work and he. He spun his wheels a great deal and kicked a lot of gravel. I would describe Chester as being uh, a dependable non-thinker to this extent. If we had a hypothetical case with nine desperados holed up and uh, Bill, as Matt Dillon had said, Chester, you watch the back door. And as they come out, you plug number one, three, five, and seven Chester would have said, yes, sir. And as they came out, he would have said one, bang. He'd have let two go, and he'd have gotten three. And he'd have let four go, and he'd have gotten five. Even though maybe two and four were bearing down on him, he would have said, Mr. Dillon said to shoot them others. So then was the ones I'm going to shoot. And that's what, but no, Chester was energetic. He was loyal. At times put upon by everybody but Dillon. Uh, as we played it, Chester was not really, uh, he was never really deputized. Chester got Dylan out of scrapes every now and again. There was a pathetic tone written in Chester. Chester realized his shortcomings. I remember one script he did, I can't think of the name of it, but Chester saved Dylan. And uh, they wrote back the time, he said, uh, you'd best not tell anybody about that, Mr. Dylan, because that, it could embarrass you. If people were to know that, that I had saved you, said, we just won't talk about that. And I think that, that was basically Chester. He was a loyal, sensitive man who, much to Dylan's annoyance, put sugar in his rye whiskey and, and uh, was overly fond of jelly. And as he confessed to one time when uh, Dylan said that chewing tobacco was a filthy habit, he confessed he didn't really chew tobacco, that it was licorice. That was Chester, I think, and I tried to play him that way. Uh, uh, as simple, but not a simpleton. Loyal, if not intelligent. The economy of the day got to him. Chester was never affluent. He had a, a great loyalty and pride. His, his family, I guess you would, would have been 
tantamount to sharecroppers or tenant farmers. I don't think they were ever great landowners. But Chester was fiercely proud of his family and defended them and had an absolute uh, adulation for, for Dillon. Dillon was the ultimate so far as he was concerned. The part of Doc Adams was brilliantly played by veteran character actor Howard McNear. Howard McNear probably is the most fascinating human being I've ever known in my life. He was a consummate actor. He was a consummate human being. And all of this wrapped up in a pixie-like body, a wonderful comic mind that would make a laugh out of anything in the world for, I guess, ten solid years. He was the life of our cast. He and Parley combined were unbelievable in their making lightness and happiness and joy out of a common everyday experience. Howard and Parley are two people that everybody should know in their lives. Bill named uh, Doc, too. He was just Doc in there, and Howard McNear, who was so delightful in that that role, but he, he played him with just a trickle of blood dripping from his fangs, and uh, he got the feeling that Mephistopheles was looking over your shoulder a little bit as Howard played Doc, and uh, Bill Conrad christened him Dr. Charles Adams, just, you know, for the cartoonist. Well, when you talk about Howard, all of the adjectives like wonderful, unique, magnificent come to fore. He, Howard, I think, was one of the most truly delightful people I've ever known, ever met, and I had never heard anyone who didn't like him. Everybody loved him. And he, he was an absolute uh, asset to anything and everything he did. Later on, he became Floyd the Barber on the Andy Griffith Show. And he fell upon evil times. He had a series of strokes. He recovered from some, and then he would have some more. And uh, Mr. Andy Griffith's eternal credit that for a couple of years when uh, Howard was no longer ambulatory, like he stayed on the show, and they would, they would revolve scenes around him. He would be seated in his own barber chair or uh, in a place out in front of his shop, but they always fixed it accommodated the scene to, to Howard, and I think it's a great tribute to his ability as a performer and an actor that many people didn't know that he was suffering from any handicap at all because he was sharp. He still had the same wonderful sense of humor, a real pixie sense of humor. And I can truthfully say that some of the happiest hours of my life were spent in his, in his company. He lived between my house and the studio, and I used to pick him up and bring him back. And those uh, minutes that we had week after week discussing the day's happenings or whatnot were, were marvelous. He was, he was a man of, of uh, strange attitudes at times and in strange inconsistencies, and that's what added to his charm. Howard was a thoroughly conscientious man, prepared at all times with his work. I've never known him to give a bad performance. And I worked on many shows with him, aside from Gunsmoke. We were on there together, but he did a lot of lineups and escapes and whatnot. But he he lived in absolute terror. And, and this I can't understand, because he was, he was a graduate of the old stock company circuit, where you had to learn a new part a week while you were playing one, you know. But he was terrified that dialogue would be changed on it. And uh, he had it specified that once he was given a part, that was it, and they wouldn't change lines on him on the set. And he didn't even like to write in changes on uh, on radio scripts, and that he uh, he abhorred change of any kind, and and he sort of he developed a, an aura about himself as being very nervous and this that and the other thing, and he 
He was a little on the hypochondriac side. He carried a variety of pills, which he was willing to share. I don't know how many people he started off on the, uh, or gave them some malady that they didn't have through sharing his his pills. I know he had a box of pills one day. I had a bad headache, and I asked for aspirin. He said, you don't want to put that stuff in your stomach. He said, that's not good. He said, here, take one of mine. He said, don't take that one. They cost 50 cents a piece, and besides, it's not for a headache. But he had a bottle of all shapes, sizes, and hues, and colors of uh, Pills, and I, I tell you, not only our business, but the world suffered a great loss when, when he was taken. And I don't know of anyone who is remembered more fondly by our profession than Howard. Stories told about Howard McNear exemplify his wonderful wit and charm, and Parley Bear tells some of the best. Several years ago, Parley and Howard attended the funeral of Gail Gordon's mother, Gloria. We went to a this funeral, which was in the Hollywood Cemetery, in a very small chapel, and the pews were very small. Only four people could sit in them, and, and they were they were very uh, tightly squeezed in then. And uh, as it came time for the show, I have to first of all say that in the old days of radio, you you never had really achieved until you had what we called a conflict that you had to get permission from one director to be late to his rehearsal or leave his rehearsal for time to go to another. You had finally arrived when you had conflicts or when you had to pay a, a page to uh, open an exit-only door for you to get from CBS to NBC in order to make the show. The conflict was the ultimate thing for an actor. Well, we were tightly packed into this pew, and uh, as you do at a funeral, you remain quiet and your tones are subdued, and your attitude too. And my watch was being repaired. Howard was on the outside, on the aisle. The funeral was set for two o'clock, and as we were sitting there, I leaned over to Howard and whispered, What time is it? And Howard, What? And I said, What time is it? And Howard's reply was, What's the matter? You got a conflict. I said, now, <laughs> cut out the nonsense, Howard. Tell me what time it is. Well, I remembered too late that uh, Howard carried a pot walk, uh, pot walk, a pocket watch. <laughs> My tongue's perspiring. And not a wristwatch. And uh, so he had to lean way out, and I had to lean away from him. He's tugging to get this watch out, and as he pulled hard, the fob and the ring on the stem came out. There now. Are you satisfied? Well, it's not my fault. Why don't you wear a wristwatch like everybody else does? So he got the watch out, fixed it, put the ring back on, snapped the watch open, looked at it, snapped it closed, and put it back in his pocket. I said, well, well, what? Then what time is it? He said, I just looked. I said, but Howard, you didn't tell me. He said, they're not late. And I, he never did tell me what time it was. Another... Uh, you know, I, I told you a good friend had passed away, Will Wright. And uh, we kind of got everybody on there. The, I was on the member, the member of the board of directors for the American Federation of Television Radio Artists. Will had served on the board for many years, and we attended uh, the service in a body. Uh, Will was Presbyterian and also a Mason. And Howard went to the funeral with me, but he, uh, he didn't sit with us on the board, but he sat with a very fine character actor by the name of Dick Ryan, who was a staunch Catholic. And as the service went on, they, they did half a world service, Presbyterian, and the second half was a Masonic service. And when the service was over, uh, we waited and we uh, came out, and I saw Dick Ryan and Howard come in, come out of the chapel, and Dick Ryan's face was just suffused with purple. He was really visibly upset, and I thought, well, I'm sorry Dick's upset. I, I, I knew that he and Will had been good friends, but I, it didn't seem possible that Dick would be that emotionally upset about it. And I walked with him over to his car, and I said, Dick, are you all right? And his reply was rather strange. He said, I will never sit by Howard McNair at another funeral as long as I live. Got in his car and drove off. Well. And I said, so when Howard and I got home, I said, what did you do to Dick Ryan? And he said, oh, he's emotionally unstable. And I said, well, he's all upset. What did you do? He said, well, he just went all to pieces for no reason at all. He said, well, the funeral was on. He said, as you know, it was, first of all, Presbyterian, 
and it was Masonic, and I just leaned over and asked Vic, I said, are you fellows going to demand equal time? And what had happened? Dick, in his monumental effort to refrain from laughing and guffawing out, said, he, I saw him two days later, he said, my rib cage is still sore from that guy. He said, I nearly strangled to keep from laughing out loud. He said, that's a terrible thing to ask you at a funeral if we're going to demand equal time. The pixie's charm of Howard McNear was even evident in where he went to church. Again, Parley Bear. Howard was a tremendously religious man, but didn't uh, really embrace any of the faiths as we know them today. Uh, he went to the church of his choice, which was one week one, or another week another, sometimes unity, sometimes uh, uh, if there was a speaker he wanted to hear, the Emmanuel Baptist Church, he would go there. But when he passed away, his wife asked me if I would deliver the eulogy at his funeral, which terrified me. And uh, she said, the only command I lay upon you is that it not be lugubrious, it not be sad, that it would be something that Howard would like. And the chapel was pretty cool. We were in, uh, it was up at Forest Lawn. And uh, I didn't go into the usual. He was born on this date and so on. But in eulogizing him, I said some of the things that I've said today, how wonderful he was, what a brilliant performer. And one thing led to another. I kind of got off my text, and I started to reminisce from the pulpit about some of the things that he had said and done. And the chapel was filled with friends of his. And as I told one story that had taken place uh, there, it got a laugh. And uh, that scared me, terrified me a little bit. And at the end of the, the, the thing, people in recalling the wonderful times that they had had with Howard, I got chuckles and real laughs in this thing. And I, I finished the eulogy, I, I didn't take it upon myself to rewrite any of the psalms, but I, I edited some, and I, I joined the several poems, uh, psalms to what I felt was a fitting tribute to Howard, and I said to my wife, I, I don't dare face Helen. And I said, I, the last thing I wanted was to get laughs. At a funeral, I didn't mean that. I said, I think I, I committed a terrible thing. And as I walked over, uh, Helen came up and she uh, put her arms around me and she said, that's just exactly what Howard would have wanted. And uh, it was an ironic thing that uh, of all the things I've done, I think I got more letters of approbation from his friends uh, saying how they had, if it were possible, had enjoyed a funeral. And uh, I got a little note from Bill Conrad. He said, uh, I know Howard loved you, but now he must adore you. And uh, that was Howard. He was friendly and uh, forgiving even in death. 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 Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Oh, 
Marshal. Marshal Dillon. Over here, son. What's the trouble? Marshal. Why, I, that's Will Thompson's young and Mr. Dillon. What is it, kid? What's wrong? Dad. Mom. They burned our house. Got the fences. Four of them. My sister. My sister, they... They, they rode in and shot... They, been shot. Hold that lamp down here, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Jones. Yeah, blood all over the back of his shirt. Will Thompson, he's a homesteader, isn't he? That's right. Came to Dodge City about three months ago. Took up a section over on Mulberry Creek. Yeah. Mr. Dillon, you want me to go get the doctor? No. Boy doesn't need a doctor now. The house is right, Mr. Dillon. It's still burning. Yeah, what's left of it is. Watch yourself now, Chester. Yes, sir. No sign of life, though. Whoever did it's probably long gone by now. Mm. No reason to hang around. Well, let's tie up here and look around on foot. Bring up your carbine, Chester. I got it, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, they even fired the corn crib. Now, why would anybody want it? What's there? What is it? It's a dog. Shot. A dog? When they even shoot the dogs, it's a... You see something? Yes, sir. It's Will Thompson. I think it's Will. What do you mean, you think it's Will? Scalped. He was Indians, Mr. Dillon. I couldn't have been Indians. Only tribe reported in 20 miles the Kiowas, and they wouldn't do anything like this. They've been peaceful for years. Yeah, I don't know, but... Come on. Like... Let's find out what happened to the rest of the family. Yeah. Besides Will and the boy who rode into town, there's Ms. Thompson and a daughter. A girl about 17, pretty as a picture. Yeah, there's something lying over there by that cottonwood. Yeah, I see. Well, I guess we found Will's wife. Uh, She's alive. Yeah, if you can call it that. Uh, Scott her on. Take a look for the daughter, Chester. Yes, Mr. Dillon. Uh, uh, it's all right, Miss Thompson. It's all right. Uh, all right. Mary. My, my daughter. They, they took her. They dragged her away. They dragged her away. Uh, Easy, ma'am. Easy. Now. I, I, I tried to stop them. I held on to one of them. Kicked me loose. And his his spur came off. It's here, somewhere. It's on the ground somewhere. On the ground. Yeah, I see it. But my daughter. They took her away. My baby. There now. My baby. There now. There now. It's all right. We'll find her, ma'am. We'll find her and then. Miss Thompson. Well, you're better off, ma'am. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. Over here in the Willis. I found her. All right, Chester. Chester. 
as pretty as a picture. I've seen her in Dodge. Walking down Front Street. Pretty as a picture. Yeah. All right, let's ride. We'll look in the Long Branch first, and if Alisco Pete's not there, we'll try the other saloons. I bet his boss is here. He's here every night. Yeah, I know. Follow me in, Chester. Just keep him off my back. I'll take care of the rest of it. Yes, sir. Good luck, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, thanks. Well, look who's here. Matt Dillon. Hiya, Kitty. What brings you in, sweetie? Business? A pleasure. It's not pleasure. Ah. Plenty of other men in Dodge, Kitty. Are they? They come in here, don't they? Sure. They come in. I talk to them, and I drink with them. That's my job. You follow me, Matt? I follow you. I'm off at two every night. Kitty, have you seen Holisco tonight? No. He hasn't been in, Matt. Ben Rourke's sitting over there at a draw table, though. Good. I'll talk to him. I'll see you, Kitty. Sure, Matt. Sure you will. All right, boys, here's where money talks. I'm raising another hundred, and I'll stand pat. Ben? Huh? Well, it's the marshal himself. I'd like to talk to you, Ben. All right, Matt, talk. Not here. We'll go over there by the bar. I'm sorry, I'm busy. I got a pat hand and a cinch pat. Maybe. This is official, Ben. Meaning? Meaning I want to talk to you. Now, come on. Take over my hand, Donnelly. I'll be right back. All right, Matt, let's have it. What do you want to talk about? One of your cowboys, Ben. Holisco Pete. What about him? Know where he is? Around somewhere, I guess. Why? I'd like to know if he lost his spur recently. Tonight, in fact. It's pretty, ain't it? Mexican silver, needlepoint, raw, gold inlaid. Pete's the only man I know in Dodge who's got a pair like this. All right, I'll see that Pete gets it. He'll appreciate your finding it. I doubt that. I found it lying beside a woman he'd just kicked to death. Will Thompson and his whole family were wiped out a few hours ago by four night riders. You know anything about it? How would I know about it? Your boys call you King Rourke, don't they? Never heard of one of them pulling anything without being sure you'd back him up. Matt. Are you claiming I was in on this? You're a cattle rancher, been an open range man. You boys all hate the homesteaders coming in with their plows and fences. Been a lot of fences cut by night riders. Now it's murder. You haven't named me yet, Matt. A couple of months ago, here in the Long Branch, I heard you say you'd get the homesteaders out of Ford County if you had to burn them out. Well, did you? Sometimes a man gets known as a fast gunslinger and it goes to his head. I asked you a question, Ben. Then he gets himself a tin star and goes around bothering people. Ben, if you're figuring to draw on me, don't. Why not, Matt? I've seen you in action. You're not fast enough. Now, I asked you a question. And maybe I don't feel like... What's going on in here? Nothing. Oh, there you are, Marshal. How are you, Colonel? Marshal, what's this I hear about an Indian uprising? There's been none that I've heard about. Whole family massacre, the way I hear it, sir. Murdered and scalped. Scalped? Two of them were. So it was Indians. What game are you playing, Matt? Indians don't cut fences, Ben. That's a cattleman's trick. Scalping, too? Could have been an afterthought. It wasn't an Indian who lost that spur. Well, we'll soon find out about it. I'm riding into the Kiowa country with Troop C tonight. I hope you won't do that, Colonel Blake. You know the Kiowas are peaceable enough when you let them alone, but if you push them, they'll fight. True enough, Marshal. But we can't let them get away with us. The Indians weren't responsible, Colonel. I got evidence to the contrary. Give me 24 hours and I'll prove it. Well, I certainly don't relish stirring up a tribal war, but... Just 24 hours. Well, 
All right. Ben, if you know where Jalisco is, you better turn him in. It'll save trouble. When any of my boys need discipline, I take care of it. Not this time. Other people are involved. Homesteaders. Squatting on a measly 320 acres apiece. Ruining the whole country. They got rights, Ben. Who says so? I do. Morning, Marshal. Good morning. Any luck, Chester? No, sir. I just stopped by the jail here to see if you'd found him. I wish I had. I'll head out again in a few minutes. Oh, this fellow's been waiting for you all morning, Mr. Dillon. Is that so? Well, my name's Ezra Hawkins, Marshal. We ain't met before. I got a homestead up the river. Don't leave me much time to get to town. I see. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Hawkins? Well, it's about what happened to the Thompson family last night. The other homesteaders sort of pointed me to speak for the whole bunch. All right, speak. Well, we want to know what you aim to do about it, Mr. Dillon. I aim to get the killers. When? Mr. Hawkins, I've been up all night trying to get an answer to that question. If you've got any information to offer, fine. If you haven't, the... What's up, Chester? A trail herd's hit town, I guess. Man, pull up, boys. Let's go, Chester. Yes, sir. All right. Hold it there. Hold it. My, my. Jail is occupied, boys. You men just blow into town? You ain't talking to men, Sheriff. These are curly wolves from the circle of quality, the roughest stuff is off in the pan. And you're not talking to the sheriff. I'm the U.S. Marshal. You the range boss? That's right. Red Dudley, and what about it? Dudley, we got a new law here against shooting off firearms inside the city limits. Yeah? You mean like this? <laughs> no, Dudley, I mean more like this. Now, come on down off that horse. Sure, I'll come down off it. Watch it, you don't even got a knife. Yeah, so I see. <laughs> Nice work, Mr. Dillon. Drag him in and lock him up, Chester. Throw some water on him. Yes, sir. All right, curly wolves. Your boss is jailed and fined $50. You can get him out tomorrow morning. We got the money to man. Hold him now. I said tomorrow. Now on the move. All of you, Get! You handle things right fine, Marshal, once you get started. Thanks, Hawkins. Only trouble is some of us homesteaders are getting kind of impatient. The cattle ranch has been treating us pretty bad for too long. The boys are all meeting at my place today. I reckon I can hold them back till tonight. You know what I mean, Marshal. Yeah. I saw it happen in Abilene. Dirty and bloody. I'd hate to see it happen here. Sure, I know what you mean. Range war. Well, well I sure we can hold an inquest any time now. I'm all finished with the autopsy. All right, Doc. It goes pretty fast when you can line them that way, four in a row. Makes the job a lot easier. Yeah, I imagine. Doc, have you ever seen a range war? No, but I hear there's one brewing. There is, plus Indian trouble. If I don't bring in Jalisco Pete before tonight and find out who his three partners were, you're going to have bodies lined up 20 in a row. Well, that sure bring in a lot of fees. I could retire and buy myself a ranch. Sure, Doc. Oh, boy. Oh. oh, that sounds like Chester, Marshal. Yeah, he's been scouting those thickets along the river bottom. Mr. Dillon, I brought in Jalisco. 
Where is he, Chester? Outside, tied on my pack mule. Good. No, sir. I'm afraid it ain't so good. He's dead. Been shot in the back and scalped. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment, but first... CBS Radio, in cooperation with Time Magazine, makes available to you, free of charge, a valuable convention handbook, packed with facts and sidelights about American national political conventions. This convention handbook, containing a convention map and box score of interesting pictures and a complete history of this old American custom, will be yours if you send a postcard with your name and address to Time, CBS, Chicago 90, Illinois. That's Time, CBS, Chicago 90, Illinois. And now, with William Conrad, starred as Matt Dillon, here's the second act of Gunsmoke. Just a second now, Marshal. Here, here, here it comes now. Ah, ah. ah, there's the bullet, if it'll do you any good. It won't, Doc. Uh, the slugs I dig out of the bodies all look alike. Someday, though, they may figure a way to tell them apart. Maybe even tell which gun fired which bullet. Oh, no, not a chance of it, Marshal. Well, I guess that's all I can do for the late lamented. Oh. I see he's only wearing one spur. Yeah, I know. I got the mate to it here. That's what I wanted to talk to him about. Uh, it's too bad, Marshal. His talking days are over. Yeah, somebody made sure of that, all right. And then tried to cover the trail by scalping him. Well, I can tell you one thing. It wasn't done by Indians. That's my guess, too. I've seen how Indians do it. Down in the territory, up in the Dakotas. Slick and clean. Nothing like this. Why, <laughs> I could do a better job with my eyes closed. I bet you could. Well, I guess I'd better get ready for the rush. Looks like a showdown, Marshal. And I don't see any way that you can stop it. Neither do I. Hiya, Kitty. Business again, Matt? Well, I was looking for Ben Rourke. He isn't here. He left about an hour ago. Some of his boys came after him. Matt, I... I waited for you last night. I worked, Kitty. All night? Yeah. There's a bad feeling in the air, Matt. What is it? What's going to happen? I wish I knew. They call all the soldiers from Sea Troop back to Fort Dodge this afternoon. I hear they're planning to move out tonight. I hope not. There's been a lot of homesteaders in here drinking today. That's unusual for them. What's going to happen, Matt? <laughs> the bloodiest mess you've ever seen. And I don't know any way of stopping it. If I'd only found Alisco Pete before they killed him... Now I got nothing to go on. Jalisco came in here last night, late, after you'd gone. What? Huh? Well, why didn't you let me know? There wasn't time, Matt. He heard he was wanted and he left right away. His friends with him. Friends? What friends? Oh, I'd never seen him before. I think Pete had known him in the Pecos country. They were all pretty drunk. How many were with him, Kitty? Three, I guess. One of them was named Red Dudley. Red Dudley. And one called himself Tulsa Jim. He kept... Talking about the Circle Bar yeah, B brand. It might be, it might be. They could have ridden in last night ahead of the herd to look up Pete and then they. Oh, Marshal! Say, you better come on outside here if you want to stop a lynching. Coming, Doc. Be careful, Matt. Be careful. What is it, Doc? Ben Rourke and some of the cattle ranchers. They caught themselves an Indian and they're going to string him up. I doubt it. Let us take care of this, Matt. We know what we're doing. I hope so, Ben. Who have you got here? One of the murdering skunks that wiped out the Thompsons. Any objections? I might work up some, Ben. 
What's your name, fella? He won't talk to you. He hasn't opened his mouth. Look, fella, as an Indian, you're a ward of the government. I'm a U.S. Marshal. I represent the government. I'm here to protect you. Now, what's your name? Keith Toxwa. Work hard. Good man. No kill. What makes them think you did? Say kill people. No kill. He pleads not guilty, Ben. Sure he does. And maybe he can explain why we caught him two miles from my ranch house. Is that reservation? What was he doing there? Mr. Rourke? Maybe I can tell you what he was doing. What? Ezra Hawkins. One side, if you don't mind. You let me through here, please? Let him stand. We got tired of waiting, Marshal. We'd come on into town. Maybe that was a mistake, Hawkins. Maybe. You have to play it the way you see it. Look, mister, let's have it. What's this all about? I'm a homesteader, Mr. Rourke. Well, I accept your apology. (laughs) (laughs) Twarn't no apology. I just wanted you to know who those hundred men across the street were. And they all got guns. A hundred, huh? Nine in the Well, there's 30 of us, so the odds aren't bad. What's on your mind? This Indian's been working for us, Mr. Rourke. Tracking down fence cutters. Maybe that's why you caught him within two miles of your house. Got the nerve to come out and say what you mean, homesteader. You bet I have, fence cutter. All right, hold it. Now, you're covered, Ben, and you too, Hawkins. This play's gone far enough. Not giving a man a chance to draw, Matt? Not this time, Ben. All right, Katoxa, climb off that horse and get over here behind me. Move slow and stay out of the line of fire. You men, if either side makes a move, Ben and Hawkins will be the first to get it. You understand? Doc, take us in into your office. Oh, shoot, sure, shoot, sure. right away, man. Well, Matt, what's the next step? You can't keep us here with our hands in the air forever. I don't intend to. I got one of the murderers locked up in jail. I want you two to come along and listen to his statement, but leave the questions to me, all right? It's just fine with me, Marshal. Your show, Matt. Good. Come on. Chester? Chester? Looks kind of deserted, Matt. He may have gone back to the cells to see. Chester! Ben, Hawkins. What's the matter, Matt? Here, I'll get that gag off of him. You cut the ropes, Ben. Right. All right, Chester, here we go. Easy now. There. What happened, Chester? Oh, they slipped in and got the drop on me, Mr. Dillon. Took Red Dudley with him. There was two of them not more than 20 minutes ago. Who were they? Did you know them? Nope. Circle Bar B-Boys, I think. They slugged me and thought I was out, but I heard them talking. They were all in with Pete on the Thompson killing. Yeah, I know. And they killed Pete, too. They was afraid you'd make him talk. But the question now is, where are they? I know where. They are Kansas rooms. They are Kansas, huh? They planned to hole up there till it got dark. Maybe they've gone by now, though. And maybe not. Want some help, Matt? No, thanks, Ben. It's my job. Mine and Chester's. Come on, Chester. Let's go. The room and house is all dark, Mr. Dill. It doesn't mean a thing. Watch the windows. That's you, Dylan. Drop behind that water trough here. Use your carbine. It's more accurate. Yes, sir. All right, Dudley. Come on out. You're under arrest. Come and get it. Fire at the flashes, Chester. That came from the side window, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, tend to wonder there's somebody behind the other corner. So... Yeah, there was. Break the front of the building, Chester. Yes, sir. I got one. He's hanging out the window. Yeah, it's two down. And Dylan, I... hold your fire. I give up. All right, come on out. Be careful, Mr. Dillon. It may be a trick. It's up to him. Come on out, Dudley. Well, hurry it up. I'm coming. I got a, I got a bullet in my leg. I can't hurry very fast. You, you got me all wrong. Watch it. He's drawing. Hey! 
wrong, Chester. He started to. See if you can find the doc and get him to help you pack these things over to the jail. Yes, sir. Right away, Mr. Dillon. Matt? We all right, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all right, Ben. Had a clean sweep, huh? Looks that way. Well, bullets are cheaper than rope. I guess so. Ben, you and your boys aren't murderers like Red Dudley, but this business of fence cutting can lead to a range war, too. Like it or not, Homesteading's here to stay. There's more of them coming in on every train. I know all that. Those cattlemen built this country, Matt. A few more years now, they'll have us fenced out of it. Times change, Ben. There's range still left out west, New Mexico, Arizona. Yes, I know. Some of us have been thinking about it. Matt, they'll fence you out too, you know. Yeah, I guess they will. <laughs> well, when that time comes, I'll move on. If I'm still around. Farms and families. Next thing they'll do is set up courts and bring the law in here. Law's here now, Ben. In Dodge City, I'm the law. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Harry Bartell, Lou Krugman, and Georgia Ellis, with Jack Crucian, Barney Phillips, Vivi Janis, and Johnny McGovern. Parley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNair is Doc. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Jungle Legacy is the name of tonight's adventure with Tarzan. Listen as Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle, faces a band of unscrupulous men who seek a uranium deposit in Tarzan's realm, through which they hope to rule the world. Don't miss Jungle Legacy tonight, when most of these same CBS radio stations bring you Tarzan. It's packed with thrills, packed with action, packed with tense atmosphere. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Remember, Broadway's My Beat, every Saturday night, on the CBS Radio Network. Marshal, the first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. The cape 
cod girls, they have no combs. They comb their hair with codfish bones. See? Ah, 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 ah. Little mare, what's the matter with you? You've seen a man on a horse before. You calm down, girl. <laughs> They're only waiting to say hello to us. <laughs> Hold up there, Doc. Hello, stranger. You are Doc Adams, ain't you? I am. You're a long way from Dodge. Well, I'm headed for Cam Seaton's place. That's about 15 miles on south. Oh, you know him? Sure. I know him. A horse kicked him in the chest. Now, here he's pretty badly hurt. Some cowboy rode by, found him, and got him into bed, and then came to Dodge after me. I just came from Cam Seaton's, Doc. Oh, well, then, how is he? There's nothing wrong with him. What's that? No. That cowboy was funny. Cam never got kicked by no horse. I don't believe it. Nobody would play a joke like that. Well, it's true. You better turn around and go back to Dodge. Somebody might be needing you there. I'm telling you, Doc. I don't know you, mister. Who are you? Just do what I say. I get that buggy turned around. I'm driving on to Camp Seaton's. You won't drive nowhere if I shoot your horse, Doc. Put that gun away. You gonna do what I say? Of course I'm not. Then you're gonna be a foot, Doc. You shoot that horse, I'll shoot you. Oh, shotgun, huh? Now what are you doing with a shotgun, Doc? I like to eat prairie chicken, mister. But I've seen what two barrels of birdshot can do to a man. <laughs> you? Doctor? You're bluffing. There's a man with a caved-in chest waiting for me 15 miles from here. You kill my horse, he might be dead before I can get there. Oh, yes, mister. I'll shoot if I have to. You won't turn around and go back to Dodge? Nobody keeps me from being where I'm needed. The horse goes, Doc. And if you try anything, you go next. Don't you do it. Watch me. Oh. I told you not to. I told you. Still think Doc came here, Mr. Dillon? Well, there is footprints, Chester, headed straight for the house. Well, I just can't leave no part of it. His horse back there dead, and his buggy and that body laying in it all bloody. Look on the porch, sir. Hmm? He just came out of the house. Yeah. It's Doc, all right. Hello, Matt. Chester? Oh, Doc. The Allen boy reported finding your horse and buggy back there, Doc. I'm glad to see you're all right. I'm all right, man. How's Cam Seaton? He was dead when I got here. Oh? I guess you saw the man I left in my buggy. Yeah. He was a stranger to me, man. You kill him, Doc? He killed my horse. And I shot him before he even turned his gun on me. His horse ran off. I see. So I guess it isn't exactly self-defense, is it? Well, that's not for me to decide, Doc. Am I under arrest? The day I have to arrest you is the day I quit. There'll be talk, Matt. People say I ought to be waiting trial in jail. And they'll be blaming you for it. You sure you know what you're doing? Too bad that man's horse ran off, Doc. You might have got here in time if you hadn't had to walk.
you ain't so bad worried, are you, Doc? Uh, worried? About what, Chester? Well, everybody's sort of been eyeing you ever since we got back. Oh, no, not everybody, Chester. Well, now, you take that fellow across the street, standing there by the Tom Soil. Yeah, yeah. Seems like he's always watching you from somewhere. I don't think I even know that man, Chester. He ain't been in town but a couple days. Well, who is he? Well, I don't know. Well, he's got nothing to do with me. You're forever dreaming up something, Chester. I always said there's too much schoolgirl in you. Now, you listen here to me, Doc. I don't know what you're talking about, but I ain't sure I like it. Well, let me know when you make up your mind. I'm going to go back to my office. Wait wait a minute. Eh, what's what? Here's Mr. Dunn. Mike, he looks real mad about something. Yes, he does. Let's go over to the Texas Trail, Doc. What for? I just told off a few of our leading citizens up the street, and now I want to be seen buying you a drink to really give them something to talk about. Now, wait a minute, Matt. I I know what they've been saying about me not being in jail. But you can't fight them all. It isn't all of them. It's only a rotten few so far. Come on. I want everybody to know where I stand. No. No, Matt. Can I come, too? I'd be proud to buy the second round myself. How about it, Doc? Well... Well, I guess I can't turn down a drink with with a couple of friends. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, too, Chester. Now I really had better get back to my office. Okay, Doc. Uh, hold on a minute. There's that fellow again, Doc. He followed us in here. What? At the end of the bar there, Mr. Dillon. He keeps watching Doc all the while. You know him, Doc? Well, uh, there is something familiar about him. What do you mean he's been watching, Doc, Chester? I don't know, but every doggone time I'm with Doc, I see him. Matt? Yeah. I know who he looks like now. Who? The man I killed. What? Yes, there's a resemblance. A very definite resemblance. Well, who do you think it might be? Well, I'm not sure. I feel kind of funny inside. Same as I did out there on the prairie. You two wait here. I'd like to know your name, stranger. You would? No offense. I'm Marshal Dillon. Now, what's your name? Nate. Nate what? Nate'll do, marshal or no marshal. Where are you from? Colorado. What are you doing in Dodge? You got something against me. Say it out, marshal. All right. Doc Adams killed a man last week. He thinks you look like you might be related to him. Your Doc Adams has got a bad conscience, maybe. I can't help who I look like. He could be wrong. But if he's right, I want you to remember something. Doc's a friend of mine. If anything happened to him, I'd take it real personal. You ain't talking about me, Marshal. It'd be a bad death, mister. I'd kill real hard. Chester. Yes, sir. Go get yourself a shotgun. What? You're going to stay with the Doc. Day and night. From now on. company. Uh, it's about this trouble Doc's in, Kitty. I, oh. I think you might be able to help. Well, I'd do anything for Doc, Matt. You know that. Well, this will take your whole evening. Won't be easy. Go on. There's a stranger been hanging around town, says his first name is Nate. Uh, he's medium height, wears a buckskin jacket and a brown slouch hat. Now, I've seen him. Well, Doc thinks he might be related to the man he killed. He thinks it might be his brother. 
You want me to find out? Well, it might take a lot of doing, Kitty. Maybe it's asking too much. You can't put him in jail, Matt. That might save Doc's life. Well, I doubt if he's a man who got drunk by himself. Or easily. And even drunk, I don't know if you can make him talk. Leave that to me, Matt. It's like I said. I'll do anything for Doc. I thought I told you to stay with Doc. Well, I was with him all last night and all today, so far. Well, where is he now? Why, well, I don't know. We was playing some cards here, and then I laid down for a minute. And, well, oh, dear, I just don't know how I could have put Go up to his like office, that. see if he's there, and stay with him if he yeah. is. Yes, sir, I will. Oh, I just don't know how. Well, Miss Kitty. Oh, Chester. Well, yeah, it's nice to see you, but i got to go. I went uh, to go on. Okay, Chester. Well, Matt... Uh, sit down, Kitty. Yeah. You look tired. That was about the longest night I ever spent. Where's, uh, Nate, whatever his name is? The last I saw of him, it was dawn, and he was almost asleep on one of the tables at the Long Branch. You're right, Matt. That man sure can drink. Well, Kitty, huh? is it doing any good? Uh, some. His name's Nate Brandle. Brandle? Mm-hmm. His brother's name was Miles Brandle. Yeah. And it was his brother Doc killed. Well, that's why Nate's after Doc. I guess he just hasn't had a good chance to get him yet. But he's going to marry No, he isn't. I'll run him out of town now that I really know who he is. Well, you want to hear the rest of it first? <sighs> yeah, go ahead, Kitty. Well... Nate's brother, this Miles Brandle, he heard Cam Seaton was living here and he rode all the way from Colorado to kill him. And he found him lying there hurt and learned that he'd sent for Doc. Huh? I guess he figured if he could keep Doc away, Cam wouldn't need kill him. And he was right. Why was he after Cam? Well, Nate didn't say much about that. But the important thing is that Miles was an outlaw with the price of $1,000 on his head. I never had a circler on him. It's true, anyway, according to Nate. That's why he's after Doc so bad. He thinks Doc shot his brother for the reward money. But hasn't he heard this story? I can not believe it, Matt. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, Chester. Doc left a note on his door that he's down at the stable looking over a new buggy horse. I'm going to hurry on down there. Wait a minute. I'm going with you, Chester. Kitty. Huh? I, uh, I think Doc will be wanting to thank you himself for what you've done. Side door. Yeah. Well, I don't see no buggy horse going or nobody else. Well, at least Doc's still all right. Well, I promise I won't never fall asleep again. Well, I will take Doc back to the office where he'll be safe, and I'll go round up Nate Brandle. Now, where's he going? Hey, Doc! Somebody shot me. Yeah, come on. I'm all right, man. Stand down, Doc. There he goes out that stall. All right. Got him. Doc. Did you kill him, Matt? I tried not to, Doc. You hit me twice. Here. Let me have a look. No. You finish me like you finished my brother. Oh, don't be a fool. Hold still now. Better you up to my office, Matt. 
One of those bullets has to come out before I can stop the bleeding. I just tried to kill you, Doc. I know. Then what are you doing trying to save me? I'm a doctor. Nothing can keep me from a man who needs me. I tried to explain that to your brother. I don't believe you. You're lying. Let's get him moved, Matt. We're wasting time. Yeah, it finally came, Chester. Now, go upstairs and get Doc, will you? I'll be in the office. Yes, sir. Nate, you awake? I'm awake. Now, come on out. What for? Gonna hang me? Go on into the office. Two weeks in bed, three weeks in jail. Begin to wish you'd killed me, Marshal. I kept you in jail because Doc wanted you there, Nate. Has he always run the law around here? It was him you tried to kill, wasn't it? If I had my way, you'd be in prison. Between you and Doc, I ain't got a chance of nothing, have I? We're gonna get that settled right now. What do you mean? I don't know. I'm doing this Doc's way. I didn't ask you. I got him, Mr. Dillon. Good morning, Matt. Morning, Doc. Hello, Nate. Well, it came in today's mail, Doc. Give it to me, Matt. Here it is. Thank you. You got a pin in your desk, Matt? Yeah, I'll help yourself. What is that? What are you talking about, anyway? The reward money. Thousand dollar check for killing your brother. Oh. Doc put in his claim, so I sent to Colorado for it. Yeah, I might have known. I hope you have a good time with it, Doc. What are you going to spend it on? Tell us. I'll tell you, Nate. I'm going to spend it on you. I've endorsed it. Here. It's all yours. Mine. Take it. What for? You'll have to figure out what for. Well, it's about time you did. Marshal? Yeah, Nate. My brother left a wife in Denver. I'm going to see she gets this... She won't have to know what it's from. Can I leave now? Yeah, you can leave. But, Marshal, don't worry about it, Nate. I'll tell Doc you finally got it figured out. William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Harley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty.
Dodge City and in the territory on West. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Howdy, Marshal. Hello, Mr. Biggs. Can I give you a hand? No, no. This is the last match here. <laughs> Hey, wait till the flies get to these buffalo hides in the morning and be enough vultures overhead to keep the place in the shade for a week. <laughs> yeah. You know, you'll sure have your hands full by tomorrow night. Yeah, it looks that way. When these boys turn them hides into cash, they'll bite the corks out of every bottle in town. <laughs> and some of them look mean enough sober. Yeah. Well, you better bed down and get some sleep, Mr. Biggs. Uh, where are your boys? I don't know. Jeff had some trouble with the dry axle up near Pony Rock, and Boaz stopped to help him fix it, but well, they shouldn't be this long behind me. Well, if I see him, I'll tell him where to find you. You, you can tell Jeff, but Boaz ain't even going to hear you. Oh, why? What's the matter with him? Oh, he's riding higher than an eagle. You know that white buffalo you've been hearing about? The albino? Mm -hmm. Well, it's just Indian talk. Oh, you think so, huh? Well, if it is, Boaz sure shot himself a mighty scared buffalo. <laughs> White is borax. Yeah, that ought to fetch a price. Hey, anybody seen Marshal Dillon? Yeah, right over, there. over here, Chester. You better saddle up, Mr. Dillon. What's the matter, Chester? The Indian trouble. Two men dead and a couple of wagons burned up out there. I found this. A war rattle made out of buffalo toes. Arapaho. Well, they haven't been making any trouble. Well, he's dead. I, I was topping a hill when I saw the wagons go up in fire. It was Indians, all right. I saw one ride off. That's funny. I never heard of Arapahoes attacking at night. How far out, Chester? Ten mile, maybe. Toward Pawnee Rock. Pawnee Rock? Marshal, my sons are coming from there. Easy, Mr. Briggs. Lots of wagons in the church. <laughs> Marshal, I didn't see another wagon between here and Pawnee except the ones we had, but... The Indians killed my boys. There's only one way to make sure, Mr. Biggs. Saddle up and ride over to my office. I'll be with you as soon as I can get my horse. I cut back through those button willows over there when I spotted the wagons being fired. We must be close to it, then. Just over there. Right down yonder. See him? Yeah. I see him. We rode up and dismounted. The last glint of hope in Mr. Big's eyes died. His boys were there, all right. And it wasn't nice to see. Kill him. I'll get him, please. I'll murder every red skin in the territory. We got to bring your sons in, Mr. Biggs. You know what the morning's going to be like. You don't want to leave them out here. Now, come on. Hey, look. Down there by the stream. Yeah, four of them. And they're not saddle horses. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs. <laughs> You yeah. recognize those horses down there? I, yeah. I know them. Teams belong to Boaz and Jeff. Indians must cut them loose from the wagons before they fired them. Doesn't that seem curious to you, Chester? In what way, Mr. Dillon? Why didn't they take the horses with them? Yeah. What are you thinking, Marshal? No burned hides in those wagons. So they stole them. Yeah, they stole them. But Boaz and Jeff both have their rifles there beside them, and the horses are left behind, too. Horses and guns are the first things Indians would go for. What are you looking for, Mr. Dillon? Those buffalo hides weren't carried off without wagons. 
Yeah, here. Marks the two other wagons here, and they're fresh. I didn't see any other wagons, only these. Well, they'd finish and gone before you got here, Chester. Well, yeah, but I, I'd have caught up to any wagons on the trail to Dodge. Did you go by regular trail? Well, no, I... I figured the Indian I saw wasn't alone. I didn't want to get bushwhacked further on. You didn't see any Indian, Chester. But Mr. Dillon, just as plain... No as... Indian would leave guns and horses. This job was done by white men. It didn't take anything that could be recognized or identified. You mean that somebody's in Dodge by now? With the hides my boys worked and sweated to get? I'm afraid so, Mr. Biggs. Well, there'll be more than 300 buffalo hunters there by morning. It could be any of them. We'll find our right ones. Oh, how? The albino. Whoever killed your sons will have that white buffalo hide. It was almost sunup when we got back to town. And more wagons had jammed the main street, lining up for the unloading barns. I rode down the line, looking them over one by one. Howdy, Marshal. Some of the men would take their money, drink it up, and drift away. Few would stay long enough to be buried on Boot Hill. Then suddenly a wagon driver up ahead pulled out a line. Oh, hey, hey, wait a minute, Jim. Oh, oh. Now, take my hands off since you get back to your place. Oh, I'm tired of waiting. Now, let go of that bit, mister. Don't do that, stranger. Get your hand away from my gun. Well, now, no there's any law around you. There is, so don't try making your own. You got no right grabbing my team. I got plenty of right when he tries to horn in in front of me, Marshal. That's a lie, Marshal. He cut Never mind. Hard. You both want to cool your heads out in jail? Now, what's your name? Tennessee is good enough. A lot of people from Tennessee coming into the territory. Most of them are pretty peaceful. That sounds like you're saying I'm not. You move pretty fast for that gun. Man can lose his temper. You lost yours four times according to the notches you've carved into that gun butt. But don't try for number five. Not here. How about you? What do you call? Charlie Kell. Charlie Kell, huh? They ever call you Chuck? No. Heard of a Chuck Kell a couple of years back. Come from Kentucky. Not me. Man I heard about was a gunfighter. So he never wore gloves. See, you don't either. It's pretty rough on the hands. Thanks, Marshal. I'll make sure to take better care of him. Yeah, do that. I'll be around a while, Marshal. Maybe we can have another talk. Anytime. They'd need watching. But what I wanted now was a white buffalo hide. Searching the wagons wouldn't do. There wasn't time. And a search had let the killers know that something in the hides they'd stolen could be identified. The time to find out would be when the buyers checked them. I got Biggs and Chester to cover two of the unloading barns, and I covered the third one. And then finally daylight came, and the haggling started. And you want to sell those hides? Better learn how to handle these skin and knife a little better. They're as good as any. They're full of holes, they ain't. Give you four dollars a hide for the bunch. You gave that last call eight. <laughs> he looked tougher than you. <laughs> six. I'll take six. Four. Take it or leave it. You think you can rob me, mister? Watch your mouth, boy. Here, none of that. Let me go. Easy, son. Go. Let me have that gun just so you won't be tempted. Here, that's better. Give me that. Give it back. You can pick it up at my office whenever you're ready to leave town. Now, you look like a city boy to me. Where are you from? St. Louis? None of your business. When something's got you beat, son, there's no shame to admitting it and going home. Sometimes that takes a real man. Don't tell me what to do. Why don't you watch your own job? Why don't you leave me alone, Marshal? I ain't got a white buffalo hide. What'd you say, boy? You heard me. What do you know about a white buffalo hide? What everybody else knows. That you're looking for one. Everybody in town knows it. How? Because the old man whose sons were bushwhacked all liquored up over at the other barn, shooting off his mouth. 
Don't go away mad, Marshal. <laughs> Mr. Biggs wasn't at the barn where I'd left him. I cut through an alley to Front Street and headed for the saloons. I never got to him. Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon? What's the matter, Chester? Old man Biggs. Where is he? I'm looking for him. Well, he... He was over by the barn I was watching. Drunk. Going through the wagon. Yeah, I know about that. I was trying to get him to go back to his own barn, but all of a sudden... He took off. For where? I don't know, but there was one wagon he was watching in particular. The driver walked away from it with a package of some kind. That white hide? It could have been, I don't know, but Big sure thought so. He lit out after the fellow with blood in his eye. Which way? Down there where the boy's been hitching the empty wagon. Well, let's go. The old boy's drunk enough to make trouble. He's liable to kill somebody. Or get killed. Too late, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. It came from there behind that row of wagons. You stay here, Chester. Be careful, Mr. Dillon. When I rounded the corner wagon, Mr. Biggs was sprawled across a wagon tongue, his eyes dead and open, staring at the ground. And standing over him was Tennessee, a smile on his face, and his gun extended to me butt first. Looks like I'm in a mite of trouble, Marshal. He's dead, Tennessee. That's more than a mite. Uh, you take my gun for a while. You mean until after you hang? Wasn't figuring it to be that serious. Not when a drunk follows me out here and throws down on me. If you're figuring on self-defense, forget it. Look at his gun. It isn't even caught. What's out of his holster, Marshal? That's enough. Law don't say I have to wait till he kills me. You'll have to make a jury believe that. No, well, you I... shouldn't have much trouble doing that, Marshal. What are you doing here, Mr. Kell? Oh, I just happened to follow Tennessee out here. Why? Well, you broke up our little argument in town. Thought I'd get him alone here. See if maybe he was still nursing a grudge he wanted to settle. But the old man beat me to it. Now, Tennessee here ain't exactly a friend of mine, as you know, but... I hate to see any man hang when he ain't guilty. Is that your personal verdict, Mr. Kell? That's right, Marshal. The old man threw down on him, and Tennessee had to kill him in self-defense. Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon? Which one of them had the package? This one. This is the fellow the old man was after. All right, Tennessee, where is it? I don't know anything about a package. Look in the wagon, Chester. See anything? Nothing here. I reckon you can give my gun back to me now. All right, Tennessee. Here. Thanks. But if you decide to use it again while you're in Dodge or any place else in Kansas, I hope I'm there when you do. Well, now, don't you fret, Marshal. I'm sure you will be. Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, action excitement thrills. That's Gangbusters. Gangbusters helps to fight crime by fearlessly naming the criminals. Listen for it later this evening on CBS Radio. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Just before sundown, we buried old man Biggs and his two sons up on Boot Hill. By the time the service was over and I rode down, darkness had fallen. And everything was going full blast. The town was roaring. Seemed like a good man, old Biggs. He was, Chester. So are his boys. Yeah, but there are too many men like Tennessee and Kell coming in, Mr. Dillon. They won't last, Chester. They'll keep coming, but they won't last. They'll take a gun and go against a man, but they won't sweat. They won't take root and build. We still gonna look for that hide? Yeah. Well, just what do you want me to do, Mr. Dillon? 
Tennessee and Kell will be in town, but their wagons are back there with the other empties. Ride back and look them over. Well, they might have had somebody carry that package off for them. It might be, but they don't seem like partners, Mr. Dillon. From what I heard, you stopped them from gunfighting. It took more than one man to kill the Biggs boys, and more than one man and more than one wagon to cart the hides in. Well, you mean they staged that trouble just for you? Just for me. After they heard I was looking for that white hide. Well, why do you figure that, Mr. Dillon? When gunfighters start for their guns, nothing stops them, Chester. They both started, but they both stopped. I reckon you better take a look through those wagons. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Uh, Where'll I meet you? I'll be checking the saloons. <laughs> One by one, I made the stops. The Long Branch, the Alafraganza, the Texas Trail. And one by one, they got quieter as I went in. As though each place is holding its breath. Waiting for something to happen. The last place was a Mexican hangout. A long, dark walk. Hello, Marshal. Can't see me, can you, Marshal? No. No, I can't see you, son. Too bad. Because I got another gun. They sell them around here. And I ain't going back to St. Louis. You'll fire once, son, and if you don't kill me with that, and I'll kill you. I'll gamble on that, Marshal. You Marshal! He lurched from the shadows into the street, staggered, and fell. And then he rolled over on his back, and his eyes struggled for a minute like they were trying to remember something. And then he went blank. Well, he was right about one thing. He wasn't going back to St. Louis. Well, what do you know? The marshal's real handy with a gun. Stay out of this, Kel. But I may have something to talk over with you later. You mean what? If you don't know, then you got nothing to worry about. I've been hearing a lot about how fast you are with a gun, Dylan. Anything to it? I'm still alive. Yeah. This your hobby? Shooting kid? He was old enough to try to kill me. I don't like it, Marshal. That's too bad, Mr. Kell. The Chuck Kell I heard about would have loved it. They said he'd killed two kids under 16, one of them his own brother. No, you didn't hear the whole story, Marshal. The Kell you heard about killed a Marshal, too. You made the bid, Mr. Kell. You got a gun. Use it or I'll take it away from you. Come and get it. Anytime. Here it is. How you feeling, Mr. Dillon? I'm all right, Chester. Doc fixed your head. Wasn't much he could do for Kel, though. I hit him. If you didn't, he sure died for nothing. He was fast, all right. Boys say you made him look like a sleepy burro. Never even cleared his holster. And my head says different. You didn't get that from Kel. What do you mean? Tennessee was up the street with a rifle. He creased you. Huh? Where is he now? I don't know, Mr. Dillon. He rode out of town before I could stop him. I was the only one who saw him. I was coming up street to find you. All right. Let's get out of here. Did you find anything in the wagons? No, sir. But I found Tennessee's wife. Wife? That's right, Mr. Dillon. In a small wagon next to his. He's a squaw man. His wife's an Indian girl. Well, let's find her.
All right, Chester. Which way? Edge of town, Mr. Dillon. Well, let's go. You talk to the wife? Yes, sir. Found out Tennessee and Kel were friends, all right. They left her here night before last and arranged to meet her here today. She said they were driving empty wagons when they left her. Ask her what tribe she belonged to? Didn't have to ask, Mr. Dillon. I could tell by her beads. She's no Arapaho. <laughs> was there, all right, crouched by the wheel of a wagon. Her face was bloody, and she stared into a small campfire, rocking back and forth without a sound. She wasn't beat up when I left her, Mr. Dillon. Where's your husband? He gone. Gone where? He gone. Tell me which way he went, and I'll bring him back to you. No. You law man. Your husband had a white buffalo hide, didn't he? Tell me. No. Other man killed white buffalo. Then your husband took the hide away from him? Well, he buy. He buy hide. He didn't buy him. He killed two men to get him. He killed with Indian paint on his face. He left an Arapaho war rattle. He wants the blame to come to your people. If the white men think the Arapahoes are on the warpath, the soldiers will come. No. Arapaho, peaceful. Where's the white hide? What'd your husband do with it? He tell me. Bury it. Where? Where's it buried? There. Back there. By tree. Go dig it up, Chester. And then stay with her like it back. You going after him, Mr. Dillon? As soon as she tells me which way. All right, Mr. Dillon. You're white man. No good. Now tell me which way he went. You let him go. He not come back. I can't let him go. If I do, the soldiers will come after your people. He beat you and he ran away from you. Now he'll bring death to your tribe unless I get him. Where did he go? He... He right to... where moon sleep. I rode east. Tennessee had had about an hour's start, but I figured to make up most of that before sunrise. The prairie was open and flat except for an occasional roll. And the Arkansas River would keep him from cutting south. His best bet for a fresh horse would be Kinsley, and I rode hard for it. It was just turning daylight when I rode in. Well, howdy, Marshal. Morning. Good morning. Got a place I can water my horse. Draw off right there. Just let him loose. You'll find it. Thank you. Looks like you come a long way. Dodge. Now, the fella here just a few minutes ago been riding hard, too. He come from up Pawnee Way, though. Tall, dark, riding a vinegar roan? Yeah, that's right. You get a fresh horse here? I'd send my boy out the corral to get one for him. He'll be back soon. You mean he's still here in town? Yeah. Asked about breakfast, so I sent him over to the Widder Hilliard's place. Uh, right over there, across the road. Thank you. I'll be back. Say, you after that fellow, Marshal? Yes? Understand your servant breakfast, ma'am. I sure thing, Marshal. Dylan! That's right. Give me a clear way out the door. Or I'll kill you. Come by me, Tennessee. 
I'll come shooting. That's all right. But just be sure you get me this time. You hurt, ma'am? No, I... I'm all right, Marshal. He looks kind of dead. Yeah. Bad one, hmm? Yes, him. Gunfighter. Thief. Killer. What's your name, Marshal? Dillon, ma'am. Matt Dillon. I, uh... I'm sorry about... Marshal. When my husband brought me out here 15 years ago, Indians burned this place down three times. I'm used to killing. You want to carry him out? I'll go fix you that breakfast. Thank you, ma'am. It's a long ride back to Dodge. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Joel Murcott, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Stan Waxman, John Daner, and Larry Dobkin, with Sam Edwards, Lillian Bayef, Tom Holland, and Mary Lansing. Parley Bayer is Chester. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Something new in CBS Radio Newsroom coverage, World News with Robert Trout presents as a special weekly feature an interview with a crack CBS Radio News correspondent. This correspondent flies in from his post overseas to give you his authoritative eyewitness viewpoint on latest developments. Tomorrow afternoon on most of these same stations, World News with Robert Trout. This is Clarence Cassell speaking. And remember, from now to November, you'll find intensive impartial campaign coverage on the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal, the first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Dollars for an accident. You need the kind of protection that only mutual level law sells. What do you need? 
You need health insurance that offers you maximum benefits at minimum cost. Mutual of Omaha Income Protection Insurance with the unusual lifetime benefit feature. Add this long-term protection to your group coverage and save up to 54%, depending on your age and type of group coverage. Here's what you need. You need to get the most for your health insurance dollar by insuring with Mutual Benefit Health and Accident Association. For maximum benefits at minimum cost, call your local Mutual of Omaha agent in the yellow pages or write Mutual of Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska. Write for details on the low-cost, practical protection you need. You can save up to 54% when you add Mutual of Omaha protection to your group coverage. Write Mutual of Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> Mr. Dillon? Mr. D Mr. Dillon. Take it easy, Chester. But there's been a train robbery, Mr. Dillon, what? about five miles east. They held up the baggage clerk and got away with $50,000 in double eagles. Well, when did you hear about it? Just now, when number seven pulled into the station. You've got to get over there right away. Well, I guess they'll wait. The city's the end of the line. Well, yes, sir, I know Anybody that. Anybody say how many were in on it? Three, according to the clerk, all wearing masks. They snuck aboard when the train stopped for water at Cottonwood Tanks. Made them cut the rest of the train loose and go on with just the engine and the baggage car. Had horses waiting down the track somewhere. You ought to get over at the depot, Mr. Dillon. The baggage clerk shot pretty bad. Shot? Now, why didn't you say that? Yeah, and another thing. They cut the wire so the train crew couldn't telegraph ahead. Same old story, Mr. Dillon. You'd think them bandits would figure out some new way. Why? This one usually works. <laughs> I said to keep that mob out of this baggage car. They're out, Doc. Huh? Well, who are you? Oh, I didn't know it was you, Mac. How is he? He, he caught one through the lung. I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for yeah. that. I want to find out where it happened. I can tell you exactly, Marshal. Oh? About 100 yards east of milepost 314. It's on the curve where the line swings in toward the river bottom. You one of the passengers? Oh, I'm a legal agent for the railroad and for the bank that owns that money. My name is Crocker, J.L. Crocker. And I want immediate action on this matter. I want that money back at once. And I want the guilty parties brought to justice. Are you getting all this, Chester? Yes, sir. I'm making mental notes. Well, now, Marshal, I don't believe you quite understand who I am. Sure, you're the legal something or other for somebody, and you're bothering me. Now, will you stand back? Doc, is there any chance of talking to him? Well, you can try. All right. Mister, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Did you recognize any of them? No. Who wore masks? Only one said anything. Gave all the orders. He's the one who shot me. Men, about 50. <laughs> Is that all you can tell me? I don't feel so good, Marshal. I think I... <laughs> That's it, man. Yeah. Chester, yes, go get our horses saddled up. We'll ride out to milepost 314. With luck, we can get there before dark, maybe pick up their trail some way. All right, Chief. Well, now, Marshal, in my opinion, you ought to form a posse to go after these criminals. Mr. Crocker, I don't care about your opinions. Hmm. I think I'll have a little talk with your superiors when I get back to civilization. Good. Find out what's happened to my checks. I haven't been paid for two months. The following message is brought to you by the Savings and Loan Foundation. Where you save does make a difference. Where you save does make a difference. Where you save does make a difference. Save more, have more, earn more. At Savings and Loan. Yes, your dollars get good earnings at insured savings and loan associations. People like you are receiving over $700 million right now. It's money their money has earned. You can do it too. Where you save does make a difference. Join the millions of thrifty people who make a profit on their savings at Insured Savings and Loan Association. Now's the time to start an account. 
or add to the one you have at your nearby insured savings and loan. Remember, where you save does make a difference. Where you save does make a difference. Where you save does make a difference. Save more, have more, earn more at savings and loan. Chester, pull up a second. Yes, sir. Reckon they've heard us yet? No, they don't show it. Both of them are still working around the campfire, paying no attention. Fixing supper, I guess. A man and a young boy. Must be homesteaders on the move. I never heard of bandits hightailing it in the covered wagon. Besides, there's only two of them. Three men held up the train. Yeah, I know. Now, let's ride on down to the fire. Well, now, uh, howdy, strangers. Evening. Climb down and sit. You have some supper ready here in a spell, such as it is. Keep your eye on that coffee, Jerry. I'm watching it, Paul. Huh. You men pushing cattle? No, hunting killers. What? Had a train robbery this morning. Now, I'm a U.S. Marshal out of Dodge. My name's Dillon. Well, proud to know you, Marshal Dillon. I'm Dan Everly. This is my boy, Jerry. How are you, sir? Jerry, how are you? Well, we're heading for Dodge ourselves. How far we got to go yet? About nine miles. You planted the homestead? That's right. Had a place back at Newton, but it didn't do so good. So, somebody robbed a train. Mm-hmm. Huh? Three of them. Got away with $50,000 in gold. Have you met anybody today? No, no, nary a soul. Now, Marshal, you just rest yourself there now, and we'll have some side meat and hominy in a few minutes. Oh, fine, thanks. This is it, Chester. We found them. These two? How do you figure? They're horses. Saddle stock never meant to haul a wagon. And the third one's over to the right in that thicket covering us. Saw a glint on his gun barrel. What will we do? Move fast. You roll to the left, draw, and cover the tube of the fire, and I'll take the one in the brush. You got it? Yes, sir. All right, then. No. Don't move, you do. You're covered. You there in the brush. Come out with your hands up. Now, wait, Marshal. Don't shoot. All right, then. Tell him to get out here with his hands up. They got us. There's no use fighting. Come out, like he says. Why didn't you let me fight, Pa? I could have shot them both. Oh, it's a girl. So it is. With my daughter, Janet, I told her to hide out there till we found out what she wanted. I wanted to keep her out of this. So you and your two kids were the bandits, huh? Now you're quite a father, Mr. Everly. You leave him alone. Pa knew what he was doing. He had a right to that money. I see. How old are you, Janet? Eighteen. It's any of your business. Uh, the young uns ain't to blame, Marshal. I brought them up to do like I told them. They didn't know. Somebody ought to have known. Now, where's the money? Don't tell him. Be quiet, Janet. Marshal, we buried that money, and I reckon I'm not going to tell you where it is. It's ours, and we got a right to it. Yeah, you said that before. I had a homestead outside of Newton. My wife died there. The young'uns and me fought the prairie for four years. Crop failures, hard times. Then last fall, I finally got a good stand of wheat ripe for the harvest. You know what happened? No, what happened? Sparks from a train set fire to the grain field, burned us out, lost everything. I wrote letters to the railroad office in St. Louis. They said I'd have to come back there and prove my claim. Now, they knew I couldn't do that. Well, did anybody ever tell you things were easy out here in the West, Mr. Everly? Chester, you and the boy hitch up that wagon and start loading it. All right, sir. Come on, son. What are you... What are you aiming to do with it? Take you into Dodge City. To jail. This happened in Death Valley in the blazing desert sun. No others dared to do it, so there could be only one. 
Just one that passed the killing grind of sun and wind and sand. The test that proved this new car wax the finest in the land. Turtle wax, turtle wax, turtle wax. Turtle... Reader's Digest ad tells the story of the amazing turtle wax protective power that kept cars' colors shining bright even in fiery Death Valley sun. Just one waxing of turtle wax with new sun stop gives your car a beautiful hard shell finish guaranteed to last up to one full year. It's quick and easy to turtle wax your car yourself. Remember, just one waxing of turtle wax with sun stop lasts up to one full year. Turtle wax gives a hard shell finish. Turtle wax gives a hard shell finish. Turtle wax. <laughs> All right, pull up, Everly. Oh, boy. Oh. All of you, get on. I guess my reasons for robbing that train don't count for much, do they, Marshal? Judge, it's not part of my job, Everly. But not the young ones. It wasn't their fault. You killed a man, Everly. What do you expect? Marshal, I didn't aim to kill him. He went for his gun as we was leaving, but I didn't aim to kill him. Well, Marshal, I see you brought in the culprits. Yeah, it looks that way, Mr. Crocker. Oh, where's the money? I want to get it locked up in the bank right away. They say they buried it. They've... What? Matt? Matt, are you all right? I heard of the balloon that you brought in the bandit. That's right. Is she one of them? That girl? Yeah. She's just a kid, Matt. You're not going to lock up a girl. Kitty, I don't like the idea any better than you do. That jail wasn't built for women. I know that. Matt, let me take her. What? She won't try to get away with the others in jail. She can stay in my rooms while I'm working. I'll take care of her, Matt. Janet, you go with Kitty here. Yes, sir. Stay with her and do whatever she says. Thanks, Matt. Thanks a lot. Come on, honey. Just so you take these other two inside and lock them up. Yes, sir. Come on. Let's go. Now, Marshal, pretty or not, that girl is a criminal. Why aren't you locking her up? Well, we've got a different attitude toward women out here, Mr. Crocker. We never got around to building jails for them. Well, what about the money? $50,000 missing. That's right, it is. Well, it's a long ride into town, wasn't it, Marshal? Moonlight, pretty girl in a wagon, chance to talk. Maybe Why, do you... you... You there. Yes, sir. Drag him over there to the water trough and stick his head under the pump. Now, here's a lilting little tune sung by a group that really knows how to keep you looking your best dressed best. There's a difference, see the difference, with Stay New. Stay New, S-T-A-N-U, the quality finishing, offered only by quality dry cleaners from coast to coast. Stay New costs nothing extra, restores the light new look to all your clothes, makes them soil and wrinkle resistant, brings back original store fresh texture, sparkling color, and cashmere-like feel. Stay New dry cleaners are listed in the yellow pages under the Stay New trademark. Why don't you send your next dry cleaning order to your nearest Stay New dry cleaners? All dry cleaners don't have Stay New, only the best do. You can feel the difference, feel the difference. With Stay New, Stay New, Stay New. Are you and Kitty gotten along, Janet? Oh, just fine. She's been wonderful. The noise downstairs bother you? Keep you awake at night? No. No, the only thing that keeps me awake is worrying about Pa and Jerry. What are you going to do with us? And I got no say about that. There's no proper court here. I, I'll probably get orders to send you up to Hayes City for trial. Oh, they won't understand. Maybe Pa was wrong. I guess he was, but but he thought he was doing right. Sure, we all think that. 
He was doing it for us, for Jerry and me. And he didn't mean to kill that man, Marshal. Really, he didn't. Well, I, uh... I better be going now. Sure. Goodbye, John. She's quite taken with you, Kitty. Stories around town say you're a little taken with her, Matt. That's Mr. Crocker's tones. He's been shooting his mouth off for a week mm -hmm. now. He's offered a thousand dollar reward for the return of that money, no questions asked. Yeah, I know. But how much do you know? What do you mean? Well, people will know you don't pay any attention, Matt, but some of these hangers-on around the saloon wonder if you did make a deal for that money. Now, who cares what they think? But it's bad, Matt. Crocker keeps prodding them. Some of them are beginning to say that Everly might remember where the money is if they had ropes around their necks. Now, well, lynch mob, huh? <laughs> yeah, they're going to have to move fast. I got orders about an hour ago to send the three up to Hayes City in the morning. Oh, Matt. Does she know about it? No. I just didn't have the heart to tell her. Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon. What's the matter, Chester? Miss Kitty sent me to get you. Oh? Yeah, that fellow Crocker's over at the Long Branch. He's got a bunch of the boys all liquored up. They're talking about crashing the jail. Well, usually the best way to stop that kind of trouble is to break it up before it starts. Well, that group just upstairs right over the head, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I know. They hadn't bothered her, had they, Chester? Well, they hadn't when I left. All right, you let me handle it. You stay clear and cover my back. Yes, sir, I will. All right, come on. A deal like that ought to be run out of town. And you're just the boys to do it. Now, it's about time somebody took the star off of that tin horn marshal and shoved it down his throat. And as far as I'm concerned, I... I... Go on, Mr. Crocker. You're doing real fine. <laughs> There's quite a crew you picked up. All the bums, bar flyers, swindlers, and bushwhackers on Dodge City. Well, your friends don't seem to be as talkative as they were a couple of minutes ago, Mr. Crocker. Uh, Dylan, if I had you in St. Louis for one hour, you'd be in jail, not running. All right, boys, the party's over. Now move on. Oh, no. Now, you've got no right to order those men around, Dylan. I don't hear any of them objecting. Matt, Matt. She's gone. What? Janet's not in the room. She's gone. Well, where would she go? I can tell you, Matt. You had a jailbreak. That girl got her dad and brother out, and they just left town on their horses. Have you ever heard of K-Site Smooth Seal? Why, no. Why, no. Is it new? What's it do? Well, this is off the record. Just between us boys, your automatic transmission, does it ever make a noise? You mean a little kind of grinding? Does that little chatter matter? I hear a very weird whir sometimes. It doesn't sound good, boys, but let's be sure. When you're sitting at the light and it goes to green, you put your foot down hard. Have you ever felt a sort of a jerk, a kind of a jar, or haven't helped you a real thud bump? Oh, I've felt uh, it. Oh, me too. I've had it, stranger. What do we do? Well, don't buy a horse and don't trade your car. Just get yourself some new K-Site Smooth Seal. New K-Site Smooth Smooth Seal? New K-Site Smooth Seal? New K-Site Smooth Seal? How will that help? Why, it's made to soften those shrunken seals, which are apt to leak when there's power on the wheels. It stops those thud bumps, jerks, and jars that are apt to creep into these modern cars. Well, this K-Site Smooth Seal in one application can pack them all off on a long vacation, and it's less than $2 at your service station. A little new K-Site Smooth Seal, boy? Come on. Well, I'll go. And if it doesn't work, you get double your money back. <laughs> We're getting pretty close to the place for the camp that night. It's right ahead of us there, Chester. Sure do hope that cussed storm holds off. First, you know, they may not have came back here at all. Well, then we'll backtrack to Cottonwood Tanks. They'll want that gold. It's got to be somewhere between here and the railroad. Yonder's where the wagon was standing. Yeah. 
All right, pull up, Chester. Let's take a look around. Mr. Jones, look there. Huh? A hole dug in the ground. Right where they had the campfire that night. Yeah. Well, they buried the gold there, Chester, and built their fire right on top of it. Get out! Ticket over there. I'm gonna fire and roll away, maybe draw a shot. Now you keep your eyes open. Yes, sir, I will. He came from the left of that big tree off there. Yeah, I saw it. You got him. Yeah. Come on, Chester. Everly. Now you're covered, Everly. One move and you're finished. Uh, I'm finished anyway. I'm sorry I had to do it. No matter. Weren't the youngins to have a chance? They rode on with the money, I suppose. Let them go, Marshal. It's their money. I had a right. Maybe, but you had no right to kill. I didn't. Aim to, Marshal. The law has to go by acts, Everly, not intentions. Storm coming up. Yeah, it looks that way. Hope that youngins find shelter. Jerry caught cold there in jail. Used to worry his mother when he coughed. So she's dead now. Died back there. Back. Back. Mm -hmm. I guess he paid for it, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he paid. Well, let's try to pick up the trail of the other two before that storm. What is it? Horses. A couple of horses coming in fast. All right, hold it! It's all right, Marshal Wade, Arm. Paul, where is he? We heard the shooting and turned around and rode back. You better get off your horses, both of you. What happened to... Oh. I'm sorry, Janet. I knew. I knew when he made us right on ahead that... that we'd never see him again. Alive. You kids carry in the money? It's there in my saddlebags. Get it, will you, Chester? Yes, Mr. He thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was doing it for us. I know. But he was wrong. And now there's the two of you to decide about. Here's some money, Mr. Jones. Chester, count out $1,000. Yes, sir. You know, technically, I guess I ought to take you back to Dodge. But I figure everybody's got certain rights. And it's my job to try to keep all those rights sorted out and evened up. All I can do is call them the way I see them. Chester, yes, give them the $1,000. There you are. But I, I... I don't understand. Crocker offered a thousand dollars and no questions asked for the return of his money. Well, you returned it. And there's the reward. Yes, but I... Now, if you ride north and keep barren west, you'll eventually hit Wyoming. I hear it's fine country. Plenty of rangeland, homesteads. The two of you ought to do all right. And Jerry... Yes, sir? You take care of her. Yes, sir, I will, Mr. Dillon. I understand what you're doing, Boris. And I... Now, go on, you two. Get out of here before I think it over and change my mind. Now, go on. Right. Thank you, Marshal. Thanks. Go on. Goodbye, Mr. Dillon. And thank... Go on. Get out of here. You better get a move on, Mr. Dillon. It's starting to rain. I hope they find shelter somewhere. Mr. Dillon, it's starting to rain, Mr. Dillon. You better get a move on. Mr. Millen?
Service manager. Tell you about guardian maintenance? Well, sure, I'll be glad to. Guardian maintenance is a kind of specialized service your General Motors car gets at a GM dealers like ours. Yeah. Now, it makes good sense, doesn't it, that our mechanics know your GM car best? You see, they specialize in one make a car. And what's more, they've got the right tools and factory-approved parts, too. Yes, sir. That holds true for every Chevy, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, Cadillac, and GMC truck. It's the best kind of service for the best kind of cars. And all GM dealers are offering performance service specials right now. Uh-huh. Includes engine tune-up, tire rotation, a front-end adjustment, a wheel check, and a complete, and I mean complete, lubrication. Makes for a worry-free vacation, I'll tell you. Huh? Yeah, good. Good. We'll be looking for you. Bye. Produced and directed by Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with editorial supervision by John Meston. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, Barbara Eiler, Sam Edwards, and Bart Robinson. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. This is George Walsh inviting you to join us again next week for another story on Gunsmoke. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is the CBS Radio... In bed, Doc. I'm just resting. Oh, I did that, Oh, I see the cost of government's going up again. Oh? What makes you say that? The soles of your boots. They're worn almost through. I don't care. <laughs> What's the matter? Aren't you feeling good? Sure, I feel fine, Doc. I always lie in bed till noon. Uh-huh. Well, it just doesn't look right for you to be lying down like that. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. What's the matter now? It's cold. The cough is cold in the rattlesnake's belly. Don't drink it, sir. And it's no better hot it. No, man, like I was saying, a man in your position should have more to do than just lie around. Oh, well, maybe I'm just tired, Doc. Oh, now, don't try to tell me it was brought on by upholding law and order all night. Because I don't want to hear about it. I had a bad night myself. Well, then sit down and rest. Yeah, I think I'll... Aren't you going to ask me what I was doing? No. Amen. Well, I spent the whole night working for four-dollar fees. Oh? Well, it must have been somebody who didn't know you. Then. They knew me. Yes, it was Jeb Dorn. His wife had a baby girl. Jeb, huh? He was hoping for a boy, as I recall it. And that's what worried me. Oh, why? He refused to pay me. <laughs> no wonder you're tired. Hey, baby. What's this thing on? Well, who's this poster on? It says right there, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it does. Wanted, dead or alive, Jack Pargo for the torture and subsequent murder of... Uh, so, 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 so. This man is noted for armed holdup and is believed heading in the general direction of Missouri, Kansas, or Nebraska. Oh, he's a mean-looking devil, isn't he? Uh-huh. Well, I can see that he'll certainly find his comeuppance if he sticks his head in Dodge City. Well, I'll tell you, Doc, I'll worry about that if he comes here, huh? Oh, well, that gives me a nice, safe feeling. <laughs> Marshal, here is me. Yeah, yeah, I'm the Marshal. I say, Marshal Proudfoot, here about you, see? Marshal Proudfoot? Huh? Yeah, no, neither one of you. I'll say neither one of you ain't the Marshal, I can tell. <laughs> I was Paul. I'd know him anywhere. Uh, Doc, yeah. go find Chester, will you? Uh, sure, Matt. Uh, no, no, no need to get up. Just come see my boy, Marshal Chester Proudfoot. Made good somehow, he did. <laughs> Chester never was one of my brightest boys. 
Eleven boys, I had, I remember. Say, I ain't shook a hand here yet. Oh, what's your name, Sonny? Dillon, uh, Matt Dillon. Did you know? Ah, that's a funny name for a man. I knew a man one time had the name of Hairgrove. Hairgrove. I thought that was the funniest up till now, but you know that's Doc. Uh, you better go get Chester. Uh, yeah. Who's that fella? Well, that's Doc Adams. Uh, nice to know you, sir. Saying something, is he? I said it's nice now, to know you. Now, my name is Wesley Proudfoot. Sire de Marshall, turns out. Yes, sir. Eleven boys I had. Chester was nowhere near the brightest. No, sir, he'd rate about number nine there. Oh, that's very uh, interesting, uh, Mr. Chester, Crawford. Chester bordered on being ignorant, I'd think. Oh, no, no. I can't imagine how you ever got to be a marshal. Chester Wesley Proudfoot. Marshal of Dodge City. Look, uh, <laughs> Mr. Proudfoot. <laughs> they I... named all them boys with the middle name of Wesley. After me, it did. Hoped at least one of them would mount something like me. Yes. What'd say name was? It's Adams. Dr. Adams. Doctor and horse or people? Yeah. What? What's the matter with you? I say, do you doctor horses or people? Yeah. People. Oh, well, it's too bad for you. I wouldn't ever let a people doctor work on me, and I got a great many things wrong with me, too. Hey, uh, where's Chester? Well, he's out getting the mail for me. Well, good for him. Got spunk. Probably running down some of them bad men he always writes about. You used to have an assistant named uh, Dillon working for him. What have become of him? Dillon, that, uh, that, that's me, Mr. Proudfoot. Matt Dillon. That's oh, me. yeah. Well, you do a fair job, Gordon Chester. Says he can usually depend on you. Well, that's very nice of him. Uh, look, Mr. Proudfoot, maybe you should know something. I... Ah, hello, Doc. Uh, 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 there wasn't none too much mail, Mr. Dillon. Forget it, Chester. Why? Chester, you've got company. Who's a fat fella? That's Chester. That's the Marshal Proudfoot. <sighs> Paul. You know, Mr. Dillon, I... Oh, Paul, that's you, Chester? Yeah, that's him, Mr. Proudfoot. Ah, you fatted up a good deal, Chester. Your assistant here looks better than you do. I'd like an explanation. Matter of fact, so would I, Chester. Hmm. Mr. Dillon, uh, Doc, I... Oh, Paul. his father that he's the marshal. Oh, what can I do? Well, not going to let him get by with it, are you? Oh, I don't know, Doc. Uh, wait a minute, Matt. Wait, no, no, no. Let me by. No. An assistant doesn't make too much, you know. <laughs> Easy, Doc. Hello, Doc. Matt. Oh, goody. Uh, Doc, you're looking pretty strange today. How come? Uh, Tell her, Matt. You tell her, Doc. You're the one looking strange. Well, come on. Somebody tell me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Have you seen Chester today? No. Why? Yeah, we may never see him again. What? What happened? Oh, not much, really, but I'm sure he wishes he was dead right now. Oh, what's this all about? Chester's father came to town today. Well, what's so terrible about that? That's what he thinks Chester is the marshal here. What? Yeah, that's right, Kitty. Chester wrote to his father, and he probably stretched the truth a little bit, like we all do sometimes. Oh, no. Well, where are they now? Over at the Dodge house. He's getting the old man a room there. I never saw Chester look so scared in my life, Kitty. <laughs> you should have seen him. He grabbed his paw, and he lit out of the office like his coat was on fire. Oh, don't be hard on him now. I'm not going to be hard on him. Well, his father must be pretty old. Oh, he's old, all right, yeah. He can't hear good, and he can hardly see. But he's a bright old fellow. Well, you can't let the old man be disappointed, Matt. Well, what would you suggest I do, Kitty? I don't know. Just don't hurt him, that's all. I'm not going to hurt him, Kitty. I don't care if the old man thinks Chester's a marshal. 
Uh, Matt, we should think of something to make Chester look good while his father's in town. Yeah. I heard the old man tell Chester that he was only going to stay for a few days. Oh, say, Matt. Now, maybe you could lie low for a while. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that. I need a rest. Hey, I got it. Why don't you get somebody to pretend to hold up and then let Chester play marshal and take him in? You can turn him loose when his father leaves. Oh, now, Kitty, I couldn't do a thing like that. Well, something's got to be done, Matt. Yes, yeah, did you? Uh, I could put you to bed, Matt. What are you talking about, Doc? Yeah, you get sick and I'll examine you and say that you've got a, oh, a, a rare blood disease and you have to go to bed for a few days. It might work, Matt. I oh, can't let that old man go away thinking Chester's been lying to him all this time. No. We'll get Moss Grimmick to stage a fake holdup, you see? Then we'll come and get Chester, and right in front of his father, he'll capture the bandit. You're the one with a rare disease, Doc, and it's not in your blood, it's in your brain. I'll oh, do it, Matt. You got to. No, I don't got to. I don't want any part of a fake holdup. Now, you just get that out of your head. Oh, Matt. <laughs> Well, I'm going back to the office. Oh, sure, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Ruin an old man in his last days. Uh, what do you think, Doc? Ed, I... Old Matt will come around all right, Kitty. He always does. I'll go talk to Moss Grimmick and, and have it all set. <laughs> Anybody here? I say, anybody in here with you? Oh, there you are, Dylan. Oh, took you to bed kind of early, didn't you? It ain't but four o'clock. Hello, Mr. Broadfoot. Where's Chester? Yes. Well, I guess you got such a dead little town on your hand, you can do that, you and Chester. I say, where is Chester? Saying something? I said, where's Chester? Don't yell like that. Hurts my ear pan when you bell around like that. Got a pretty big voice on you there, Dylan. What's the matter with you? Ah, uh, feeling poorly, are you? I say feeling poorly, are you? I feel terrible. Ah, uh, too bad. Chester ain't feeling too good, neither. Oh. Oh, been lolling around on my bed over at the ruin house all day. Good thing you boys got this dead town on your hands. Yeah. Yeah, uh, people be up the creek with both the marshal and his sister in bed. Ooch over there. I say, Ooch over there. Let me take a look at you. Let me look at your eyes. Tell everything about how a man feels by looking to his... Look at me, Dylan. I can't help looking at you. That's Mr. it. Robert. That's coming. Yes, sir. You've got bad eyes there, Dylan. That one in particular. You've got a good voice, but bad eyes. And my eyes remind me of Chester's Uncle Hector. Last time he looked all slack-jawed like that, he died the next day. Huh? What say? Uh, not nothing. I didn't say anything. Oh, thought you talked. Oh. Yes, sir. Hector was Chester's fighting uncle. Reckon that's where Chester gets all his get up and go. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, was well, some different, though. Hector fought again the law, Hector did. Ever seen a man stirred up again the law all the time like old Hector was? Have you had your Eight dinner the yet, Mr. Proctor? Yeah, oh, indeed, he was a winner. You're right there. Won all his battles. Killed two marshals, Hector did. Killed them dead. Good thing Chester's on the side of the law. Man, that's a pair like that ought to be on the side of the law. Hey, I'm Matt, you yes, here? Oh, oh. Hello, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> Do what? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you're here. Yes. Look here, you got a sick deputy here, Adams. Better go get a horse doctor and get him straightened out. Oh, huh. What are you doing in bed, Matt? I'm in bed because I'm sick, Doc. Did you ever hear of anything like that? You're sick? Uh-huh. You are, Matt? Oh, oh, see, that's fine. Yeah, well, I figured you'd think so. Doc, would you do me a favor and take Mr. Proudfoot out to dinner? Anything, just get him out of here. Yeah, sure, Matt. You bet. Oh, see, your eyes look kind of beady there. Yeah, well, we've been through yeah, all yeah. that. Well, if I didn't know that, uh, I'd say that you had a fever. Adam, I say you got a sick boy there, Adam. Doc, would you go right now? Yeah, okay. Oh, sure. Uh, Mr. Prophet, you well, come with me. Come with me, Mr. Prophet. I'll take you to dinner. Yeah, dinner? No, no, too early for dinner. Take a little glass of duck water with you, though, but don't let on Chester, will you? Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. I'll see you later, Matt, and, uh... 
I'll, uh, I'll let Kitty know you're with us. Oh, fine, Doc. Good. good. Yeah. You, you let Kitty know I'm with you. Yes. you just go. Yes, sir, Adam. That boy there is sitting in the pig. Let Kitty know I'm with you. Doc! Doc, you come back here! Wasted a half hour looking at all the Eden houses for him. He's got Chester's father with him. I gotta stop him. Stop him from what? From that fool idea that you and he had. What do you mean, fool idea? Doc came by and said it was on that you were playing sick and bed. Kitty, I was in bed because I really was sick and I still am sick. Uh-huh. Have you and Doc lost your senses? Well, we're just trying to help Chester, that's all. Now, look, what if somebody else sees that hold up Moss Grimmaker's station? How do they know that he's just playing games? Huh? Doc and I aren't gonna let anybody get hurt, Matt. And you know, Chester, he'll play along all the way. That's exactly what I'm afraid of. Hello, Kitty. <laughs> all set, Kitty. Uh, oh, hello, Matt. Oh, you're on your feet for the fun. You call this thing off right now, Doc. Oh, no, no, no. It's too late. That Chester and his father up at the Dodge House in exactly three minutes from now, Moss Grimmick is going to rush up there and say there's a hold up at the livery station. And I'm putting a stop to her before somebody gets there. What? What's that? Oh, I don't know. It's not time yet. Oh, come on, Doc. You can watch the fun you started. Yes, come on. Come on. Come out and knock your head off. Buddy. Now, Matt, now take it easy, Matt. What you doing? What? You better hurry. Chester just shot a man at the dog house. Good Lord. Come on, let me through here, will you please? Move aside. Let me through. Stand there. Matt, Matt, wait a minute. Chester's sitting on somebody. Chester, what are you doing? Get off of that man. Doc, check that one line over there. Will you? I will. Off my boy on the marshal there. Stand back. He shot and wounded one fellow, and we subdued the other one. All right, Mr. Jim Cole, we did. Ain't, ain't a bad night for it. Oh, no, Chester, will you get up? Well, Mr. Jones, he, he tried to kill me and Paul. Get up, I said. He's unconscious. Oh, Matt, wait a minute. Look here. What is it, Doc? Look at this man. It's Jack Pargo. What? You're the man on that wanted poster? Yeah, that is Pargo, all right. What's the matter, Dylan? That fellow friend of yours, is he? He tried to hold up the hotel office here. No, Mr. Proudfoot is not a friend of mine. Huh? What say? Or anybody catch that car? Man, or Chester? What? Chester! Uh, uh, hurry up, Chester! There's a hold up at the livery table. Moss, oh, well, go uh, home. Yeah, but my doc told me that. Just I'm... go back to your livery stable and call off the hold up, huh? Yes, yeah, yeah, forget it, Moss. Forget it. We've had the real thing, right? Well, 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 well goodbye, Moss. Yes, well, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Goodbye, goodbye. I'm. Yeah. Goodbye. Yes, goodbye. Wait, wait. I'll pull it from here. Notice something here, did you, Dylan? Chester was right on the spot. He was. That's the reason he took my bed for so long. Uh-huh. He got an instinct for these things, Chester has. Put him right here on the spot for this holdup. Now, there's a reason for everything, I always say. Yeah, Dylan. well, there's a reason, all right. Yeah, there. What say, Dylan? Mr. Dylan, I can explain all this. I... No, Chester, you and your father take care of things here. I'm sick and I'm going to bed. Don't count on me taking care of things, Dylan. I'm leaving on the morning stage. Now I saw my boy in action. Yeah, well, all right, Mr. Proudfoot. Goodbye and good luck to you. Uh, you, you wait right here a minute, Paul. Uh, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what? Mr. Dillon, I... Mr. Dillon, I can explain. You don't have to, Chester. But, yes, I do have to explain. I, I swear I've never been so humiliated in all my whole life. I've been thinking about it all day, Mr. Dillon. I, I, I never wrote but two letters to Paul, and, well, maybe I did stretch a couple things, but Paul, he, well, Paul, he, he put it all together and made me out more important than what I am. But I'll set him straight, Mr. Dillon, honest, I will. I'll tell him the truth, and I'll do it right now. Yes, sir. You do, and you're fired. Now, you go on back and help your father take care of things. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon.
Little Proudfoot, written by sound man Tom Hanley. Proudfoot, written by sound man Tom Hanley. Proudfoot, written by sound man Tom. Another frequent contributor to Gunsmoke was Marion Clark. Again, Norman McDonald. Marion Clark wrote some 65 to 70 Gunsmokes, and interestingly enough, uh, one of two women that was terribly successful in the in the Western field. I met Marion Clark uh, through Kathleen Height, who had uh, taken Marion under her wing in a way. Marion uh, was confined to a wheelchair and not able to get around, but uh, Kathleen had told me a great deal about her uh, during the time that Kathy and I uh, worked on other shows together, like Romance and Rogers of the Gazette and so on. She felt that it would be good therapy if Marion could do a script. And uh, I thought this would be fine. And Marion not only did one script, she did some 69 or 70 more because she was uh, had a marvelous insight into the, uh, into the woman's side of the Western uh, idiom. There were several things that, that were almost a trademark with Marion, and strangely enough, one of them was the sort of sad, wistful tragedy of people moving west and bringing their most treasured belongings with them. And uh, one script in particular of Marion's, I think, exemplifies this. It was in July or August of 1958. It was called The Piano, and it's a great example of Marion's work. <laughs> some more pie, Kitty? You might as well, since Doc's paying for it. <laughs> no, thanks, Matt. I've had plenty. Yeah, what happened to make you such a big spender, Doc? Some forgotten relative leave you something in his will? <laughs> might as well, eh? Well, what do you mean, Doc? Well, you remember that cowboy got himself shot up in a long branch brawl? Oh, that was a year or two ago? There's been more than one of them. I know that, but Kitty might remember this. She hmm? helped stop the bleeding until I got there. Oh, I remember, Doc. He didn't even have enough money to buy a beer. And we figured he never would have. So what happened to him? Well, sir, I had a letter from him this morning. He's had some kind of a payoff in California. And he sent me a $20 gold piece to pay me for what he called my medical services. Wow. Oh, that's fine, Doc. I'm glad he made out. Yes, men like him don't often do it. And you don't often get paid, either. <laughs> well, you never know in my business. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Oh, huh? Chester, Matt, at the door. Oh. And you too, Doc. Hurry up. Uh, he means it, Doc. Excuse us. Oh, he's going back outside. Uh, somebody must be hurt. Yeah, I didn't hear any shooting. Now, there are other ways to get hurt, Doc. Over here for the stage, Mr. Dillon. Oh. Yeah, that, that man has been hurt, Matt. That's a shotgun messenger, sir. Somebody must have held up the stage. Mike got shot, Mr. Dillon. He's hurt pretty bad. Oh, let me take a look. What happened, Chester? Well, I don't know for sure. I seen the stage come in just now, and Mike was driving. Mike was driving? Yes, sir. So I knew something was wrong. Then I could see he is hurt, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah my, my... Yeah, Doc. <laughs> He's trying to say something. Make it fast, man. I, I got to get him up to my office. Mike, it's Marshal Dillon. What happened? Held up. Driver. Killed. Uh, was there any passengers? No. No. Currency. Shipment. 20,000. Where did it happen, Mike? Uh, he's going out, man. Mike. Mike. <laughs> Try Please try. Tell me oh, where did it happen? How many men? Huh? North Hat Creek. Two men. Two. That's all, Matt. He, he's unconscious. Yeah. I'll find a couple of men to help you, Doc. Chester, go get our horses. Yes, sir. And hurry. <laughs> Mr. Jones, 
That cracked shoe shows up real plain. Yeah, they've been riding hard, too. But they must have slowed down or stopped for a while somewhere. I hope they didn't get no more sleep last night than we did. What's the matter, Chester? You getting old? I know, sir, it ain't that, but my gracious, two hours sleep. It just don't seem worth bothering about, that's all. Well, I hope our friends bother a little about sleep. Now, if I was carrying $20,000 in bills, I wouldn't never stop. Yeah? You'd have to be riding a pretty unusual horse. Then. Well, yes, I guess you're right. But... Wait a minute. Hmm? Looks like they did stop after all. What? They built a fire over there. Yeah, it was them on it. Yeah, same tracks. I think we picked up a little time on them, Chester. Come on, let's pick up some more. Stuck to the saddle. They're near dark again. Uh, they'll have to stop someplace along here pretty soon, huh? Yeah, I don't know. Hold up, Chester. Those tracks are heading down to those bushes along the creek. Let's go easy. Yes, sir. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. Off yonder. Above the stream there, there's a shack. Oh, uh, yeah, I see it. You think you might maybe a hit out in it? Maybe. But I'm not going to ride straight up to find out. We'll leave the horses here. Yes, sir. Now we'll circle around back. Just keep low. There's two horses tied up there. Uh-huh. Mr. Dillon, how do you Yeah. All right, hold it, Joe. They're heading for the horses. You got him. Yeah, but the other one's getting away. Ah, oh, he's out of range. Yes, sir. You go bring the horses up. I'll see about the man I shot. Huh? Well, ain't you going after the other one? He's got a pretty good head start, and it's near dark. I'm not going after him blind. Morning soon enough. All now, go right. on. You get my brother. You get wrecked. Not yet. You heard bad. Yeah. Yeah, I sure am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tie up those horses and come here. We'll carry him into the shack. Be right there. Yeah. This fellow's horse. Well, what about him? Well, his legs broke. He must have stumbled and they're trying to get away. You reckon I better shoot him? All right, you can do it as soon as we get this man out of the shack. Okay. All right, open the door, Chester. I'll keep hold of it. My gate's locked. You suppose somebody lives in this forsaken place? Well, we'll find out. Go ahead and knock. Anybody in there? Open up! Anybody in there? There's no need for any more noise at my door. Just finished telling you men you can't stay in my house. You don't need that shotgun, ma'am. We don't mean any harm. I intend to defend my home, sir. No rough men are going to tramp around amongst my fine things. You open the door a little wider, ma'am, and you'll see we're not the same men. I don't open my home to any strangers. I'm Marshal Dillon from Dodge City, and we got a badly injured man here. A United States Marshal? That's right, ma'am. Well, then I guess I'll have to let you in. But I don't hold with your Yankee government. I want that clear. All right, ma'am. Fine. Come on, Chester. <laughs> Now, you just show us where you want us to put him. He hurt bad. Not bad enough. Well, I suppose even a rough man has a right to die in the bed. 
But mind you, be careful of my things. All right, ma'am. We'll mind. <laughs> Jerry Miller's horse, Mr. Jones. I'll bring the saddle. Ah, good. Hey, ain't things a little strange in there? A little? Oh, that talk about not hurting her fine things. Why, there ain't nothing there that's worth carting away except maybe that old pine. Yeah, I know. Everything else is all cracked and broke. Why, most ladies wouldn't give that stuff house room. You gentlemen would care to join me. I fixed a small supper. Well, that's very nice of you, ma'am. How would you say it's nice? Mr. Hanford. He's my husband. Mr. Hanford always said I could spot a gentleman right away. I could see you two were gentlemen as soon as we exchanged pleasantries there in the entryway. Well, thank you, ma'am. Mr. Proudfoot. Hey, ma'am? Please take your hat off my cherry wood piano. My land, man, it, it can't hurt nothing. I do not allow anything to mar the finish of my beautiful cherry wood pine. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Here's your plate. Please sit down. Thank you. I don't imagine your wounded friend will be able to partake. Uh, no, Miss Hanford, he's not likely to come to for some time. Uh. That is, if he ever does. I can't imagine how he got his wound. I had seen him just a few minutes before you gentlemen. Yeah, Miss Hanford, ma'am, didn't you hear the shooting right outside your door? I have trained myself not to see and hear the ugly things of life. I just live here alone among my friends. But, uh, you, you said that you have a husband. My husband has been gone for two, three Four years now, Marshal. No, I, I, I'm sorry to hear that, ma'am. Mr. Hans, would you never be content to live a quiet life? He thought he could when first we came here directly after the war. I had in mind he'd build me a new plantation. But, Marshal, just between you and me... Mr. Hanford didn't appreciate my lovely things. And one day, well, one day he just moved on west. Oh, well, that's too bad, ma'am. I do not need your pity, sir. I'm content. Well, well sure, of course. I'd I... be obliged if you gentlemen would sleep out there on the veranda. Veranda? Oh, well, well, that's all right, Chester. We'll sleep on the veranda. Uh... I am going to have to keep an eye on Miller, though, ma'am. I will watch over him, Marshal. Well, no, that's not your job, Miss Hanford. I'm mistress of this house, Marshal Dillon. I will watch over him. I will call you if there's any change. As a matter of fact, I'll look to him right now. Well, all right, ma'am. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, Chester. Mr. Dillon, that slanty old porch is right Well, it is to her. My, if she don't be all. Digging isn't supposed to be easy, Chester. It's too permanent. Tell me how many men dies at daybreak, isn't it? I mean, when everything else is starting up and all. Well, I guess when you have to die, it's as good a time as any. Where do you reckon his brother is by now? Rack? I don't know. But we're sure going to have a long ride to catch up with him. Mm. I sure ain't willing to hurry up a man about his dying, but I sure would have been glad to have been shut of this place for now. 
What's the matter, Chester? Don't you enjoy southern hospitality? Mr. Dillon, I have to walk around in that old shack on my tiptoes. She's after me every minute about not hurting her thing. Gracious goodness, I couldn't hurt them old things if I tried. Well, we can be leaving soon now, Chester. We've done about all we can do. Get out. in them bushes. Yeah, and my guns are in the house. Come on. Will you get out of the way, please? I want my gun over there. What do you that crazy fool's thinking of? I don't know, Chester, but he must have a good reason for sticking around. His brother? No, I don't think he'd take on these odds when he was pretty sure his brother was done for. I think he's got another reason. Where's the saddle that came off Miller's horse? Where? Over there in the corner? Oh. Be careful of your heavy footsteps. Here, let's see now. Yeah. That's it. No wonder he stuck around. All that money makes up into a right poor little package, don't it? Yeah. So, Dylan, I don't understand this sudden rudeness on your part. I'm sorry, ma'am, but I'm not too polite when I'm being shot at. And you stay away from those windows. I thank you not to give me orders in my own house. Chester, let's push the piano in front of that window over there, huh? Right. We're like sitting ducks this way. You will not touch my chair. All right, pie. come on, Chester. Oh, oh, don't harm it. Oh, don't harm it. All right. Now I'll watch the front. You take the side, huh? I don't think you'll wait long. How huh? long must I endure this? How long? As long as that outlaw's out there, Miss Hanford. He's not going to let us out of here alive. You're going to stay here tramping around among my nice things until he goes away. I'm afraid so, ma'am. Well, I'll just order him off my lap. Uh, Miss Hanford, come back here. See here, sir. Miss Hanford! You're I want you to ride up. Why, he shot her. Yeah. Ah, there he is, running for the creek. He's down. You got him. Yeah. You go make sure, will you, Tessa? Yes, sir. I'll see the Miss Hanford. Miss Hanford. Miss Hanford. Oh, sure, dear, then. You were right. I'm sorry, man. He was no gentleman, was he, Marshal? Trespassing on a lady's property. No, ma'am, he wasn't. He's dead, gentlemen. How's Miss Hanford? Not good. Not good at all. Miss Hanford, we're going to take you into your house. No, no, no. Not just yet, Marshal. Don't move me. Let me die here on the veranda. But you'd be more comfortable with me. I won't delay you long. Well, is there anything we can do? I mean, is there any way to make you feel better? You would just see. You would just see that somebody takes care of me. Love it. Chet She gone? Yeah. Well, we can carry her inside now. What you doing? Yeah. She really believed Rack Miller would listen to her and go away, didn't she? Yeah. That he was no gentleman. Well, it's just a shame, that's what it is. His pine sure must play pretty. The way she loved it. Took care of it, it's good. What are you doing? Oh, I just thought I'd hit me a note or two. She, she wouldn't care, would she? She wouldn't. Why? Why well, don't play at all? Huh? And look here, under the top, all the strings is rusted away, just hanging there. Mister Dillon, 
This pine ain't made a sound for years. Hmm. Well, I guess I didn't have to play, trust him. Just had to look pretty. It was all she had. Return to the story of Gunsmoke in just one moment. A return to the story of Gunsmoke in just one moment. A return to the story of Gunsmoke in just one moment. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It was the dust. The heat was bad enough in Dodge City, but out on the plain, it was the dust. The sun was a burning red-brown chip in the sky. And the sweat on a man never had a chance to drop. It was blotted and dried with dust. Doc Chester and I had ridden to Old Man Gore's place ten miles out. He'd had some trouble with one of the hands. The fellow had gone loco with liquor and had been shooting up the cattle. We found him, stripped naked nearby on his haunches, crying drunk over a parched water hole. Doc had got him to bed and fixed him up some. And now we were heading back for Dodge. Darn horse. Seems he's just bound to stomp all the dust and canvas in my eyes. <coughs> Maybe the marshal will buy you a camel, Chester. <sighs> this keeps up. We'll all buy camels. I remember the time back in Waco when I was just a small... Chester, boy. you see something ahead on the side of the trail there? Um, yeah, maybe. It looks like some poor calf strayed off and dropped. I don't think so. Yeah, it looks like a man. Come on! Chester, get the water bag. Yes, sir. Yeah. Let me have a look, Marshal. Yeah. Yeah, see. Heat. Is he all right? Well, depends on how long he's been lying here. Here you are, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Uh. Open up his shirt, Marshal. Chester, get some of that water on his wrist. All right. It looks like an Easterner, huh? Sure not dressed for this country. Oh, no, that's better. That's better. Try to get a few drops in him. All right, now. No, not too much, Chester. <coughs> not in his nose, Chester. His mouth. Well, my gracious, I'm sorry, Mr. Dillon, but he moved his head. It's not so easy to... Hey, look, he's awake. You're all right, mister. Just take it easy for a bit now. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Oh and resolve itself into a dew. What did he say? Oh, it's out of his head, Chester. For this relief, much thanks. Forget it, Chester. Get around the other side and shade him from the sun. Yes, you the sun. I begin to be aware of the sun. I don't blame you. 
Uh, what happened? The wagon shed a wheel, I fear, along the high road. I know not where I am. Uh, you're about four miles out of Dodge City. Uh, Kansas. Kansas. Oh, I would give all my fame for a pot of ale and safety. You better get him to town quick. He's in a bad way. He's delirious. Uh, you think you can make it on a horse? We'll take you into... We'll take him into Dodge. And he passed out again. We tied him across Doc's horse. Doc and I doubled up and Chester rode behind the stranger was a tall, skinny man with a face like a friendly mule. Big hands and thin wrists stretched out from his sleeves. He had no papers on him, nothing. And until he woke up, we wouldn't even know his name. Doc settled him down in the back of his place and he was still asleep when Chester and I rode out to where we figured he'd left his wagon. Wasn't hard to see when we found it. What color wagon would you call that, Mr. Dillon? Puce, Chester. Puce. I guess so. Seems to be some writing on the side there. Yeah. Oh, Irving Henry, thespian supreme disciple of the immortal bard. Mm. I should have known he was a religious man. Uh, he's an actor, Chester, the immortal bard. Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, wrote plays. Ah, uh, uh, hi. Oh. Ah, <coughs> you think he let the horses go, Mr. Dillon? Well, I was wondering that. Seems to me he'd have ridden for help instead of trying to walk. Horses couldn't have got out of the harness ourselves. Well, let's take a look at the wheel. Huh? I wish we could wait till the sun goes down. It's going to be awful hot work, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. It's not too bad. The pin fell out. Must be another in the box at the back. Take a look, will you, Chester? Yes, sir. I'll prop the wheel up here. Yeah. Mr. Dillon? Uh, yeah, can't you find it? Will you come here a minute? Uh, what's the matter? Take a look in there. It took a second or two to get used to the darkness inside the wagon. And then I saw the hand sticking out from behind the trunk. You didn't have to be the doc to know that it was a dead hand. The body was of a man about 40. He was dirty. And in a greasy, torn waistcoat, I found a pocketbook with his name. Sam Matchett. And that was all. Below his left shoulder and his back was a patch of dried blood. And in the middle, a bullet hole. We got the wagon wheel on, hitched up our horses, and drove into Dodge. Doc? Oh, that's you, Marshal. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll be right out. All right. Get that fella's wagon fixed up? Yeah, I brought it in. Is he awake? Oh, I haven't looked in the last half hour. I was making coffee. You want some? Uh, no, thanks. Oh, it's a funny thing about coffee when it's hot weather like this. Drink it scalded and it makes you feel cooler outside. Uh, look, Doc, I got to see that fellow. I want to ask him a couple of questions. Oh, that's so? I found a dead man in the back of his wagon. You don't say? You better take a look. Chester's bringing him in the side. Oh, sure, sure, sure. You want to go on back? Uh, yeah, thanks, Doc. Mr. Henry? Mr. Henry, wake up. Yes, yeah. what? Oh. Your name, Irving Henry? Oh, Irving Henry. Uh, what is this place? Now, you got to listen to me for a minute. We found your wagon. Ah? Uh -huh. Did you let the horses go before you sat on your own? Of course. I could not let them remain to die. Well, how come you didn't take one to ride? I have a loathing of horses. I cannot bear one under my body. 
There is a carafe of water beside the bed. Would you be good enough, uh, Mr. Uh, uh... Uh, Dillon, Matt Dillon. I'm the marshal here in Dodge City. Here you are. Oh, my thanks. Now, what were you doing with a dead man in your wagon, Mr. Henry? A dead man? A dead man shot in the back, lying in your wagon. This is very midsummer madness. I won't argue about that, but I'll thank you to answer my question. But it is impossible. It isn't true. I say it is. You lie in your throat if you say that I'm any other than an honest man. Look, mister, I didn't say you weren't honest. You're an actor. And you got a fine way of saying things, but murder's murder. I don't care how you say it. Now, I'm asking questions, and I want straight answers. Your pardon, sir, but what you tell me... In truth, if, if it were played upon a stage, I would condemn it as an improbable fiction. I swear to you, I know nothing of a body. Did you come through Hayes City? Yes. Yeah. Do you know a man there called Sam Matchett? No. You had no trouble in Hayes City? No. What are you doing in these parts, Mr. Henry? Uh, I'm... I am touring the provinces... An actor eating the bitter bread of banishment. And my talents are not taken for their worth in the East. And therefore, I bring the immortal bard to the hinterlands. And now, sir, that the interview is ended, pray give me leave to depart. I'm sorry, I can't do that. You'll have to stay until we get this thing cleared up. Mr. Out. Dillon, Doc would like to see you. Uh, all right, Chester. Stay here with Mr. Henry, will you? Well, sure, Mr. Dillon, sure. If, how are you feeling by now, Mr. Henry? Would you like some more water? Those evil manners live in brass. Doc. Right here, Marshal. Yeah. Fill me cups for the father's boy. What was that? What'd you find? Well, there's one thing. This man didn't die right away. I mean, not right when he was shot. Is that so? No. More likely bled to death. Inside. Uh-huh. Uh, you think he might have been able to climb up in the wagon after he was shot? Well, he might. There's another thing. Yeah. You see the way he's dressed? Now, you take a look at the... Oh, 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 what's what's going going Help! Help! Go, go. Come on, come on, Doc. Come on. Hey, hey, hey. Chester. What, what's took, the matter with him? Chester. My gun when I was pouring him some water, Mr. Wait. Dillon. He must have gone through the window, Marshal. I, I tried to get it back here. Went off. Take care of Chester, Doc. I'm going after him. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, do you know how old the school building in your community is? If it's over 25 years old, the chances are that it's woefully inadequate to the present demands on it. Certainly thousands of schools all over America are unable to meet the needs of a greatly increased enrollment. And all our school children will suffer unless all of us work actively to improve conditions. Join with the groups in your community working for better school conditions. Remember, better schools... Build a stronger America. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. I went out of there. I didn't know how badly Chester was hurt. There was a lot of blood on his head and over his face. It was nearly dark outside, and the street was empty. It was supper time. I could see the women through the windows getting food ready. The kids were inside, too. Sure looked peaceful. But with Henry out with a gun, well, that wasn't a good thing to have running around loose in Dodge. Evening, Mr. Dillon. 
Did you see a man run down this street, Miss Fletcher? Well, no. Well, you better get inside and lock your door. Don't come out again. There's a killer loose. I walked the length of the street, listening, waiting. And when I got to the end, there was nothing. He hadn't taken a horse, I'd have heard that. And in a way, I was sorry, because if he'd tried to hide and dodge, there'd be no way to get out of shooting that wouldn't get women and kids hurt. A breeze came up and swirls of dust flew around, and then settled as the air became still and hot again. I went back to Doc's place. Oh, uh, did you find him, Marshal? No. How's Chester? Oh, I'm fine, Mr. Dillon. Just creased my head, more mess than hurt. Oh, good, Chester. Uh, look, you want to go home or you want to work? I want to work. All right, go down to the office, get yourself another gun, and round up some men, as many as you can. As long as Henry stays in town, we're in trouble. Now, keep your eyes open. Meet me back here. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Take my gun with you, and if you see him, watch out. All right, now get going. Yes, sir. Doc, I'm going to have to make you a deputy, too. Well, <laughs> well, maybe instead of digging out bullets, I'll be putting some in. It's not funny, Doc. Now, come on. All right, we'll start here. I'll take this side, you take the other. Get the men to go through their houses and tell them to look for their horses. Tell them what's happening. But ten o'clock that night, as far as we could tell, Henry hadn't left town. There were plenty of places for him to hide, though. We had 50 men out searching. Chester and I were working along back of the express office. There were a couple of houses there we hadn't covered. You wouldn't think a man like that would be a killer, now would you, Mr. Dillon? I never saw a man yet couldn't be, Chester. Depends on your reasons for killing, I guess. Now, let's take a look behind these boxes, huh? think he could have got this far? Yeah, he might. A lot of back streets to sneak around in the dark. That's Miss Cullen's place there, isn't it? Yes, sir. Looks like she's still awake. Light burning back there. Yeah. <clears throat> Seem a bit cooler to you tonight, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, a bit. Oh, uh, evening, Miss Cullen. I'm sorry to get you up, but we're looking for a man, a stranger around. He's tall, thin. You seen anyone about tonight? No. No, I haven't. Uh huh? Uh, how, how's the kids? Oh, they're fine. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. Fine. Uh huh. Well, you keep the place locked tight, Miss Cullen. Don't let anybody in tonight unless you know who it is. All right. Good night, Mr. Dillon. Good night, ma'am. Well, now, that's strange. She didn't even say hello to me, and I know her better than you do, Mr. Dillon. Chester, round up the others. Get them over here. I don't know why she... He's in us. there with her. I think he's got the kids in the sleeping room. Oh. Sent her out to get rid of us. Now, I'm going to try and get in. Don't do anything when you come back. Just put the men around the house. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'd seen Miss Cullen make a move with her head, and her eyes said the rest. When I told her to lock up, I shook my head, and I hoped she understood. I wanted that front door to stay open. as soon as I can. He was in there all right. I could hear him. 
I wanted him alive, but I wasn't going to risk hurt to Miss Cullen or the kids getting him. I did what you asked. Don't hurt the children, please. They will never know this night. And in the morning, when they awake. What's that? You said you locked the door after you. No, don't. Don't. I shall keep the pistol turned to the girl's head, madam. Someone is here. They try to take me. Who is it? Who? Mr. Dillon, go away. Please. He'll kill us. You lied. You lied. Oh, tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide. Listen to me, Marshal Dillon. Throw your pistol in here. And then come in with your hands before you. I have no stomach for child killing. But I will not hesitate to do so. Now give me the gun, Henry. No. You won't be able to get out of this. I must. That is living to be done. You know, that fancy talk isn't going to help either. Now, why don't you climb down? What happened to Matchett? Nothing happened to Matchett. Why'd you kill him? I didn't. In five minutes or less, there'll be 50 men or more around here. Now, what are you going to do? I don't know. If you didn't kill Matchett, you'll get a chance. I'll see to that. There's no use going on this way. Give me the gun. I cannot. It is my prop of salvation. No gun is salvation to anybody. Put it down. You must tell the men to go away, Marshal Dillon. I'll have to take one of these children with me for my protection. No! <laughs> Shed a tear for me, madam. I have the greater need. You do a lot of talking, mister. I'd like to see you turn the gun away from that kid's head. That'd take more than talk, wouldn't it, though? I have no skill with such a weapon. Why should I match with you? I want to live. You're going about it the wrong way. The smallest worm will turn being trod upon. Meaning? You gave me no choice when you brought me here. It would have been better to have left me lying in the dust. You don't understand. You don't know. Well, why don't you tell me? What good would it do? It depends. My life has been the theater. As a boy, I... I was a student of Shakespeare. <laughs> he would look at me. <laughs> Who would accept this face for Hamlet? This ill-shaped body for Romeo. <laughs> His speech has become my speech, but and the fools only look. They cannot listen for laughing. There have been ugly men before you. It hasn't been cause for murder. Why'd you kill Matchett? In New York, there was a man. A gross, stupid man who fancied himself an interpreter of the bard. He, he took me, me, as his apprentice. And together we set out for the tour. I, I would play only the voices. Never Richard, never Henry, never Leah, only, only the voices. Whilst he, stumbling, drunken, he muddled and tore to a tatter the, the words that I should have spoken. 
You killed a man because you wanted to play a hero? How easily murder is discovered. Yes, yeah, sometimes, I guess. It was yesterday. We were leaving Hayes City. We played there for two days. And it made me a laughing stock. It was night. And he became drunk and, and threatened to leave me in the next town. I made him stop the wagon and taking up a pistol, I shot him. He did not die at first. And when I saw what I had done, I, I wanted him to live. And I put him into the wagon and, and I drove on, hoping to find a doctor. Then, as, as the night passed, I saw that he had died. And I was afraid. The wagon broke down? Yes. I, I put my purse into his clothes and took his name for mine. How I've hated the name of Sam Matchett. But you wouldn't understand. I wouldn't. Well, what now? I want to live. I want my chance. You've done a murder. I can't let you go. You know that. Don't make it harder. I lost my husband two years ago. I know what it is to be alone. You've been alone, haven't you? I'm sorry. But you killed someone. We may pity, though not pardon, dear. <laughs> I'm going now, Marshal. If you walk out of there with your gun, you're a dead man. Uh, death's a great disguiser. I must have my chance. Don't do it, Matchett. There'll be killing. Madam, forgive me. I would not have harmed your children. Match it, put down your gun. Let me go my way. Please. There are a lot of men waiting for you out there, Matchett. You know what'll happen if you open the door. Don't do it, Matchett. He knew he was going to die. The minute he opened that door, he knew it. And maybe he wanted to, because he fired first a single shot. We buried him in back of the church, and I found some words in a book to put on his grave. He that dies pays all debts. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Anthony Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Hans Conrad was featured as Henry, with Mary Lansing as Mrs. Cullen. Parley Bear as Chester, and Howard McNear as Doc. 
Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Rowan speaking. Remember, gangbusters going to action Saturday nights on the CBS radio network. And in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. <laughs> Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Marshal, I see you received my complaint. I got it, Mingo. Where's Stanley? Where do you think? Upstairs. Brandy? Naturally. She always does mother him when he's in trouble. <laughs> be careful, Marshal. He might be dangerous. <laughs> well, Marshal... Got a sweet word for Dixie? Yeah. Move. Oh, it's not very sweet. It was to the point. <laughs> Say hello to Jim for me, huh? Go away. It's me, Brandy. Matt. Come in, Matt. Join me in a drink? Where is he, Brandy? In the next room. Cried himself to sleep. Save it, Brandy. I gotta take him. Oh, why, Matt? Jim Stanley never did a mean thing in his life. He's no bad man. He stole money from Mingo's roulette table and he threw a bottle at him when he was caught. Mingo's present charges. Stanley can clear himself in court. Huh? Against Mingo's witnesses? Do you bring Stanley out or do I go get him? Go get him. But I wouldn't be proud, Matt. Stick to running dance hall, girls, Brandy. Let me run the law, huh? Stanley? Stanley! Hmm? Hmm? Oh. It's you, Marshal. Oh, sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> 
I want you to come with me, Jim. Come with you? Sure, Marshal. You better get up. Come on. Mm. Come on. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, where are we going, Marshal? Would you like to visit my ranch? I got a new colt. Your prettiest little soil you ever Jim. saw. She... We're going to jail. Jail? Me, Marshal? Do I have to? Yes, Jim. I've never been in a jail. I'm sorry, Jim. No. No. I, I can't go in there. Oh, Marshal, I ain't never been locked up before. Please, don't make me... I have to. I didn't mean to do it. Honest, I just lost my head when I realized my money was gone... I wouldn't have kept those chips. I know that. I, I just grabbed them. I don't know why. They were there, and I just grabbed them, and then Mingo started in on me. He kept saying things, bad things Take about... Take it easy, Jim. I wouldn't have cared, except that, well, Dixie was there. He kept yelling at me that I was a thief right, right in front of her. I tried to make him stop, and he wouldn't. And then something happened. The, the bottle was there. You and... threw it at Mingo? No. No, I just threw it, Marshal. I was crazy. I, I didn't mean to hurt nobody. I believe you, Jim. Marshal, uh, will you ask Dixie to come and see me later? Yeah, sure, I'll ask her. Jim. Thanks. I just want to tell her not to blame Mingo for all this. She might say something or give up her job. Don't worry, Jim. I don't think Dixie's going to give up anything. He won't eat his dinner, Mr. Dillon. He just sits there staring. Yeah, poor devil. He won't really be convicted, will he? Well, I hope not, Chester. Mingo's the one who ought to be in jail. Look, Chester, this isn't exactly my idea of justice either. A shady gambler against a simple-minded horse rancher. Hello, Marshal. Goodbye, Chester. Hmm? Oh, goodbye. I'll run along. You stay run. put, Chester. Oh, now, Marshal... I want to be alone with you. I sent for you to come and visit Jim Stanley, and you better be nice to him. <laughs> Most fellas are tickled pink if I like them. They say I'm pretty. You're pretty enough. Hmm, that's, that's better. I knew you liked me. I said you were pretty. I didn't say I liked you. Oh, now that's nasty. Would you like to hear what I really think of you? No, don't bother. I get the idea. You're Mingo's girl. When I feel like it. Then why do you have to tease a man like Stanley, drive him to drinking and gambling and trouble like he's in now? He's sweet. He thinks I'm beautiful. Yeah. But even men like him wake up. Stick to Mingo. <laughs> I'd drop in and see if your prisoner was all set for trial tomorrow. Mingo, I want you to withdraw those charges. And let that potential murderer go free? <laughs> no. You got back the chip Stanley took from your table, and his assaulting a man like you is ridiculous. He doesn't even wear a gun. A bottle constitutes a deadly weapon. Look it up, Mark. Why are you doing this, Mingo? Why pick on a man like Stanley? Let's say I don't like him always slobbering over Dixie. She's private property. For that greedy little vixen he had sent Stanley to prison, knowing that it'll probably crack his mind completely? That's his problem. You don't understand, Mingo. I don't like to see people pushed around. Or well, don't cross me, Marshal. I already have. 
people get dead that way. Yeah, so I've heard. Now, just who are these witnesses of yours against Stanley? Ned Cole, Saginaw Henry. Both on your payroll. Dixie. Some of the other girls. All working for you, huh? Jim Stanley's as good as convicted, Marshal. There's not a thing you can do about it. Here, man. Drink this. Ah, uh, thanks, Brandy. You know, all you need to do is stop fighting yourself, Matt. You're mixed up. Yeah, that's sure true, Brandy. You know, it's funny when when it's something you can fight with your fists and your guns, it's easy. But how do you fight a deal like this? You've got to clear Jim somehow. Yeah, with those witnesses against him, Jim can't win in court. Technically, he's a criminal. Oh, criminal, my foot. He admits the crimes. The judge will have to sentence him to at least a minimum jail term. We know there are witnesses who can prove he's innocent. Now, a smart man would find a way to make him talk. I've been thinking about it. Well, I'll, I'll tell Jim you were asking after him, huh? I think he'd like that. Mm, he's Dixie's. I had me a man once, Matt. I traded him for a bottle of brandy. <laughs> I paid a stiff price for my name. You're not through yet, Brandy. Oh, sure. <laughs> I play mother to everybody. Take everybody's troubles on my shoulders. Help save my conscience. <laughs> Don't ever hurt a person, Matt. You never get through paying for it. Well, I, I better be going. Where? To try to get some of those witnesses to talk. <laughs> Hello, Saginaw. Huh? Oh, it's you. I've been looking for you. And you've been looking for trouble. Well, you're beginning to sound like your boss, Mingo. It's late. What do you want? I want to read you something from this book. What book? This law book. Oh, so? First law I see says that uh, anyone giving a drink to an Indian is liable to fine up to $500. I saw you buy an Indian Pete a drink only last week. Pete's a stable boy. He ain't no savage. Law doesn't say savage. Says Indian. Pete's an Indian, so technically you broke the law. You can't make Next any... one says any man that disrobes in a public place is guilty of committing a public nuisance. Carries a fine of a hundred dollars. Look, what the devil is all this? I saw you breaking a horse down in Harrison's Corral a little while back. You took your shirt off, and that's disrobing in a public place. Technically. You can't get away with this, Dylan. How much you make a month, Saginaw? Ooh, 50, 75. Uh -huh. Well, the way it looks, I can get you fined on enough of these laws to keep you broke for about five years. Five years? And we can start all over again. You're, you're bluffing. I never even heard of these well, laws. Well, look for you... yourself here. If you witnesses are going to send Jim Stanley to jail on a technicality, then a lot of you are going to jail the same way. Well, laws may be there, but they ain't fair. All right, Saginaw, if that's how you want it. Come on, let's go to jail. No, no uh, wait. Well, then start talking. Well, Dixie shilled Stanley into losing his money, and, and me and Ned Cole egged him into grabbing a couple of chips when the wheelman wasn't looking. On Mingo's orders? Sure. Stanley looked down at the chips we swiped, and uh, he reached out to hand them back when Mingo jumped him. What was Dixie doing? I'm trying to keep from laughing. Yeah, I'll bet. And then what? Mingo rode Stanley hard to make him break down in front of Dixie. And finally, the poor lunkhead seemed to go crazy. He yelled and tossed a bottle at the bar. Not at Mingo? No, missed him by ten feet. 
Stanley was just working off his mad by busting the bottle. Paid for it, I guess he had the right. Yeah, I guess he had. First, I think Mingo was just deviling Stanley, and then he got the idea to press charges and send him to jail. We got orders out to testify. Uh-huh. Oh, thanks, Saginaw. Uh, Marshal, uh, I'd like you to know something. Yeah? I'm glad I told you about Stanley, because framing him into prison isn't my idea of something to be proud of. It shouldn't be. Ah, good evening, Chester. My, what are you so happy about, Mr. Dillon? <laughs> everything, Chester, everything. Is it about Jim Stanley? It is about Jim Stanley. He's going to clear himself in court tomorrow. Come on, let's go tell it. Well, gracious, that is good news. He couldn't have taken much more of being locked up. <laughs> I know. Hey, Jim, wake up. We're going to break... Jim. Mr. Dillon, he's, he's gone. Both window bars are cut. Yeah. And here's what cut him. A hacksaw blade. And look yonder, there's another. Oh, that fool. Why couldn't he have waited one more day and he'd have been free? Jim Stanley didn't have those hacksaw blades on him, Mr. Dillon. I know I searched him good. You searched Dixie good? Hmm? Oh, mercy, no, Mr. Dillon. She's a girl. He didn't have any other visitors. No, sir. Mingo's going to be awful mad when he finds out his girl helped Jim Stanley get away. Come on. You going to arrest Dixie, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. First, I got to find her. return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, every Sunday on CBS Radio, hear both sides debate the issues on Pick the Winner. It's a program that brings in the top people from Democratic and Republican camps, standing their ground and delivering their views on the biggest questions of the campaign. Don't miss Pick the Winner, Sundays between now and November, to be fully informed when it comes time to vote. And remember... Straight through election time, make CBS Radio your election headquarters. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. aren't you, Marshal? Where's Dixie, Mingo? Dixie, she's gone. I don't know where she is. You're lying. Well, I swear she disappeared hours ago. I still think you're lying. Dixie's here someplace. No, he's telling me the truth for once, man. Dixie's gone, all right. Are you sure, Brandy? Saw her ride out of town. Was Stanley? Yeah, Matt. The two of them. Dixie and Stanley? Dixie passed him some saw blades. He cut his way out. That rotten double cross and hell cat. He's your girl, Mingo. I'll be the laughing stock of Dart City. Good. I hope they laugh you clear out of Kansas. <laughs> it's the last thing I'll do, I'll find her. Both of them. Finding them is my job, Mingo. Go ahead. But you better beat me to them, or you'll be arresting them dead. <laughs> They stopped here, all right. Probably changed horses and got some supplies. That wasn't why Stanley came home. Look, Chester. What? Water in the stock trough is right up to the top. And the barn's open. Feed pulled out where the stock can reach it. Even scared to death, Jim thought about his animals first. Mr. Dillon, you think Mingo's trailing Stanley and Dixie, too? Uh, perhaps. It's one good reason why we better catch him quick. Come on. Still no sign. Uh, looks like we've lost them for good now. 
What do we do, go back, Mr. Dillon? Well, we can't let Mingo find them. Sure, but the way they've been zigzagging back and forth for the last four days, we don't have a chance in a thousand. I'm not so sure, Chester. Hmm? You know, there's a certain pattern about the way Stanley and Dixie have been moving. I don't think they're trying to leave this section at all. Yeah, we have been getting closer and closer to Dodge with every circle lately. And not only to Dodge. Mr. Dillon, you got an idea? Yeah, maybe. Come on, we'll ride back to Stanley's ranch. You think they came back here? I will soon find out. But from what we saw here before, I'll bet Stanley's not the kind to stay away from his ranch for very long. What? I'm hit the dirt. Here. Behind the truck. Yeah. It's Jim Stanley. There's his horse. Yeah. All right, keep your eyes open. Stanley! Jim, it's Matt Dillon. Let me talk to you. You go away, Marshal. I don't want to hurt you, but I ain't going back to that jail. And you go away now. I'll kill you. Jim, listen to me. I've got a witness. You better leave quick now. Please, Marshal. Mr. Dillon, I'm getting wet. That's better than getting shot. Keep your head down. Yes, sir. Sure he is wet. Stanley's in a good position. Closest cover for us is the barn. That's across 50 yards of clearing. That's a long run. He could pick us off before we made 10 feet. Yeah. Jim! I'm not leaving until I've talked to you. Leave me alone, Marshal. Can't you leave me alone? I'm coming to talk to you, Jim. No! No, stay back! I warn you! Mr. Dillon, don't do it. That's a crazy man. That's a frightened man, Chester. I'm coming unarmed, Jim. I don't think you're a murderer, but if you are, this is your chance. Good luck, Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon! Stanley's shot sliced across my side like a branding iron. It was all I could do to ignore my fear and keep going. But somehow I reached the ranch house alive. And I opened the door. <laughs> Jim Stanley stood there holding his gun. Jim. I, I, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I, I was only trying to scare you. I'm not a killer. I, I, I never shot anybody in my life. Honest, Marshal, I, I can't even shoot a rabbit. I know that, Jim. I, I'm afraid. I've always been afraid of things. I try like to be like other people, and it only seems to bring trouble. You can stop being afraid of the law and jail right now. That's all over with. You, you mean that, Marshal? Really? Really. But, but I shot you. Did you? No, I don't recall. Oh, but Mr. Dillon, shot hit your side right, right there. You see it? It's bleeding. Now, Jim, listen to me. You didn't shoot me. Oh. Well, all right, if, if you say so, Mr. Dillon. I say so. Now, here, I'll take that rifle. Now, let's go back to town and get this business settled, huh? You've been good to me, Marshal. Forget it, Jim. There is one thing, though. Dixie. Oh, she brought me hacksaw blades. I know that. 
She said you were going to hang me and that, that I had to escape. She kept saying that... Uh-huh. Oh. She was riding with you. Well, where is she now? Oh, the, she left me last night. I was glad. I was nearly wild listening to her talk about you and prison. <laughs> even swore I'd kill myself before I'd go back to jail. And I'm glad she didn't mean it. Oh, I meant it at the time. Oh, I was sure scared. <laughs> You feel better now? Oh, yeah. Yes, I know. Everything's just going to be fine. Ah, ah, ah. The rifle slug splashed the side of Jim's face with red, and he crumpled into the dirt. From the water trough, Chester opened up and drew the fire of whoever was hiding in the hayloft of the barn. I could see a gun barrel poking out from the side of the hayloft. And I picked up Stanley's rifle... Mingo. Mr. Dillon, are you all right? Yeah, Chester. But Mingo's dead. Well, how about Jim Stanley, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, he was scared more than hurt. He should come to any minute. Well, my goodness. Oh, this looks like a sure enough war's been happening around here. Where have you been, Dixie? Oh, sure now, Marshal. A, a girl's got a right to look after her uh, investments. Uh, my Mingo and Stanley both dead. Well, now that's a real shame. Hmm? Oh, but Jim Stanley. Uh, gonna Chester. Be a... You said investments. The only investment you've made is prison time for helping Jim escape. Me? Well, how are you going to prove anything, Marshal? With Jim dead. But he's. Your Chester, only... why don't you go look after the horses? But, Mr. Dillon. Yes, sir. It's a right good thing because I'm going to be terribly busy, you know, taking care of poor Jim's ranch and money and, and of course, the funeral and everything. Why should all that concern you, Dixie? Because I'm Jim Stanley's widow. What? I married him three days ago in this city. It was such a sweet wedding. Yeah, I'm sure it was. And... Now, all I have left are some memories. And, of course, this little old ranch and Jim's money. Dixie, there's something you should know. Hmm? You also got a husband. Have you heard enough, Jim? Enough. Jim! When I, I saw you fall... You're... You're bad, Dixie. Oh, no. Jim, you... You mustn't pay no mind to what I said. I, I was upset didn't I come back just to be with you? No good, Dixie. Jim's on to you now. Jim, are you going to let him talk to me like that? He's my friend. And I don't like you now, Dixie. Oh, that's too bad. I'm still your wife. Marshal, can she make that stick? Well, by law, you have to support her, Jim. Of course, it don't say how. Marshal, you stop putting ideas in... And, of in... course, she has to take care of your house for you, Jim. Clean it, do the chores, cook for you. Cook? Me? Cook for him? He can <laughs> make you, Dixie. It's his right. All right, or not, I'd like to see him try. He can do it, Dixie. Yeah? Well, he can't if I'm not here. And I'm leaving right now. You want to ride into town with us, Jim? No. I think I'd rather stay here for a while, Marshal. If it's all right. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll fix it. But in a few days, when you feel like it, come in and see me, and we'll help you get that divorce taken care of. Divorce? On grounds of desertion. She just deserted you, remember? Chester and I are your witnesses. Oh. Well, thanks, Marshal. I sure do thank you. So long, Jim. Goodbye, Marshal. Bye. Come on, Chester, let's go. Uh, he's had it too rough out here on the frontier, hasn't he, Mr. Dillon? Uh, Jim Stanley, I mean. It's addled him, sort of. Yeah, I, I guess that's it, Chester. <laughs> Men like him need looking after. Yeah, we got all kinds out here, Chester. 
Come on, let's get back to town. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Herb Purdom, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner and Michael Ann Barrett, with Paul Dubov, Vivi Janice, and Bill Lally. Parley Bear is Chester. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Tomorrow's speakers on Pick the Winner, representing both the major parties, will be Harold Stassen, Republican, and George Ball, Democrat. Listen for this important program, Pick the Winner, tomorrow and every Sunday from now to November. This is Roy Rowan speaking, and this is the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. <laughs> Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. <laughs> There it is. Yeah. Wonder if he's in. We'll soon find out. Look him over close. You've got to know how he stacks up. Yeah, I know. Hope he doesn't recognize us. He won't. Come on. Morning, boys. Morning, sir. Are, uh, are you the marshal here in Dodge? Yeah, that's right. My name is Dillon, Matt Dillon. Uh, Thompson's our name. I'm Jim. This is my brother, Will. Hey, I'm glad to know you. This is my sidekick, Chester Proudfoot. Pleased to meet howdy, you. Howdy, howdy. Hey, Mr. Dillon, we're after some information. Huh? What kind of information? Well, you see, Will and I just brought a trail herd up from the Pecos country, mm -hmm. around 2,000 head. We're holding them downriver a few miles. Oh, toward Walnut Creek? Yeah, I guess that's what they call it. You see, we plan to drive them on up toward Wyoming and put them on grass for a couple of months. We got to thinking we might sell them here if we could get a fair price. Well, you shouldn't have any trouble. The market's good right now. So we've heard. And the only thing is, we we don't know any buyers here. We we're wondering if you might have an idea, too. I see. Well, uh, let me see. I suggest you go talk to Clem Bates. He runs the bank down the west end of Front Street. Mm -hmm. Clem Bates, huh? Now, he'll know of any buyers that happen to be in town. Might even buy the herd himself if it's in good condition. Well, we'll go right down and see him now, Mr. Dillon. And uh, much obliged to you, sir. Oh, forget it. Coming, Will? Yeah. It's 
been a pleasure talking to you, Marshal. Thank you. Same to you. Goodbye. Well, they seem like a couple of nice men, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. A couple of strange ones, Chester. Wonder what they're here for. Why, to sell a herd of cattle. You heard what they said. Chester, when's the last time a trail driver came in here and asked me where to sell his cattle? Well, I don't recollect that one ever did before, but all the same... Of course they... not. They go to the bank or one of the saloons. They don't come to the jail. Then why do you figure the Thompsons did? Well, I got an idea they might be sizing me up. I think that's the kind of information they wanted. But why? I don't know. Maybe they're planning something they think I might interfere with. Uh, what do you say we ride out to Walnut Creek and find out if they really got a herd, huh? All right, Mr. Dillon, whatever you say. That older one, Jim. You know, there's something familiar. I can't quite place it. Thompson Brothers, huh? Well, come on, Chester, let's ride. Oh, oh. Well, they got a herd, all right, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, so they have, Chester. Well, let's drop in on them, huh? Come on. Smoke's coming up behind those willows. Must be their camp. Yeah, I guess so. These cattle are carrying a Circle Bar T brand. I never heard of it. It's like the Thompson brothers, Chester. I never heard of them either. At least not by that name. Camp looks deserted, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I... Right way out! Somebody coming out of the wagon there. Yeah, he must have been asleep or... Well, well, well. You fellas better turn them horses around. Hello, Houston. Dillon, I... I didn't recognize you. Well, now that you have, why don't you put the rifle down? Well, sure, Marshal. I I got no quarrel with you. You used to figure you did. Well, I... How long you been working for the Thompsons, Houston? Just a couple of months. I ran into them down on the Pecos and hired on for the drive. Did you know them before that? No. No, I just happened to run into them, and I heard they was looking for riders. Riders? I never knew you to hire out for anything but gunslinging. Why don't you let bygones be bygones, Marshal? A, a man can change. Maybe. Now, you take me. I, I don't hold no grudges. You run me out of town last year, and I was pretty sore about it, but, but not anymore. I'm, I'm willing to forget it. If you do, you'll be making a mistake, Houston. Now, look, Marshal. I told you to get out of Dodge City and stay out. That still goes. You understand me? All right, Marshal. That's the way you want it. I'm not in Dodge City. Not yet. They don't seem to be in here, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, we'll wait, Chester. They will be sooner or later. Well, it was a real dull day up until now. Oh, hiya, Kitty. Good to see you, Matt. Uh, Chester. Hmm? Uh, you're on your own. What? Uh, uh, stick around, though, huh? Oh. All right, Mr. Dillon. See you later, Miss Kitty. Hi, Chester. You like a drink? Not now, thanks, Kitty. I, uh, I was looking for a couple of strangers in town, the, uh, Thompson brothers. Oh, yeah. They were in earlier. Seemed very pleasant, quiet, real polite. Mm-hmm. Mm. People aren't always what they seem to be, Kitty. Well, are they mixed up in something, man? I don't know. I don't know. Well, then what do you mean? I don't think their name is Thompson. And I don't think they came here to sell cattle. But they brought a herd in. Yeah, I know. I know that. But I'm pretty sure I've seen that older brother somewhere before. Somewhere, sometime. <laughs> You're suspicious of everybody, aren't you, Matt? 
<laughs> Are you going to start that again? All right, all right. <laughs> but you got the wrong attitude, you know. You miss a lot that way. Yeah? Yeah. Someday you're going to miss... Over here at the Oh, farm, there they man. are now. I came in with Clem Bates. Uh, will you excuse me, Kitty? Sure, Matt, sure. When you're through, come back. I'll be here. All right, Kitty, I'll see you. Hiya, Clem. I just bought myself 2,000 head of the finest cattle that's come north all summer. Yeah, they are in good shape. I rode out that way this afternoon. Marshal, we want to thank you again for putting us in touch with Mr. Bates. We're as satisfied with the deal as he is. How about a drink, Matt? Uh, thanks, Clem. Later, maybe, huh? Uh, Mr. Thompson, do you know that you've got one of the crookedest gunslingers in this part of the country working for you? No, I didn't know it. What do you mean? Man who calls himself Houston Jack. Houston Jack? Is he back in town? Well, not back in town, exactly. I ran into him out at the trail camp. I ordered him out of Dodge a year ago, Mr. Thompson. The order still stands. That's funny. He didn't tell us he'd ever been in Dodge. Well, I thought maybe he didn't. That's why I figured I'd better let you know about him. I'm glad you did, Marshal. Of course, with the herd sold, we'll be paying the boys off tomorrow, and that'll be that. And then back to Texas. The sooner the better. In the meantime, there's nothing to prevent us from having a sociable drink or two. Holly, set him up over here. Mr. Dillon. What? Oh. Uh, uh, will you boys excuse me a minute, Sure, please? go right ahead. Sure, Marshal. Yeah. What are you going to have, Will? Well, yeah, what is it, Sammy? Maybe Could you spare me a dollar, Mr. Dillon? I need a drink off a of bed. Oh, Sammy, you know what always happens? First it's one drink, and then it's ten. And I always end up by having to run you in. Oh, not this time, Mr. Dillon. I... Well, what's the matter, Sammy? Them fellas you're with... You know him, Mr. Dillon? Well, their name's Thompson. They're brothers. Oh, no. No, that's not their name. Well, then what is it? Me too, uh... I... Gotta get out of here, Mr. Dillon. Wait a minute, Sammy. What the devil are you talking about? No, 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 nothing, Mr. Dillon. Honest, I... Uh, just remembered something. I, uh... I gotta go right now. Well, how about that drink? Uh, some other time, Mr. Dillon. Uh, thanks a lot. I'll, I'll, I'll remember it, though. G uh, goodbye, Mr. Dillon. Right here. What's wrong with Sammy, Matt? Did he smell a drink somewhere? Yeah, he must have. I don't know what you said to him, Marshal, but he sure went out of here looking like he'd seen a ghost. Well, Sammy's seen a lot of different things at different times. Maybe he did see a ghost. I can't figure where he got to, Mr. Dillon. And I looked in all the places he usually hangs out, but there wasn't any sign of him. Well, the ways of a drunkard and the ways of a woman, Chester, they're beyond all human knowledge. Yes, sir, I guess they are, Mr. Dillon. There's one thing certain, though. As blurry-eyed as he is, Sammy recognized those Thompson brothers. And that's more than I can do. Oh, maybe there's nothing to recognize. Maybe you just think you've seen them before. Yeah, maybe. Well, there's no use going back to Texas Trail. That's one saloon Sammy will stay clear of. I just don't know where to look, Mr. Dillon. I'll swear wait, I... Wait a minute, Chester. Hmm? Oh, Thompson's coming out of the saloon. No, I mean across the street. There's somebody by the corner that... By heaven, that's Sammy. Yes, and he's got a rifle. I got you, boys. Sammy, you fool! Over there by the corner. Come on, Chester. Oh, he must have been crazy, Mr. Dillon. He must have been out of his mind. Yeah, I guess. One side. Let me through here, please. Let me through. Sammy. Mr. Dillon, I... I used... could use that drink now. Thought I'd get the reward. I... Sammy? Is he dead? Yeah. We sure hated to do it, Marshal. We had nothing against this man. Didn't even know him, in fact. 
but I guess you saw what happened. Yeah, I saw it. He threw a rifle on you, tried to kill you. You couldn't do anything else. I can't figure it, Marshal. My brother and me didn't have no quarrel with this fella. Well, Sammy drank a lot. He wasn't always in his right mind. But you won't be held. It was out and out self-defense. Thanks, Marshal. Thanks a lot. Come on, Will. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Well, it's too bad, Mr. Dillon. Sammy never meant no harm to anybody. He did to the Thompsons, Chester. I can't figure it. Why did he do it? Because he recognized them, I guess. Say, did you see them draw after he fired? Yeah. Yeah, I saw them. They're fast, Mr. Dillon. Ma'am. Ma? Oh, Kelly. I heard him down the street calling for Doc. He was hurt. Sammy got himself killed. Oh. Poor little guy. Yeah. Matt, you got trouble, too. What do you mean? Houston Jack's in town. What? He's over at the saloon now, looking for you. Matt, he says he's going to kill you. Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, adventure on your mind, then keep tuned. The Gene Autry Show is straight ahead on most of these same CBS radio stations, bringing you the Melody Ranch Gang and Gene Autry songs. Tarzan's straight ahead, too, tonight, involved with some fanatic headhunters in darkest Africa. There's another true police case on gangbusters this evening. And Broadway is my beat offers mystery fiction that's packed with excitement. They're all ahead tonight on CBS Radio. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. I just can't figure it, Mr. Dillon. I never thought Houston would have the nerve. Well, it's like a lot of things tonight, Chester. None of it figure. Mr. Dillon, you don't suppose he's going to set you up for the Thompsons? No. No, they got their horses and left. They're not in here. Well, we'll soon find out. Come on. Watch the boys at the tables, Chester, and keep them off my back, huh? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Maybe I wanted to leave town just at that time. I'll tell you one thing for sure. There wasn't that tin horn marshal that made me do it. You notice he's staying plenty clear of me. Uh... Hello, Houston. Dylan. You got nothing on me. I told you to get out of town, didn't I? I know, but you... You you still got... I told you to stay out, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, but you had no right. What do you think you are? Why'd you come back? That's my business. Mine too, maybe. You're under arrest. Stay back, Dylan. I'm warning you. You can't keep backing off forever, Houston. You'll have to stop sometime. I said you're under arrest. I heard what you said. I got ears, Dylan, and I know I'm under arrest. He's holding out the door, Mr. Dylan. He's getting away. Careful, Master. He could be waiting outside. You drew, Mr. Dylan. Why didn't you shoot? Because you didn't draw. You can't. There he goes. Well, come on, Chester. He can't be far ahead of us, Mr. Dillon. Uh, He's heading for the range camp. 
I still can't figure it, Mr. Dillon. It just don't add up. Justice, I hope me if you say that once more, I'm... I'm... What's the matter, Mr. Dillon? Pull up. How about... Pull? Pull? No. What are we stopping for, Mr. Dillon? He's getting farther away every minute. Chester, I owe you an apology. You're right, it don't add up. Well, it's just a way of talking I have. I didn't intend... No, no, I mean it, Chester. Everything Houston Jack did tonight, it doesn't add up at all. He knew I'd jump him if he came into town. He's tough, but he's not that tough. He's not the kind of a man to force a gunfight just for a chance to show off. Yeah, but there wasn't any gunfight, Mr. Dillon. No. He turned tail and ran. That's not like Houston, either. You'll be a laughing stock from here to the Pecos. Well, it's like I said, it just don't add... I forget what I was going to say. Just to suppose that Thompson's wanted to get us out of town for a while, huh? You mean they put Houston up to that Dido so as we'd chase off after him? Well, there's only one way I know to find out. Come on. Dodge is kind of spooky this time of night, Mr. Dillon. Pretty, though. All shadows and moonlight. Yeah. Man could do a fair job of shooting tonight. My. Sometimes I think Kitty is right about you, Mr. Dillon. Meaning? No heart. Maybe not, Chester. Uh, no offense, Mr. Dillon. Oh, forget it, forget it. You know, Chester, there's something about moonlight connected with those Thompson brothers. I wish I could remember what... Chester, hmm? don't... Don't look, just ride straight ahead. Keep riding. There are four horses tied over there by the bank. Uh-huh. So that's it. One of them's been run. He's wet. I can see it in the moonlight. Houston must have circled back. Him and the Thompsons. Yes, but what about that fourth horse, Mr. Dillon? It's probably Clem Bates. They'd have to have him. The vault's locked at night. All right, around the corner now. Mm. They may be watching from the front windows. The Thompson brothers... I wouldn't never have figured him for a bank hold up. Yeah, well. All right, we'll leave the horses here. Slip back to the side address. Yeah. Oh, oh. Well, what about that moonlight now, Chester? Well, I guess it's bright enough a man could... A man could do a fair job of shooting tonight. Sign of life, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. They're in there, though. Side door's open. Mm. Maybe one other sort of time. I came from the door. Come on, Justin. All right, get flat against the wall. They'll have to show themselves to fire at us. See, Mr. Dillon, I think they shut that door. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's shut all right. I'm going to try the door. If it opens, flip a couple of shots in. Yes, sir. Chester. Here it goes. I think I hear him running inside. Yeah, one more. They crashed out through the front window, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, come on. Oh, there's Clem on the floor. They must have laid him out. Easy, Chester. 
They may be waiting outside for us. There they go. They're making a run for it. Yeah, come on. Let's get out through this window. <laughs> Mr. Dillon? Uh, Mr. Dillon? It's all right, Chester. Uh, Nick to rib, I think. I'm, I'm all right, sir. I thought for a minute there that they'd... Yeah, yeah, I know. Looks like one of them stayed behind. That shot came from the corner of the livery stable over there. Maybe I can... What's the matter, Dylan? You're supposed to be good. It's Houston, all right. He's back at that old stone well. Yeah. Stay here and keep him pinned down, Chester. I'm going up on the roof through the trap door back here. All right, Mr. Dillon. Watch yourself. Yeah. Throw a shot or two at him. Keep him busy, huh? Yes, sir. I will, Houston. Don't worry about that. Now, if I can just get this open with a... There. Now. You're not getting Lily, are you, Dylan? South corner there. Put me right over him. And then I... Wait a minute. Moonlight night and a bank. So that's who they are. Houston! Dylan, where are you? Up here. You're under arrest. Drop your gun. I'll drop it. Last chance, Houston. Your last chance! All right, then. So long, gunslinger. I reckon that did it, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Moonlight's real bright up here, Chester. All right, Chester, I'm coming down. <laughs> Mr. Bates is coming, too, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he's not bad off. They must have slapped him with a gun barrel on the way out. Clem. Clem. Clem, can you hear me? Matt. Oh, oh Matt, thank you. Uh, Chester, get that chair over there. Yes, sir. Here you are. All right, give me a hand with him. Easy, go. Come on, Mr. Bates. There you are. Now, what happened, Clem? Are they trying to make you open the vault? That's right. It was those Thompson brothers, man. Yeah, I know. They fooled me plenty. I thought they were fine fellas. I've been drinking with them all evening. Well, you never know, Clem. They get away with anything? No. I was about to give in and open the vault when you rode by. That got him kind of upset. Well, there's no harm done, then. Houston Jack was long overdue for killing. We gonna go after the Thompsons, Mr. Dillon? Where, Chester? They could have gone in any one of a dozen directions. There'll be no chance of trying to track them till morning. Somehow, I don't think we'll get them even then. I think I ought to get something done about this head of mine, Matt. It's, it's giving me fits. Yeah, I'll go with you, Clem. I gotta tell the doc about Houston. Chester, I guess you better go over to the depot and wake up Mr. Hightower. Have him put a wanted bulletin on the wire. For the Thompson brothers, huh? No, Chester. I've recognized them finally. Their name isn't Thompson. Well, what name do I put in the bulletin, Mr. Dillon? Just say, wanted for attempted bank robbery in Dodge City, Frank and Jesse James. <laughs> Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. 
Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell and Vic Perrin, with Paul Dubov, Joe Duvall, and Lou Krugman. Polly Bear is Chester, Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Sundays in the daytime, CBS Radio brings you a unique series of political debates, a program called Pick the Winner, on which the major parties select their highest authorities to discuss important election issues. Tomorrow on most of these same CBS Radio stations, hear another major election issue debated. Here, Pick the Winner. And don't forget, to make the full use of what these programs tell you, register so you may vote this fall. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Remember, every Sunday we extend a cordial invitation to great music on the CBS Radio Network. Just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. told us a man we'd been looking for, a murderer, was in a cow camp on the north fork of the Canadian River, about a hundred miles south of Dodge. So Chester and I rode down to take a look. We found a fellow there with a right name, but the wrong face. So we started back. First night, we camped in a dry, buffalo-rutted depression. The next morning, I woke shortly after daybreak to find Chester already cooking breakfast. Morning, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Meat will be done soon. Uh, the coffee made, Chester, that's what I need. It's yeah. boiling. I didn't make much, though. I thought I'd better save our water. You know, Chester, I'll bet right now the doc's back there in St. Louis holed up in some fancy hotel and still asleep. <laughs> that's quite a thought, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Him right in the middle of St. Louis and us way out here on the prairie. <laughs> I bet he's even got sheets on his bed. I wouldn't be surprised, Mr. Dillon. Doc said this was one vacation he was going to splurge on. <laughs> he's riding the Santa Fe both ways. Uh huh. Well, meat's done. I cleaned off this rock here to cut it on. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, 
Well, you've got them warm anyway, Chester. Well, now, meat shouldn't be overcooked, Mr. Dillon. That takes the taste clean out of it. Now, then we ought to be able to taste everything about this steer. Aigman's disappointment. How's that, Mr. Dillon? <laughs> Never mind, Chester. How come you woke up so early this morning? Oh, I always do. Seems as soon as it gets daylight, my feet start to sweat, and then I just got to get up. <laughs> well, that's as good a reason as any, I guess. Wow. Looks like we got company, Chester. What? Oh. Where? Right out there. Heading straight for us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some cowboy, probably. I don't know. He doesn't ride quite like a cowboy. Why, it's just a kid, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> sure needs a haircut. <laughs> what? Say, Mr. Dillon, it's a girl. Now, what could she be doing out here? I'm carrying a rifle, too. Well, uh, get on, miss, and have some coffee. Who are you, mister? Hi, right, this is Chester Proudfoot, and I'm Matt Dillon. How do you do? You rustlers, or what? <laughs> uh, not exactly. I'm the U.S. Marshal out of Dodge, ma'am. U.S. Marshal? Oh, that's good. It is? Why? I need help, Mr. Marshal. My daddy's awful sick. Sick? Well, well where is your daddy? We got a homestead about a mile over that rise back there. Oh, what's he sick with? It's his leg, Mr. Marshal. A horse threw him and his saddle both in the corral, and then it stepped on his foot. Now his whole leg's all funny. He's got a fever, too. Mr. Dillon, that sounds like... Yeah, I know, Chester. Uh, tell me, miss, when the horse stepped on him, did it cut his foot, uh, break the skin anywhere? Just a scratch. Tore his boot off, though. Oh. Please, Mr. Marshall, please come see him. I'm scared, the way his leg is and everything. Well, sure, sure we'll come. Your mother with him now? I don't have a mother, Mr. Marshall. Oh. Well, then, what are you doing out here if your daddy's sick? We ran out of meat about three days ago, and I don't have anything to feed him. Oh. All right. Uh, Chester, I'll ride back with the... Uh, what is your name, anyway? Tara. Tara Hantry. Oh. I'll be 16 next January. Well, that's, that's fine. Uh, we'll go back to the Hantry place, Chester. You scout around for some meat. All right, sir. And if you don't find any antelope, shoot the first calf you see. Anybody's calf. I'll do it, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> in the sleeping room, Mr. Marshall. No. Daddy. <laughs> I, Daddy, I found a man, and he, he's going to help us. And Daddy, he, he's a Marshal, a U.S. Marshal. Matt Dillon, Mr. Hendry. Uh, uh, how are you feeling? Dillon, I've heard of you. You're from Dodge, aren't you? <laughs> That's right. Well... Marshal, I ain't feeling so good. My my foot don't hurt no more, but it and my leg is all sort of... Well, it ain't pretty. I don't know much about these things, but maybe I better take a look at it anyway, huh? Sure. Sure, Marshal. There. There she is. Uh, all right, you can cover it up. I was in the war, Marshal. I know what gangrene is. Guess you do, too, huh? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, the first thing, a friend of mine is out getting you some meat, and then we'll load you in your wagon. Well, and we'll... Ben took the wagon. What? Ben Walling. He took the wagon when Daddy got hurt. Said he'd find a doctor and bring him back. Well, who's Ben Walling? Oh, he, he's been sort of working here, Mr. Marshall. I should have run him off long ago. That's what. Well, where is he? What'd he take the wagon for? Where's he going to find a doctor around here anyway? Closest doctors in Dodge, I know of. Yeah, and he's in St. Louis, and he won't be back for a couple of weeks. Uh, I couldn't get to him anyway. Well, tell me, when did this happen? About six days ago, Mr. Marshall. Uh -huh. Ben left the day after. Well, you think he's coming back? 
Did he steal the wagon or what? He he comes back here and me not able to get around. I, I don't know what I'll do. I ought to take a fool with take now, him. take it easy, Mr. Just Hans. Take him. He won't cause any trouble, so don't you get all worked up. Uh, Tara, we'll uh, let him get some rest, huh? All right, sir. Uh, we'll have some food for you soon, Mr. Hantry. I ain't very hungry. Tara, what's he so riled up about this Ben Walling for? What's between them? Oh, it's, it's nothing, Mr. Marshall. Daddy's sick and... That's all. Look, Tara, you asked me to help you, didn't you? Yes, but... You trust me, don't you? All right, Mr. Marshall. Daddy hates Ben because Ben... Well, Ben likes me. Oh, I see. He even wanted to marry me. Said he would. How do you feel about Ben, Tara? You like him? No. Of course, it's time I had a man and all that, but I'm afraid of Ben, Mr. Marshall. It's like there's something wrong with him. He's always sneaking around when you don't expect him. Makes me uneasy, like... Well, we won't worry about Ben now. Uh, you, you stay here in case your daddy wants anything. I'll go outside and wait for Chester. Mr. Marshall. Hmm? I'm awful glad you're here. We'll see it through, Tara. Don't you worry. I won't. Now. I went outside and walked over to the small corral that stood nearby. There I rolled a smoke and looked out across the flat distances of the prairie. And I wondered how anyone could survive in all that emptiness. Hantry, lying on his bed back there in the house. He wouldn't survive. The prairie got to him all right. And its vast loneliness had put him out of reach of any help. And Tara, what could she do out here in this endless land of grass? I was glad to get my mind off it when Chester rode in with an antelope across his saddle. We hung it on the corral, dressed it, took a hind quarter into Terra, and we went back outside and sat down. Yes, sir. She's a plucky girl, Mr. Yeah, Dillon. a fine girl, Chester. Yeah, but this Ben fella, I just don't understand his going off with the wagon like that. Well, it doesn't matter much now. And tree won't last more than a day or two, anyway. It's that bad, is it? Yeah, blood poisoning, Chester. As soon as it reaches his heart, he's done for. Well, isn't there any way to stop it? Yeah, sure. Cut his leg off. Oh. Too bad Doc isn't here. Yeah. Would that stop it, Mr. Dillon? Uh, cutting his leg off, I mean? I don't know, Chester. I don't know. Maybe too late anyway. I well, don't... I sure wish we could do something for him. I don't take to just sitting around and waiting for a man to die. Well, nobody does. It isn't right somehow, that, that poor fella and, and Tara. Why, why, Mr. Dillon, that girl will go crazy out here all along. All right, Chester, what do you want me to do about it? I'm not a doctor. Now shut up. Well, I... Mr. Dillon, you could do it. I know you could. Do what? Be a doctor. Long enough to save Mr. Hendry's life, Are you anyway. out of your head? No, sir. Then what are you talking like that for? The most I ever did was doctor a horse for the colic. That's fine training for this, isn't I it? I know. I couldn't do it. I just plain don't have the spirit. But you do. Oh, why didn't I leave you back in Dodge? It wouldn't have mattered anyway, Mr. Dillon, because you would never just stand by and let a man die. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. Daddy's fever's worse, Mr. Marshall. I I'm going to get some more water. 
How do you feel, Mr. Hendry? I don't feel much, Marshal. Outside of burning up. I've been trying to tell Tara I just can't last long with blood poisoning. She's just got to figure on it. Well, that's what I came to talk to you about. I I guess you know the only thing that'll give you a chance. I know. I've been thinking about it. But I couldn't ask any man to do that. You didn't ask me. Well, it's up to you, Mr. Hantry. I'll, I'll try it if you're willing. The only thing is I... I won't know much about what I'm doing. I seen it done in the Union Army, Marshal. I could tell you some things. All right. The only thing is, Marshal, I don't know I'd be much use around here with one leg. Well, you'll have to decide that for for yourself. I know. You could move to town, Mr. Hendry, you and Tara. That's it, Tara. If it was just me, I wouldn't do it, but I can't leave Tara alone. Now, if I can help it, I, I can't. Uh, all right, Marshal. Let's do it. You're a brave man. No. No, Marshal. I just don't have any choice. Come on. Let's get it over with. You got any liquor in the house? There's a jug of corn out in the kitchen. Get it, Chester. You can start drinking it while we're getting everything else ready. Tell Tara to start boiling a lot of water. Yeah. I'll talk to her in a few minutes. I'll be right back. Now, I want you to tell me everything that you know about this, Mr. Hendry. First, I'll tell you what you'll need. Mm -hmm. There's a straight iron out by the corral somewhere. Yeah. You can heat it in the main room fireplace. Right. Now, what else? Tara will find some cloth for bandages. And the rest of the stuff you can get in the kitchen. Uh-huh. The only thing worrying me is what will we use to tie off the arteries with? Plain thread won't hold. Uh, uh, maybe some thin strips of raw. No, they, they'd soak through. you got to have something. No, I, that... I know. At least I think it'll work. What about horse hair? Oh, that's it, Marshal. Pull it off the tail. Uh, I'll work fine. Here's the judge, Mr. Hantry, and I brought you a cup, too. But, uh, pour me some. I want to get good and drunk. Here you are, Mr. Hantry. Sir. Sir. No, I ain't been drunk in the daytime since we got the news about President Lincoln in the spring of 65. Uh, you better have your talk with Tara before that takes hold. Ask her to come in, will you? Come on, Chester, we got work to do. Yes, sir. Uh, Good luck, Mr. Hantry. Thanks. Well, uh, Marshal? Yeah, Marshal? I'll try to make it easy for you. Yeah, sure. Shortly after noon, I operated. Whether it was the corn whiskey or his own hard courage, I don't know, but Hantry never whimpered. Chester stood outside the door and brought me whatever I needed. Tara waited in the kitchen, boiling more water, and thinking her own thoughts. Maybe it was harder on her than any of us. Toward the end, Hantry mercifully passed out. When I'd finally finished bandaging him, I was kind of faint myself. I'd done everything I could. I just hoped I'd done it right. How is he, Mr. Dillon? You'll have to clean up in there, Chester. I've got to get outside for some air. Yes, sir, I'll do it. And put that fire out. It's hot enough around here. I don't know how you did it, Mr. Dillon. Tara? Uh, Tara, will you come on outside for a while? Is Daddy all right? 
Is he all right, Mr. Marshall? It's all over, Tara. We'll just have to wait and see now. <laughs> ah, there now, Tara. He's all right. I'm, I'm sorry. But it took so long. I I thought you'd never finish. He, he didn't feel much, Tara. The corn liquor worked fine. Fine. Will he get well now? Well, I, I hope so, Tara. I, I hope so. Mr. Marshall, are, are you going to wait and see? Oh, now, Tara, you don't have to worry about that, Chester, and I'll be here as long as you need us. I I just wanted to be sure. Can I can I go see Daddy now? Well, uh, as soon as Chester comes out, Tara, uh, then you can. All right. I'll wait, Mr. Marshall. <laughs> It beats me, Mr. Dillon, how he can just lay there so quiet and peaceful. It's only been four or five hours, Chester. The liquor hasn't worn off yet. He drank nearly the whole jug. Oh, he needed it. Uh, say, Mr. Dillon, look yonder. Huh? Somebody coming with a wagon. Oh, yeah. It's probably that Ben Walling they were talking about. I'll bet that's who it is, all right. wonder what he'll have to say for himself. Ah, oh, you'll think of something, Chester. His kind always, too. You recognize him? No, sir. Do you? Oh, I never saw him before. Hello. What are you doing here? You've been walling. How'd you know? The hand trees. They've been wondering about you. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, he's an old hand tree, anyway. He's all right. He is, huh? You've been gone a long time, Ben. Where were you? I don't know you, mister, but you sure ask a lot of questions. You can answer them one at a time. Now, where were you? Who are you anyway, mister? I'm a U.S. Marshal. Ben. Ain't no U.S. Marshals around there here. There is now. Generally, I'm in Dodge. Is your name Dylan? It is. Well, what are you doing here, Marshal? Tara ran into us, asked us to help. Seems the only able-bodied man around here took off in a wagon. I went to fetch a doctor. Is anything wrong in that? Not at all. Where is he? Well, first night the horses ran away, and I've been chasing them ever since. I didn't catch him till this morning. And then I've been gone so long, I thought I'd better get back to you right away. I was worried about Tara and old Hantry, of course. I see. Well, you better get your horses unhitched, Ben. You can see Tara later. She's in with her father now. Going to be all right, huh? I was kind of worried about that foot. Looked to me like it might have poison in it. It did. What do you mean, it did? I took his leg off about noon today. You what? Mr. Dillon did it all by himself, just like a regular doctor. Oh, but how'd you know what to do? You might have killed him. Somebody had to do it, Ben. It's a sure thing Tara couldn't. You're blaming me, ain't you? Well, I did everything I could. did not my fault those blasted horses run off. Antre's pretty sick, Ben. I wouldn't bother him for a day or two if I were you. Oh, I won't bother him. Oh, now, look, Marshal. You can leave now. I'll handle everything here. We'll leave. As soon as Antre's able to take care of himself again. All right. Stay as long as you like. I don't care. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. I think that Ben is a no-good liar. You're right on both counts, Chester. And I'll tell you something else. You see that saddle over there? Well, that belongs to Mr. Hantry. Yeah, I know. I looked at it this noon. Somebody cut the cinch strap on it. Cut the cinch strap? Mm-hmm. No wonder that bunk bucked him and the saddle off bull. Well, do you think Tara did it? Oh, my goodness gracious, no, Mr. Dillon. Tara would never do a thing like that to her own... It was Ben, wasn't it? That'd be my guess. He figured the old man would get hurt and maybe killed. Why, sir? 
so he'd have a free hand with Tara. Why is that low down? Mr. Dillon, let me arrest him. Not yet, Chester. There's plenty of time. All right, sir. I'll wait. There wasn't as much time as I figured. Antree had a bad night, and by morning he was so weak he couldn't lift his head. I tried to take his pulse, but I could hardly find it. Maybe... Maybe I'd operated too late. Maybe the poison had already moved up into his body. I didn't know. I had no way of knowing. So there was nothing to do now but wait. Want some more coffee, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, thank you, Chester. We'll fill it up, huh? Tara won't eat anything at all, sir. She just sat there by his bed, hasn't slept a wink, I know of. Well, it's her father, Chester. He's all she's got. I never thought much about it before, Mr. Dillon, but seeing Tara, I kind of wish I had a daughter. You'd have to change your profession if you were going to take care of a daughter, Chester. Why, I don't have any profession, Mr. Dillon. Oh, Mr. Marshall. Uh, yeah, what is it, Tara? Please, please come. Daddy wants you. I, I think he's... You better come too, Chester. Yes, sir. It's Matt Dillon, Mr. Hentry. Can you hear me? Marshal, I can't hold out no more. Now, don't say that. You keep fighting, man. You'll pull through. No, Marshal. I'm going to die. Oh, Daddy. Daddy. Tara. About Tara, Marshal. Don't leave her here. Ben Walling. He's no good. He'll try to keep her. Now, don't you worry about Ben Walling, Mr. Hensry. I promise you he won't get anywhere near Tara. Now or ever. Thanks, Marshal. He's a bad one. Tara can't stay here alone. She can't work this place. It's a bad way to die. Not no. Now, I want you to listen to me. Listen to me now. I promise you something else, too. I'll take care of Tara. I'll see she's all right. I'll see she's cared for. Now, I promise that. I thank you, Marshal. I should. Where's Tara? Daddy. I'm right here. Daddy. Come on, Chester. Daddy? Daddy? I don't know, Mr. Dillon. I don't think they'd have made out on this place anyway. Why not, Chester? Well, there just isn't enough water. That one little old spring is all I've got. Well, if they had a lake, it'd still be too much for Tara. What are we going to do with her, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. We'll have to think of something, though. My, I wish she'd come out of that house. I don't like it, her in there breaking her heart. Give her a little time, Chester. She, she'll be all right. No, two more. Bring her either one of you. Well... Well, you're mighty careless with that rifle, Ben. Now get smart with me, Marshal. I know what I'm doing. And what would that be? I heard you in there. Heard you promise to take Tara away. I was right by the window. I heard it all. You got a curious way of courting a girl, Ben, trying to kill her father. Yeah, and I saw you yesterday looking at that saddle, but I didn't kill him, Marshal. You did. That's a lie, Ben Walling, and you you know it. I won't shut up. If we'd have just got here sooner, Mr. Dillon would have saved him, that's all. Yeah. Well, it's too bad you got here at all. Because you're going to die for it. Both of you. Put the gun down, Ben. You're under arrest for attempted murder. You stay right where you are, Marshal. You know, I have an idea you've smelled powder before, Ben, and that you're afraid of it. Marshal? I have an idea that's why you tried to get Hantry like you did instead of facing it. Stop, sir. And right now you wish you didn't have that rifle at all, don't you, Ben? Because I might have to shoot you. No, all right, huh? no, don't, Marshal. Give me that. 
You all right, Mr. Dillon? He didn't even try, Chester. Rifle went off when I knocked it aside. That's all he was scared to death. Well, I, I didn't feel exactly comfortable. Well, tie him up and keep an eye on him. I'll go see Tara. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Late that evening, we buried Hantree out on the prairie, out in back of the little homestead. They would die now, too, and fall apart without him. The next morning, we loaded everything we could get into the wagon. With Tara beside me, we started off for Dodge. Ben Wallen never said a word. Chester led his horse, and they rode along ahead of us. I had plenty of time to tell Tara all about Dodge and how there were some good people there and how we'd find her a home and family. She sat there, tight-lipped. She didn't say much. But she never once looked back. Smoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Sammy Hill, and Larry Dobkin. Parley Bear is Chester. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. In case you didn't know, Jack Benny and his gang begin their new season tomorrow night. Jack, Mary, Don, Dennis, and Rochester welcome a new member to the team, the head man of CBS Radio's Club 15 show, Bob Crosby. Roy Rowan speaking. Remember the top dramatic show of them all, the Lux Radio Theater, is heard Monday nights on the CBS Radio Network. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Mr. Jason, dry as a bone, our last hope of water for the herd. Not quite, Pecos. Cottonwood Pond is just over the rise ahead of us. Well, it may be dry, too. Bet they haven't had a rain on the prairie for six months. It won't be dry. I've been bringing cattle up here to Dodge City for 12 years. Drought or no drought, the pond's always had water. It better have. We're losing 15 head an hour now. Can't push him much further. There'll be water. With luck, if the railroad's got the cars for us, we can start loading this afternoon. 
By this time... Hey, sounds like the boys up ahead run into something. Yeah, come on. There's a pond, Pecos. Plenty of water. Yeah, I guess you were right. Wonder why the herd's piling up. They ought to be stampeding for that pond. You think you have to... Hold up, Pecos. A barbed wire fence. Somebody's fenced off the pond. Mr. Jackson, it looks like we've got a fight on our hands. I don't like it, Doc. It's too quiet. When things get too quiet in Dodge, it always means a blow-up's coming. Yeah, just sit down, Matt. You're just getting yourself a case of nerves. Yeah. You've been a law officer too long. Shot at too many times. <laughs> You're getting so you just act like a spooky old horse. You're jumpy and you're gun-shy. Uh, hand me those forceps for you. Oh, yeah. You mean this? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Now, you take me, Matt. I, I don't rant and rail against fate. I just sit back and take what comes. Yeah, sure, Doc. Mm-hmm. If I get a patient, fine. I steal him blind. And if I don't, well, I keep my hand in setting a broken leg on a dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that splint ought to hold him. Uh, matter of fact, I could use a fee or two. Not planning to shoot anybody, are you, Matt? Yeah, if this drought doesn't break, I'm in the mood to shoot myself. Uh, that's a bad one, all right. I don't think I've ever seen the prairie as dry as it is this year. Oh, there you are, Mr. Dillon. Well, come on in, Chester. I've been looking all over for you. We've got trouble, Mr. Dillon. Huh? Trouble? Old man Howard just sent a rider in. A trail drive's pulled in from the Big Bend. They're threatening to cut his fences so they can water the cattle at Cottonwood Pond. Well, there's your blow-up, Matt. A real head-on smash. A thirsty herd against that skin, Flint Howard. Uh, uh, I bet I could get myself a few fees out of this before it's over. <laughs> Good old Doc, always hoping for the best, huh? Now, come on, Chester, let's ride out to Cottonwood. Dyke Howard had no call to fence that pond, Mr. Dillon. There's enough water there for all the trail herds in the next ten years. That's on his ranch, Chester. He's got a right to fence his own range. Got a right, maybe, but no decent rancher would take advantage of it. Howard's mean. Just downright mean. I think it's more than that, Chester. It's the old business of making two dollars grow where one dollar grew before. I think Howard figured on something like this when he strung that fence last month. But the trouble is... Look, that we... look yonder, Mr. Dillon. Huh? Must be 50 or 60 riders facing each other across that fence. Yeah. Looks like a couple of armies. Well, it wouldn't be the first range war that started over water rights. Come on. Come on. Who says so, mister? I do. Who are you? Dillon, U.S. Marshal out of Dodge. Marshal, that man and his gang are threatening to break through my fences and trespass on my property. I demand the protection of the law. You get it, Howard. You the owner of this herd? That's right, Marshal. Jack Jackson from the Circle Z spread down in the Big Bend. Maybe you can make this fella see reason. I got a herd of cattle here that's dying like flies for lack of water. Over there, a hundred yards is plenty of water. Only a sneaking crook has fenced it in. How about it, Marshal? Well, it's his land, Jackson. The law gives him the right to fence it. Law? Right. Everything I got in the world's tied up in that herd. There's 25 trail riders there in the saddle I can't even pay wages to if I lose these cattle. Does the law pull pushing a man against the wall and wiping him out? It wasn't intended to. Howard! 
Why don't you ride up here to the fence and talk, huh? I show him, Marshal. No objections at all. It's my fence, ain't it? Well, nobody's doubting it. Now, look, is there any reason why you can't get together with this man and let him take that herd in and water it? I made him an offer. He turned An offer. A dollar a head a day for water or buy the herd himself for three dollars a head. Those are pretty stiff terms, Howard. Better than losing everything like he's going to do. Why, you dirty little... All right, hold it, both of you. Now, look, if there's any gunslinging starts, I'm going to be in on it, too, you understand? Howard, I just don't understand you. Most people out here on the frontier stick together when trouble starts. They don't kick a man when he's down. And they don't look on a drought or a blizzard as a chance to make a personal cleaning. Ah, just a minute, Dylan. You call yourself the law dodge. All right. Does the law say I can fence in my own land? It does. And never mind your opinions, Marshal. All I want out of you is enforcement of the law. All right, Howard, you'll get it. And that's all you'll get. Jackson, you better have your boys start the herd circling. This mean you're backing him up, Marshal? I'm backing up the law, that's all, Jackson. Then I don't think much of your laws up here. I only enforce them, I don't make them. Now, you better circle that herd. I say you better. I'm ordering my boys to shoot the first man of steel that comes through that fence. Chester, you cover Howard. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. And if he orders any of his men to fire a shot, kill him. Be a pleasure, Mr. Dillon. What's the idea, Marshal? You wanted the law enforced. All right, you're getting it. But I'm going to do the enforcing, Howard, not you. So if you're smart, you won't give any orders about shooting. All right, Mr. Dillon, you got a tough job. I guess you're trying to do it fair and square. Man does what he has to do, Jackson. I know. It's like with me. That herd of mine beds down without water. Most of them won't get off the ground in the morning. So law or no law, we're going through that fence tonight. Matt. Huh? Oh, hello, What's the matter? Bad liquor or a busted string? Oh, neither, neither. How are you? Eager. But you've probably noticed that before. Seriously, though, what's wrong? Plenty. One of the bloodiest little range wars you ever saw is just about to break. Out of Cottonwood Pond, I heard about it. Did you hear, too, that I'm back on the wrong side? Here, pull a stool up to the bar. Harry, a drink for Mr. Uh, Dillon. No, thanks. I can't stay, Kitty. I gotta try to round up some deputies. And try is probably about as far as I'm gonna get. Old Tom will be siding with the Texas boys against Howard. And against me. Maybe you ought to switch sides, Matt. Oh, sure, sure, I ought to. I know, but I can't. If I started making my own rules, it'd mean the end of law and order in Dodge City. Yeah, I just can't do it, Kitty. Much as I'd like to. Well, not for me to say. You're the one who Mr. has to Dillon? decide. Uh, yeah, Chester. What'd you find out? Mr. Hightower down at the railroad depot checked clear through to Topeka. They can't get enough cattle cars here to load that herd out before day after tomorrow. Well, that's that. It's an outside chance anyway. Yeah, I just can't do it, Kitty. Much as I'd like to. Well, not for me to say. You're the one who Mr. has to Dillon? decide. Uh, yeah, Chester. What'd you find out? Mr. Hightower down at the railroad depot checked clear through to Topeka. They can't get enough cattle cars here to load that herd out before day after tomorrow. Well, that's that. It's an outside chance, anyway. I thought we might load them up fast, Kitty, and run them up to Walnut Creek. It's still got a little water in it. But I... Matt, there's something wrong with a law that upholds a low-down scheme like this. Well, what Howard's doing is wrong morally, but it's right legally. I gotta find a legal way to stop him. How about a lawyer could find a way of some kind? Too bad this town doesn't have one. Oh, heaven forbid. Just the same matter. Dylan? Yeah, what is it? My name's Fenton. I'm range boy. Yeah, I know. You work for Dyke Howard. Well, what's on your mind? Well, Mr. Howard figures you ought to be arranging to protect his property. Jackson gave me his word he'd lay off until nine tonight. His word, sure. 
But Mr. Howard figures it'd be a good idea if you deputize his riders. Benton, and... get up. Now, wait a second, Martin. Go on, get up. When I want Howard's advice, I'll ask for it. Now go tell him that. Well, yeah, but go on, get up, move. Deputize his riders. <laughs> sure, he'd like that. Well, it just may come to that, Mister Dillon. I couldn't get anybody yeah, else. Fellow. You know, I ought to throw this badge away and go out there and help Jackson cut that fence. Matt, I still think what you ought yeah, to do... Yeah, I know, I know. I ought to get a lawyer. Well... Well, Kitty, the only lawyer Dodge City ever saw was that young fellow from Boston who died here last year on his way... Hey. What is it, Matt? Chester, what happened to those books of his? Well, nobody never claimed them. They're still in the back of the jail there somewhere. It's oh, a long shot, but... <laughs> Kitty, I love you. Matt. Come on, Chester, let's find those books. Uh, I don't know, Chester. Take a man a year just to learn what these words mean. Well, I sure can't help you, Mr. Dillon. Looky there. Port, replevin, statutory malfeasance. Why don't they write the laws out in English? It'd be no work for lawyers. Then. The only thing that might do it is this one. I'm not too sure what it means. Uh, uh, evening, Matt. Oh, Doc, come on in here, will you? <laughs> Yeah, I figured I'd bring you a little courage for the battle. What? Uh, might be snakes out at Cottonwood Pond. <laughs> it's very thoughtful. <laughs> yes, sir. Calamel and Irish whiskey. No doctor west of the Mississippi ought to be without him. Uh, the calamel's for the woman, you understand? <laughs> yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Of course, a bottle of Jameson might not cure a patient, but it sure makes him enjoy his illness. <laughs> yeah. Look, uh, Doc, you've been to school. Uh, at least I guess you have. Oh, well, uh, I browsed through a couple. Well, listen to this now, and tell me what you think about this paragraph right here. Huh? Uh, this? Well, you see, a schedule of territorial ordinances and judicial precedents. Handbook for local administrators. Uh, well, I didn't go to law school, man. No, no, but you've read books, and you know big words. Now, now listen to this. The local administrator or other duly constituted authority in a territorial division is hereby empowered to declare a state of acute emergency in case of riot, rebellion, or any natural catastrophe which threatens a general welfare. Now, Doc, would you say I'm a duly constituted authority, huh? Well, Dodge City, I guess you're about the only authority. Yeah, now, now, would you say this drought we're having is a threat to the general welfare? Well, I've never seen a worse one, but... All right, I just now, listen understand. to this. Yeah? During the period of such emergency, the officer in charge is authorized to seize, confiscate, allocate, or otherwise administer critical materials and facilities in accordance with a common need and his own discretion. All right, Matt. Water is a material. Yeah. And as far as keeping cattle alive is concerned, Cottonwood Pond is a facility. <laughs> That's all I wanted to know. I don't see how it'll help you, though, Matt. Howard will never stand for it. You're still going to have a pitched battle on your hands. Maybe so, Doc. But at least I'll be fighting in the way I want to fight. Well, come on, Chester. Let's go. It's 8 o'clock. <laughs> We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, you personally can help to make sure America has an impregnable fence against invaders along all its borders by volunteering as a ground observer to watch the skies for unidentified planes. Men and women from teenage up, write or phone your nearest civil defense center. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Uh, 
That's dark now. Must be pushing nine o'clock. Hope they don't jump the gun on us, Chester. I figure Jackson will stick by his word, Mr. Dillon. If yeah, Howard lets him. You know, we might get a break in this drought if that storm comes this way. Now, I'd say it's only heat lightning. All thunder, no rain. Well, if it goes on a few more weeks, this prairie will be dried right down to the nub. Hold it. Hold it. Uh. Pull up them horses. He's right there by the fence, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I see him. Who's there? Well, speak up. I usually answer bushwhackers with a six gun. This is your lucky night, Fenton. Oh, the marshal, I, I didn't know. Where's your boss? All right here, Dillon. About time you got here. That mob may try to rush the fence any minute now. Not yet, Howard. I said nine o'clock. You've got five minutes yet. Come on over here, Jackson. I want you to hear this, too. I kind of wish you'd stayed out of it, Marshal. Rather not have fought against you. Never mind. Mr. Howard, by the authority vested in me as a U.S. Marshal, and under the territorial laws and ordinances of the United States, I'm hereby declaring a state of acute emergency due to the drought. What are you talking about, Dillon? The U.S. Territorial Ordinance Schedule of 1858, Section 721C. What are you trying to say? Just this. For the duration of the emergency, I am taking charge of Cottonwood Pond in the name of the United States government. And I'm allocating use of it to Mr. Jackson here to water his herd. Now, if you want to try to make a deal with him, you got five minutes before I cut the wire and open the fence. I've never bought water before, but I'll give you ten cents a head, Howard. How about it? I'll see you dead first. And I'll be struck dead myself before I see one head of your stock onto my property. Dylan, I don't know what's behind this move. Maybe you've sold out, made a deal of your own. Easy, Howard. If not that, then you've lost your money. Your five minutes are running out now. What are you going to do? Fight. What do you think I'm going to do? Going to resist the law? You call it the law? I don't. Dylan, I'm giving my boys orders to shoot any man who lays a hand on this fence. And that goes for you. Listen to me, Howard. You got a chance to do something that costs you nothing and means life or death to somebody else. And you're refusing to do it. Well, I'm sorry to see it that way. But in any case, this herd gets water. Maybe they will. All right, boys, you heard it. Keep that fence covered. If they want to fight, I'll get one. Jackson. I guess I'm going to need some deputies. Well, I got 25 men here, Marshal. They're yours if you want them. All right, boys. Will you all raise your right hands? Do you swear to uphold the Constitution, ordinances, and bylaws of the United States to the best of your ability, so help you? I do. All right, you're all temporary deputy marshals acting under my orders. Now bunch the cattle in this way and start them through the fence as soon as I open the wire. They won't need much starting, Marshal. They've been smelling that water for hours. Now, don't shoot unless you're fired on. If you are, protect yourselves and your herd. All right, let's go. Hey, Gus! Keep those flankers closing them in toward the opening here. They crawl on that fence, they'll cut themselves to ribbon. All right, Marsh. Over this way, Chester, way. come here, man. Yes, you got the wire cutters? Here you are, Mr. Dillon. You know, I think we got a fight on our hands. Yeah, I guess. All right, keep me covered. I'll watch the left over here. All right, Mr. Jackson. Well, there's one strand left. There's up the fence, Mr. Howard. All right, fire at the flash, Chester. Yes, sir. Oh, my gracious, I wish there was a moon. There's one more strand. I spotted him. And here's the last one. All right, boys, the fence is open. Bring him through. Come on, throw, boy. Heads up, Chester. They won't give in this season. Yeah, you can hear them out there, but you can't see for the dust. Yeah. Wind's coming up off that cloud. Oh, come on. Let's try to find Howard. I'm going to take him in for attempted murder. The last time I heard him, he was down along the fence here, Summers. All right, boys! Fire the grass! 
What's it? You don't look! Look at them torches, Mr. Dillon. They're setting fire in the grass. Yeah. As dry as it is, they'll start the whole prairie blazing. Jackson! Get your herd through the fence. They're trying to stampede it. It'll take more than fire to turn those cattle away from water. I guess you're right. Look, send as many as your boys as you can to help me. We got to get that fire stopped and fast. <laughs> Well, if that backfire holds that we're... We're winning, Chester. Otherwise... Couldn't have been a worse time. The prairie's dry as gunpowder. Well, at least the herd's safe. They wouldn't leave that pond if the whole world caught fire. Any orders for the boys, Mr. Dillon? Uh, yeah, just have them keep working along the edge of the backfire, Pecos. Beat out any sparks that get across. Huh? Right, Marshal, I got you. Uh, have you seen anything of the Howard gang? Oh, not a sign. I guess they figured they'd done all they could. Yeah, maybe. Mr. Dillon, I'd swear a storm's gonna break. I, I can halfway smell the rain. I don't know about that, Chester. But it's doing one thing that won't help us. What do you mean? Look, the wind's shifting. It's starting to drive those flames across the backfire. Well, if it catches air again, it'll get clear away from yeah, us. Yeah, it sure will. Now, come on. Let's grab some of the boys and start working behind it. Yes, Let's go, Dylan. Uh, well, Fenton, I figured you'd be halfway to the Mexican border by now. Well, you figured wrong. You keep your hands still, both of you. One move and it's your last move. That's about the way you planned it anyway, isn't it? You wiped us out, Dylan. That backfire of yours took the ranch house and the barns. Nothing for us to do now but trip. Only first, I'm going to you. Hit the dirt, Chester. Patton, drop the gun. You're under arrest. I'll drop it, you dirt. Dylan. Dylan, I... Well, you warned him, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it doesn't matter much now. Look, Chester. Yes, sir. It, it's jumped the backfire. With that wind driving it, it'll burn the whole prairie from here clear to the river. And Dodge City along with it. Not a way in the world of stopping it either. Where's the shot, Marshal? You all right? I'm sick at my stomach, that's all. Dodge City's gonna burn, Jackson, and there's nothing we can do. I sure didn't figure on this. I'll let him have the herd, gladly. No, it's my fault. I should have jumped him first. A man does what he has to, Marshal. I don't think that's your way. Well, maybe my way's the wrong way. When it leads to burning 10,000 acres of prairie in a whole town, there must be something wrong. Wait, Mr. Dillon. What is it, Chester? I told you, I I told you I could smell it. Smell what? What the devil he... Rain! Yes, sir. By heavens, it's starting to rain. By heaven may be the right expression. (laughs) Well, I don't know about that, but I know it's the only thing that can save Dodge. (laughs) Well, come on, rain. Faster. Cut loose and rain, will you? What you doing in this? Mr. Dillon, look at it. Down on that fire. <laughs> rain. Chester, you know, out here on the frontier sometimes, when, when a thing like this happens, it makes you wonder if, if maybe... Well, I don't know. Come on, Chester, let's find our horses. It, it sure not letting up any, Mr. Dillon. No. We're still quite a ways from Tom. Uh... Let's swing over along the bluff, Chester, and find a place to wait it out for a while, huh? That's what I was hoping you'd say. Come on. Well, it took a long time to break loose, but it's sure making up for luck. Wow! I never saw lightning this before. Uh, uh, usually, lets up once the rain starts. I guess it's just a freak storm anyway. <laughs> Off your horse, Chester. Flat on the ground. Now. I saw the flash, Mr. Dillon. It come from that lone cottonwood tree. Yeah. It's a bad spot. He's got cover and we haven't. Well, I guess we found out what happened to Mr. Howard. All right, Howard. 
Come out with your hands up. You're under arrest. Why don't you come and get it, Dylan? I'm going to flip a shot at the tree, Chester. Roll away as soon as I fire. Yes. All right. Now. Smart, Dylan. But not smart enough. That was close. There's enough light for him to see. He's got all the odds. If he keeps it up, he'll get us sure. Maybe we might just as well rush him, Mr. Dillon. We haven't got much to lose. That's an outside chance, Chester. That he's bound to get one of us. Yeah, but this way it's both. Yeah, I know. All right. We'll go in on the count of three. And out and move fast. Yes, sir. And, uh... Good luck, Chester. Same to you, Mr. Dillon. All right. One, two, three. Mr. Dillon, what happened? It was lightning. He struck the tree. I think Howard's lying over there on the ground. Come on. He's down, all right. He said he'd be struck dead before he'd ever give in. Well, he was. By heaven, I don't know. The second time tonight. <laughs> you know, Chester, I think I'm going to change my ways. Smoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell and Lou Krugman, with Joe Duvall, Barney Phillips, and Georgia Ellis. Harley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNair is Doc. Join us again next week. As Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gun Smoke. <laughs> Crime afoot, look for Gangbusters. Tonight, listen for CBS Radio's Gangbusters. City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Chester, tum, do you have to do that? You're just stirring up a lot of dust. Well, <coughs> cleanliness is next to godliness, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I know, I know, Chester, but all you're doing is getting it off the floor into the air. Man can hardly breathe in here. 
All right, Mr. Dillon. Uh, I'll do my sweeping later. Yeah, good. Uh, my mother taught me that, Mr. Dillon. Taught you what, Chester? That cleanliness is next to godliness. She was a fine woman, too. Oh, look, Chester, it's a good saying, and it's probably true, and I got nothing against your mother except that she also should have taught you how to sweep. Well, maybe she just didn't have the time, Mr. Dillon. You see, there was an awful lot of us, and oh, what with chores Madge. and... Oh, hello, Doc. Uh, come on, now. I'll buy you a drink. Uh, what? Doc said he'd buy you a drink, Mr. Dillon. He really said that? You coming? <laughs> Doc, you got to quit throwing your money around the way you do. Uh, maybe you don't need a drink. Uh, no, wait a minute, Doc. I, I'm with you. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you all about it when I get back, Chester. I'd be mighty interested, Mr. Dillon. Oh, I sure be glad when it gets winter again. Why, Doc? You'll just complain about the cold, then. Oh, uh, I suppose. You go sit with Kitty, Matt. I'll bring a bottle of Irish in. Okay, Doc. Uh, hello, Kitty. Hello, Matt. What are you and Doc up to? Yeah, he wants someone to talk to, so he picked me. <laughs> and you. Fine. I'm a good listener. <laughs> Lots of practice. <laughs> You like Jameson's, don't you, Kitty? Sure, Doc. What are we celebrating? Uh, let's see here. We'll drink to a fellow that you don't know. Uh huh? Cain Vestal. Well, here's to him. Yeah. Here's to him. <coughs> yes, he'll be dead in a couple of months. What? That's what I told him. <coughs> What do you mean, Doc? Well, I'm not the only one who's told him that. I'm just the last. Well, who is this Cain Vestal, Doc? Oh, it's just a fella. Came in on the train last night, leaving for Arizona tomorrow. Huh? That's where he's going to die, in Arizona. He's a musician. He plays the guitar, he tells me. Well, how's he going to die? Consumption. He's got it bad. I'm the last doctor he's going to ask about it, he says. Uh. Poor fella. Yeah, it's a climate out there, keep him going for a little while longer. And, uh, oh, I don't know. He's he's such a sad man for some reason. Well, who wouldn't be, Doc? No, 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 Kitty. I think Kane's been sad for a long, long time. He's a very nice fellow, too. Nothing can help him, huh? No, nothing. You know, it's a funny thing, Doc. I was just sitting here thinking... Sometimes you have to tell men they're going to die. Sometimes I have to. Yeah, that's right. Oh, let me see. Uh, there is. See that fellow with the car there? He just came in. No. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I don't think he knows anyone around here. You mind if I ask him over? Well, oh, sure. You'd party, Doc. Oh, good. Uh, uh, Kane? Uh, Kane? Uh, over here? Yeah. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> well, ah, uh, sit down, sit down. Kane, this is Kitty. Uh, hello, Kane. This is Kitty. <laughs> this is Marshal Dillon. Hello, Marshal. Pleasure to meet you. Just a minute, yeah, sit down. There we are, have a drink. Oh, thank you, Doc. Uh, this your first trip west, Kane? Yes, Marshal, it is. Oh, well, where are you from? Why, no place in particular, Miss Kitty. I seem to spend most of my life on the Mississippi River. Oh, I, I thought you were a musician. I am. I was hired to ride the river boats and play my guitar for the passengers. Oh. <laughs> well, at least you've had a constant change of scenery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After 20 years of going up and down that river, it got pretty familiar, Marshal. <laughs> well, Kane, I knew a young fellow back in St. Louis for the war, and he was learning to be a river pilot. <laughs> Say, I wonder if you ever ran into him, name of Clemens, Sam Clemens? No, Doc, I don't believe I did. Oh, he was a very amusing fella. He was just chock full of stories. Um, you leaving Dodge tomorrow, Kane? I'm headed for Arizona, Miss Kitty. No reflection on Dodge, though. <laughs> uh. 
Uh, if you hit a place out there called Tombstone, I uh, wish you'd look up Virgil Earp for me. Uh, tell him I sent you, huh? Thanks, Marshal. I'll do that. Say, Kane, I wonder, uh, could I ask you a favor? Why, certainly, Miss Kitty, anything at all. Well, would you play something for us? I had an idea that's what it'd be. <laughs> anything in particular? Oh, play something you like, Kane. Another girl I knew used to like this one. going to stay here a while. Maybe you can teach me to play like that, huh? It'd be a pleasure, Miss Kitty. But I'm afraid I won't be around for long. Morning, Mr. Dillon. It's, uh, noon, Chester. Yes, sir, I know, but you went off with Doc yesterday, so I figured I had a little time coming today. Well, that depends on how you spent it. Now, if you've been gambling, oh, I am... now, Mr. Dillon, you know I never gamble. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. I, I, I was out helping a fellow learn to shoot a six-gun, that's all. Now? You mean there's a man in Dodge who doesn't know how? This fellow don't. Never had one in his hand before. He's a musician. What? It plays the guitar, he told me. You mean Kane? Uh, Kane Vestal? Yeah, so that's his name. Nice a fellow as you'd ever want to meet. Yeah. But he was supposed to leave on the stage this morning. And what's he done with his six-gun anyway? Well, I don't know, Mr. Dillon. He just come by here early this morning and asked me if I'd teach him. Yeah. Now, where'd he get the gun? Said he'd just bought it. Anything wrong, Mr. Dillon? No, no. It just doesn't add up somehow, that's so. all. Oh, well, he won't cause any trouble. He's not the sort... You never know, Chester. Mm, no, sir. And my kitty looks pretty this morning. She's got a yellow parasol, Mr. Dillon. Kitty? Oh, I, I think I'll go see her for a minute. Uh, I'll be right back, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Kitty? Uh. Hello, Matt. <laughs> Kitty, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Oh, sure. What is it? Uh, I'm curious about something, Kitty. Maybe you can help me. Maybe. How long was Kane Vessel with you yesterday? Kane? Oh, well, he didn't leave till evening. Why? Well, he didn't go out on the stage this morning, and he's bought himself a six-gun. You, you any idea why? A gun? Huh? Doesn't sound like Kane. Anything happened yesterday, Kitty, or did he tell you anything? Oh, yeah, might... there was one thing, Matt. Joel Adams and a couple of his men came in. Yeah. Kane got pretty upset when he saw him had a bad coughing spell. Oh? Uh -huh. Later, he asked a lot of questions about Adams. Well, what'd you tell him? 
just that Adams is a big landowner around here that nobody who isn't working for him likes him very much. That's all I know, anyway. Yeah. Uh, they didn't talk, Adams and Kane. No. I don't think they even know each other. Well, anyway, he sure isn't the sort to be packing a gun. Well, you'll just get into trouble, Matt. Yeah. Uh, where's he staying, did he say? Dodge house, I think. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kitty. I'll see you later. Come in. Hello, Kane. Well, I'm Marshal Dillon. Come in, come in. Ah, thank you. <clears throat> what can I do for you, Marshal? I, uh, I thought you were leaving Dodge on the stage this morning. Well, I was, Marshal, but I changed my mind. You know how it is. Sure, Kane, sure. Now, we're glad to have you around. I, uh, I'm just curious, though. You're, uh... Stay and have anything to do with that gun you bought this morning? Oh, Chester told you. I thought he would. He's a good teacher, Marshal. <laughs> yeah. But that doesn't answer my question. Do I have to answer it? I'm just trying to help you, that's all. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Marshal, but... I'm afraid there's nothing you can do. Look, Kane, you're new in this country... A man like you just can't pick up a six-gun and call himself a fighting man. Not and expect to live through it. I certainly lay no claim to be a fighting man. Well, then why did you buy that gun? There's no law out here against a man having a gun, is there, Marshal? No. But any man who carries one is expected to use it when the time comes. You'd be a lot safer without one. Being safe doesn't mean a whole lot to me, Marshal. Not now. Yeah, I... I know. Doc told me. What's it all about? It's a long story. And an old one, I suppose. I'd really rather not talk about it. Well, I can't force you to. But, but tell me this. Does it have anything to do with Joel Adams... Yes, it does, Marshal. I'm going to kill him. When? I don't know. Anytime. Well, why? That's a long story, I imagine. All right, Kane. But if you try to face him, he'll kill you before you got that gun halfway out of your belt. And if you shoot him any other way, you'll hang for it. You've forgotten something, Marshal. What? No matter what I do, I'm going to die soon anyway. A month or two isn't going to make any difference. You hate Adams that much? I wouldn't kill a man I didn't hate, would I? I didn't think you were the sort of man who'd kill anyone. Only Joel Adams, Marshal. Then I got to warn him about you. Well, I understand, Marshal. It's all right. He doesn't know me anyway. Never even saw me before. But you want to kill him? Yes, sir. Well, I'll take your gun away from you, but you just find another one. And I can't arrest you unless I catch you trying to bushwhack him. I'm sorry for the trouble I'm causing you, Marshal. You know, I've never had to deal with a man like you before, Kane. Maybe I ought to just tie you up and throw you on that stage. You could. But I'd just come right back. <sighs> yeah, I guess you would. I'm sorry this has to happen here in Dodge, Marshal. Then why don't you leave? I guess I hate Joel Adams too much. All right, Kane, I'm through trying to convince you. So long. Goodbye, Marshal.
I never heard of Kane Vestal, Marshal, and I never saw him before last night. You must have known him somewhere, Adams. You're trying to make me out a liar, Marshal. I'm trying to save Kane's life and yours, maybe. Oh, he ain't gonna shoot me. I'll kill him first time he looks sideways. Maybe you won't see him. Oh, shoot me in the back, eh? Well, in that case, it... In that case, what? Why, nothing, Dylan, nothing. Forget it. If Kane's shot in the back, you'll be the first man I take in, Adam. I don't even know him. Why should I shoot him? I'm only warning you. Well, just leave me be, Marshal. I can take care of myself. See that you do, Adams, and only yourself. Why, sure, Marshal. Only I don't much like the idea of some stranger gunning for me. Makes me sort of uneasy. There must be some reason for it. Don't start it again, Marshal. There ain't no reason. I know. You've led a blameless life. You never hurt anyone. I you, told Adam? you twice. There are men around here who'd shoot you on sight if they thought they could get by with it. I don't think you are ever any good, Adam, so don't tell me a Kane's got no reason. I don't You're believe it. You're pushing me now, Marshal. I'm tired of your talk, that's all. Maybe it's true you don't know him, but he sure knows something about you. Well, then he'll wish you didn't. That's all I got to say. Well, just keep out of his way. Give it a little time, and maybe there won't be any killing at all. Why, sure, sure. All the time in the world. All right, Adams. I've done all I can. Just don't worry about me. I'm not. Then goodbye, Marshal. Goodbye. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first... Back tomorrow night. Pull up your chair, or better still, roll back your rug. It's the Vaughn Monroe Show returning to the star's address. Listen for Vaughn, the Moon Maids, the Moon Men, and their wonderful way with popular music and songs. Once again at their old familiar Saturday night time on CBS Radio. Remember, they're coming back tomorrow night. You and the whole family are invited to this season's scintillating premiere of the Vaughn Monroe Show on most of these same stations. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. quiet around town tonight, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. There's a trail herd due in in a couple of days. I suppose business will pick up then. Mm. You'd think those cowboys be too tuckered out after a ride like that to have any juice left in them at all, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> yeah, they're too poor to cut loose any other time. Well, that don't stop them down in Texas, Mr. Dillon. No? No. It's just like an uncle of mine back in Waco. He was poor, oh, he was mean poor. But he always said the only good money was was to have fun with. Oh, did he have fun? But no, sir. He was too poor, like I said. <laughs> all right, Chester, all right. All I ask is that you don't try to explain it to me. Well, but there's nothing to explain, Mr. Dillon. It, it's just uh, it's just that he was the Chester. one poorest Chester. man who'd ever... Oh, uh, Marshal, say, you want to talk to Kane Vestal? What? Uh, Kane is upstairs in my office. He been shot? No, no, not shot. Beat up. Well, how is he, Doc? Well, he's not too bad. A couple of cowboys found him just outside of town. They heard a shot and said two men rolled off before they could stop them. Yeah? And I guess who, whoever it was, they didn't have time to finish the job. They just got started working on him. So Adams made the first move, huh? Um, uh, I'll be back soon, Chester. Yes, yeah, sir, Mr. Dillon. <clears throat> They hit him on the head with a gun butt and scratched him up some. Outside of that, he's fine. And it's still a soil even if they didn't kill him, Doc. Yeah, I suppose it is. Anyway, they took a shot at him when they heard those riders coming along. Went right through his coat. Yeah. They probably think he's dead. So that's where you went, Doc. I might have known. Didn't even give you a chance to use that gun, did he, Kane? I didn't have a gun on me, Marshal, but it wasn't he. It was they. Huh? Do you recognize them? Well, I don't know many people around here. You 
know Joel Adams, so, so you told me. It wasn't Adam. Could you pick him out if you saw him again? No, Mark. Marshal, I don't believe I could. Where were you when they grabbed you, Kate? End of Front Street. I was taking a walk after supper. They rode up behind me, one on each side, lifted me up, and mm -hmm. carried me out of town a ways. You must have got a good look at them, at least when they got off their horses. It was too dark, Marshal. Yeah. Doc, how long has he been here? Oh, about half an hour, Marshal. Why? Those cowboys who saw you came, they brought you right in here, didn't they? Yes. So it was maybe an hour ago when those two men hauled you out of town? It was plenty light enough then. Was it, Marshal? You're gonna fight it yourself, aren't you? Yes, Marshal, it... <laughs> It's my affair. It was, Kane, but you've been assaulted and shot at, so it's the law's business now. I won't prefer any charges, Marshal. You don't have to. I've seen you, and I know who did it, or who hired it done, as well as you oh, do. Please, Marshal, I got to handle this my own way. There's a law that says you can't murder a man, Kane, and the same law says he can't murder you. Are you so full of hate you can't get that through your head? I guess that's it, Marshal. All right, Kane. You know what you have to do. So will I. I've been looking for you. That's late, Dylan. Can't you see me tomorrow? It's not even midnight. That's early for you. <laughs> you see how this marshal's always trying to get me on the prod, boys? That's right. These boys of yours play pretty rough themselves, Adams. Meaning? Didn't they tell you? Tell me what? What they did to Kane Vestal? They did not kill Kane Vestal, and you can't prove it. No, Adams, I can't. Kane isn't even dead. What? You know, I'm curious, Adams. Why'd you think he might be? Why, why, uh, somebody said he got himself hurt. Joel Adams. You arranged this, Marshal? You know I didn't. Who is he? What does he want? Hello, Joel Adams. Don't strain yourself so you don't know me. Who are you? Kane Vestal. But my name doesn't matter. What are you haunting me for? I never saw you before in my life. That's true. You didn't. But we had a friend in common once. A friend? Who? Julie Travis. What about Julie? You were a riverboat gambler then, Adams, and you had money and fine clothes and a way with women, especially young girls. Julie was only 16 at the time. Never mind all that. So she went away with you to be married, you told her. Oh. <laughs> I think I guessed the rest. You wanted to marry her, but I got her instead. Is that it? That's it, Adams. <laughs> That's exactly it. Oh, now I thought you really had something on your mind, Vestal. Well, all right, why don't you get out of here and quit bothering people while you can still walk? Julie... Killed herself, Adam. She committed suicide. What? You didn't know that, did you? Well, it's got nothing to do with me. Because you never married her after all. It was just a year after you abandoned her in New Orleans. I think it has a lot to do with you, Joel Adams. What are your plans, mister? I see you got a gun in your belt. Gonna kill you. Or so? When? Now? Right now. All right, Vestal, draw. Leave the gun where it is, Kane. One thing I always promised myself, Adams, is someday I'd spit in your face. Why, you... <laughs> Give me the gun, Adams. He's dead. Well, he was going to kill me. You heard him. 
He wanted you dead, Adams, any way he could manage. I know it. That's what I say. You're under arrest for murder. For... What? It was a gunfight. He never even moved for his gun. Well, then I'll hang for this. He couldn't have got me any other way. No, don't suppose he could have. I remember the river gamblers used to say, don't matter how you win so long as you win. That Kane should have been a gambler. Maybe he was. Come on, let's go. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell with Georgia Ellis and Larry Dobkin. Polly Bayer is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc. Clancy Cassell speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Goes back this Sunday night. Edgar Bergen and company and Eve Arden is our Miss Brooks. Yes, it's the Bergen and McCarthy Show with Mortimer Snurd, Podine Puffington, Effie Klinker, Ray Noble's Orchestra and guest stars. Back Sunday nights at the Star's Address starting this weekend. Returning the same night is our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden as an English teacher ever seeking her special degree in romance. For a comedy galore, enjoy Bergen and McCarthy and our Miss Brooks on most of these same stations. Back this Sunday night presented by CBS Radio. This is Amos, but my real name is Freeman Gosden. I urge you to vote. And as Amos would say, follow the election returns on the CBS radio network. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Smoke, starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Morning, Miss Adam, eh? 
Hi, Marshal. Good morning, John. Hey, Matt. <laughs> Wait a second. What? Oh, oh. hi, you dog. Oh, on my way over to jail. After you. Oh? You heard about the Longhorn? No, what about it? Uh, you haven't heard, or you wouldn't ask. Well, heard what, Doc? Well, um, uh, I'll walk along with you if you're heading that way. Well, as a matter of fact, I was heading that way. Hey, what's all that crowd out in front there for? <laughs> in due time, Matt. In due time. <laughs> you know, Doc, there's only one thing that makes you happier than having a secret, and that's to collect your coroner's fee. Yeah. Might get a fee out of this, too, Ford Silver. <clears throat> uh, no wonder you're all worked up. Hey, have you, have you heard about the Longhorn? It's the dog on the thing. It's your Longhorn. Dog on the thing I ever come across. Morning, Mr. Dillon. Uh, oh, oh, hi, Chester. Say, so you heard about the Longhorn? No. No, Chester, I have not heard about the Longhorn. What? He's upset, Chester. He's the only man in Dodge who hasn't heard. Looks so help me, Doc, if this is one of your practical jokes. No, 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 no. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> You'll see. Uh, will you pardon me, ma'am? Let him through. Uh, pardon me, please. Let me through. Excuse me. Well, Mr. Dillon? What do you think of it, Matt? Aside from the misspelled words. A longhorn been closed all morning? Yep. Locked tight. That sign was on the door daylight. A longhorn saloon will open at 8 o'clock tonight with new management and a new policy. Everybody welcome. Signed the new manager, Mamie. <laughs> Mamie? That's a woman, Matt. Lately of Kansas City, St. Louis, and Points East. Well, I don't know, Mr. Dillon. My, we never had a woman running a saloon in Dodge City before. And we won't now, Chester. The boys won't let her last an hour, I'm afraid. <laughs> be kind of fun for that hour, though. And another thing, if this Mamie is the new manager, what's happened to Herman Bleeker? Well, I don't know. He must have sold it to her. He didn't say anything about it yesterday morning. That's right. I saw him over at the liver stable in the afternoon, showing off one of them fancy vests he's always ordering. And he never said one word about it. Well, you know that little poppin' Jay. He's flighty. Probably happened sudden. Uh, too sudden, Doc. Even for Herman. Say, come think of it. I haven't seen him all morning. And he's usually strutting up and down front street, preening himself like a powder pigeon. Mm, yeah. He's probably upstairs there, sleeping in, getting ready for the opening tonight. We gonna be here, Mr. Dillon? Maybe, huh? Mr. Dillon? Huh? Oh, yeah, Chester. We're going to be here. <laughs> I'm sorry, boys, but she's upstairs. Said she'd be down about 8 o'clock, and that's all I know about it. Now, if you want to order anything, let's hear it. And if you don't, just shut up. Say, the boys are acting kind of rambunctious, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, she'll sure wish she stayed in St. Louis on the points east. Say, Matt, Matt, I, I was talking to the bartender. I asked him what she looks like, and he said if he told me, I wouldn't believe it. Now, the fellow I'd like to talk to is Herman Bleeker. Yeah, well, nobody's seen hiding ahead of him. You know, Matt, uh, I'm beginning to wonder, too. Howdy, stranger. Hey, what? Welcome to the Longhorn. I'm Mamie, the new owner. Uh, Mamie? She said, My gracious sakes alive. 190 pounds if she weighs an ounce. Yeah, the bartender was right. I wouldn't have believed it. Boys, looks like we're going to be doing business together, so let's get things straight right in the beginning. Now, in the first place, the minute you stick your foot inside that door, you're on my stomping ground. I'm the boss of this shebang, and don't you ever forget it. When I tell anybody to hop, he hops. Is that clear? <laughs> now, I tell you what, I aim to give the squarest deal in town. All the liquor here is going to be aged over 30 days. And the dancing girls aged under 30 years. <laughs> the liquor is straight, and the girls are graceful. 
There's only four aces in every deck, and the cards only read from the front side. Talks to you. You'll much. get a yeah. fair shake for your money, yeah. but there ain't gonna be no fandango. Dingle, dingle, and another thing, yeah. Mister, yeah. I'm talking. Well, so am I, old battleaxe. Excuse me, boys. Oh, looks like it started, Mister Dillon. Yeah, wait a second. He paid for his drink. Yes, ma'am. All right, you walleye little maverick. Come on. <laughs> boys I just won't stand for no fan dangling now maybe some of you figured I was wearing this six shooter for a decoration when I just cast your eyes on that ace of spades I got tacked up on the back wall now what did you see for the land sakes did you see that draw Mr. Dillon yeah and she got the card too <laughs> oh the boys won't give her no trouble man Boys, the first one's on the house, right. and it's the last free one you'll get. And the only credit I give is for funeral expenses. Belly up, boys! Well, sir, Mr. Dillon? Chester, I want to talk to Herman Bleeker more than ever now. Say, hey, you know, she's big enough to... Uh, well, I'll bet she forced Herman to sell. Yeah, maybe. Doc, I'll be right back. I, uh, I want to talk to her. Oh, that you was nothing, boys. Oh, you're the marshal, huh? Uh, yeah, that's right, ma'am. My name's Dillon. Proud to shake your hand, Mr. Dillon. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Miss Mamie. <laughs> Welcome to Dodge City. Mighty decent of you to express the sentiment, Marshal. I reckon you won't get much business around the Longhorn. I'll take care of any trouble that's around here. Uh, it'd be quite a change. The boys used to push Bleeker around every now and then. Oh, now. that runty little prairie dog. I, uh, I didn't know he was planning to sell, Miss Mamie. He must have made up his mind in a hurry. Yeah? I made him an offer and he took it. Just like that. Uh, he found himself some new living quarters, I suppose. Oh, yeah. He moved right out last night. Oh. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I wonder where he's holed up. Huh? There are a couple of things I'd like to see him about. Well, now, uh, I tell you, I'm afraid he left town, Mr. Dillon. I think he said something about taking the Santa Fe to St. Louis now that I remember. Oh, I, I see, I see. Well, that, that's too bad. I, I'd sure like to have seen him. Uh, well, I'll probably drop in now and then, Miss Mamie. Sure! Anytime, Marshal. For you, it's on the house! <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. What'd you find out, Mr. Dillon? Let's get out of here, Chester. Come and Doc. Yeah, sure. Oh, yes, with both ears a flapping. <laughs> well, boys, what do you think of her? Oh, my gracious, Mr. Dillon, I sure would hate to meet her in the dark. Oh, why, she's got a voice like a buffalo. Ain't it awful? It just itches your ears, don't it? Why, the woman's a human monstrosity. I still haven't seen Herman. Huh. What'd she say, man? She says she thinks he left town. Oh, she Chester, says he... I want you to check all the rooming houses and hotels along Front Street. I'm going to go to the railroad station and the stage lines. I'll meet you over at the jail. Huh? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Say, Matt. I think Herman keeps a horse over the Liberty Stable. Yeah, I, I thought of that, Doc. I wonder, would, would you be good enough to look into that for Why, me? Why, sure, be happy to. You know, Mr. Dillon, she is an awful straight shot. Yeah, Chester. I know. You here, Matt? Oh, uh, yeah. Come on in, Doc. Ah, uh, well, his horse is still over at the stable. He didn't tell them anything about leaving. He didn't leave, Doc. Mamie came in on the 9 o'clock train last night. Only one train out after that around midnight. He wasn't on it. 
And he didn't buy a ticket on the stage, uh, either. Uh, 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 yes, you know, what did I tell you? Matt, that settles it. Yeah, of course he may have moved into one of the hotels. No, sir, Mr. Dillon, I'm afraid he didn't. Oh, uh, well, what'd you find out, Chester? That nobody in this town has seen Herman Bleeker since around 9 o'clock last night. Matt, I knew I'd get me a fee out of this, one way or the other. Well, don't spend it yet, Doc. <coughs> what? Buenos noches, senores. Oh, Manuel. Um, come on in. Come Gracias, on in. senor Dillon. Well, what's on your mind? Pues, senor, I was at the railroad depot when I hear you ask about the little one, uh, el senor Bleeker. No. And the other, the senora. Oh, there is much woman on that one. <laughs> well, there's no argument there, Manuel. Senor, last night I have seen something which is strange. No? I am come home very late, uh, one hour, two hour before dawn. Uh, I was visit a friend, you understand? Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand. You see, I am walk home in much hurry, and it is very dark, senor, when at once I see this lantern in the arroyo behind the Longhorn Cantina. Oh, a, a lantern, you say? I am think, what is this? So I wait, and this lantern is come toward me and when it is close oh this woman who i have no see one like her oh what a scare well, what was she doing in the arroyo i do not know but but is one thing i forget she has carried something in her hand well what was it manuel a shovel senor <laughs> Find anything, Matt? Well, there's something here, Doc. But I can't quite... Hold the lantern over here, will you, Chester? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. I found something here. If I can just... Just get it loose. Lantern all right, Mr. Dillon? C can you see what it is? Uh, yeah, it's, it's fine, Chester. Yeah, I got it. Oh. It's a boot. Yeah, here... Here's the other one. Yeah. Well, all that fancy stitching. Matt, those are his. I've seen them on him. Yeah, so have I, Doc. Yesterday, in fact. Here, take him, Chester. Yes, sir. There's a bundle of some kind here. Oh, you found the body, huh? No, it's it's clothes, I think, Doc. Let's have a look. Yeah. That's all there is, too. The hole doesn't go any deeper. That's hard pan on the bottom there. Hold the lantern down, Chester, and let me right. let me get this unwrapped. I'm not so sure about that coat, Mr. Dillon. A lot of them like that around town. Yeah, I know, but take a look at this fancy vest. Oh, that's Herman's. Nobody else in Dodge City would ever wear a thing like that. Well, from the looks of it, he won't be wearing it again. <laughs> We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, the escape car speeds from the scene of the crime, and the victim notes its license number. Police investigating the case discover the car has an ironclad alibi. That just begins the excitement on tomorrow night's Gangbusters program. It's the case of the twice-parked car, an authentic crime story taken from actual police records. Don't miss Gangbusters, presented by CBS Radio tomorrow night over most of these same stations. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. How you coming, Doc? You know, don't rush me, Matt. Don't rush me. 
I haven't made one of these blood tests in years. <laughs> if you ask me, I don't see any use in making one now. <laughs> well, let me see. Pour the precipitate into here. What other kind of blood could it be except human? Doc, I only want to be sure, that's all. All right, all right. Uh, let me see. Five drops of the sulfate. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, you sure look uncomfortable, Matt. <laughs> well, how would you like to try arresting that lady, Doc? Not my job to arrest her. <laughs> All I'm doing is stopping up these loopholes Matt's trying to wiggle out of. <laughs> well, that's real decent of you, Doc. Real decent. <laughs> no, sir, Matt, I don't recall you ever being in such a predicament. Oh, of course, I remember the night you shot it out with the Barkley boys over in the Alafaganza. There were three of them. And you did not turn a hair. <laughs> and then that other time when you got dry gulched by the Platte River gang. All right, Doc. You? All right, all right. But this is different. If I go to arrest that woman, she's just crazy enough to start a gunfight. Oh, it's a problem. It's a problem, all right. Now, let's see. We'll just shake this up and warm it a bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, there is one thing, though, Mr. Dillon. Shooting at a mark's not the same as a gunfight. Maybe she wouldn't even resist. Do you really believe that, Chester? No, sir. Oh, she ain't a woman. She's a human catastrophe. <laughs> she sure is from that. <laughs> well, there's still a chance we may be going off half-cocked here. That blood could have got on Herman's vest a dozen different ways. Well, we'll soon see. Uh, we'll see now. A couple of drops of reagent. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, yeah. And we'll look for the color change. So, turn up the lamp a little bit, will you, Chester? Uh, all right, Doc. Oh. Well. <laughs> My, mm-hmm. Yes. Well, Doc? Well, it's tough luck, Matt. <laughs> it's human blood. Hey, Matt, I thought we was going over to the Longhorn and talk to Mamie. I'll come to jail. Yeah, she'll keep, Doc. She's not going anywhere. Yeah, uh, looks cut and dried to me, Matt. It might not if you were in my shoes. Uh, come on in, boys. You know, Mr. Dillon, when I talked to the barkeep, Finnegan, he said that when he showed up this morning to open the saloon, that woman was already inside waiting for him. She told him to come back at 8 o'clock tonight. And he didn't see no sign of Herman Bleeker. Oh, well, there's another nail in your coffin, Matt. Doc, <laughs> if you keep this up, I'm going to deputize you and take you along with me. He, he sure can have my job, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> no, you don't. I will not lift a hand in anger against a woman. <laughs> Especially that woman. I keep thinking we could still be wrong. Oh, somehow. real diehard. Look, huh? now suppose Herman hurt himself some way. <laughs> How? And he wanted to get away by himself and... And, and recuperate. Where? And suppose he, he, he didn't want anybody to know about uh, it. Why? So he decided to stay with some friend. Who? And, well, maybe... Uh, come on, Chester, let's go. She is at the end of the bar. What are you going to do, Mr. Dillon? Take her in, Chester. Maybe she'll talk when she's arrested. i got to get that gun away from her some way. It's not going to be easy. And it's got to be done. I've never drawn a gun on a woman yet, and I'm not starting now. If I could just manage to... I don't know. There might be a chance. Stick close to me, Chester. Yes, Mr. Dillon. Well, Marshal... Mighty glad you dropped back in. I was just wondering how you were getting along, Miss Lee. Like a kid with two tongues and an all-day sucker. Say, now tell me, did you find that little weasel Herman Bleeker? I, uh, 
I thought you told me he'd left town. Oh, well, I was just guessing, Mr. Dillon. He said something about planning to. Here, step up and have a shot of poison. Uh, uh, no, no, thank you, thank you. As a matter of fact, I came back here for a particular purpose. Chester and I have a little bet on. Uh -huh. Mr. Dillon, we... Uh, what kind of a bet is it, Marshal? Well, it was uh, about that shooting trick of yours, hitting the center of that playing card, you know. Chester figures that it was a fluke of luck. He's betting me that you can't do it five times in a row. Well, we'll soon settle that. The card's still up there. Stand aside, boys! Maybe he's gonna limber up for shooting irons and get out of the way. Get down there, Curly! All right. There's one. Couple of them. You're doing fine so far. How are you doing down there, boys? All dead center so far. Say, uh, you there, whatever your name is, uh, what do you think of your bet now? Well, I, I, I guess I just kind of lost my head, Miss Mamie. <laughs> well, three down, two to go. There's four. And one more. Ah. Uh, Oh, yeah. Well, what are you stopping now for, man? Well, I got some uh, rules I go by, Marshal. One of them's never to fire my last shot and leave my gun empty. Yeah, I, I see. Well, I, th that's a pretty good idea, I guess. Sorry to lose your bet for you, Marshal. Well, uh, I, I'm convinced. Well, I guess that didn't quite... Uh, happen. Chester... <clears throat> uh, Miss Mamie, I, uh, I, I guess you're not a gambler yourself, huh? Who says so? I'll take a fair bet at even odds any day of the week and twice in Philadelphia. Well, in that case, I'll make you one. I got a pretty fair gun here. Or at least I thought so till I saw yours in action. Well, I'd say yours every bit as good as mine. Well, then how about a bet? Your gun against mine on a one-cut high card, huh? Well, now, how? I, I didn't... Of course, it's all right with me if you'd rather back out on it. Who's backing out? You got yourself a bet, Mr. Dillon. Finnegan, shuffle us a deck. Okay, Miss Mamie. It's a better a fight. Mamie never backs out. Uh, there you are, Miss Mamie. Now, who goes first, Mr. Dillon? <laughs> Ladies, always. All right. If you're a friend, Lester will cut him for us once. It, it's... Chester. Never Chester mind. Cut proud. the cards. Chester. Uh, ma'am. Now, let's see what we've got. Ah, Jack of Spades. That's not bad. Plenty good, Marshal. Plenty good enough to beat anything you could... King of Diamonds. All right. I'm beat. Fair and square. You won yourself a gun. Ah, uh, thank you. Here, Chester, will you take it? Yes, sir. And now the handcuffs. Here, no! Maybe oh, you're no! under arrest. Uh, why, you of all the sidewinds and double cross and backhanded Maybe. Maybe. Uh, now you're going to stay fastened to me until I get you in a cell, so you might as well make the best of it. Why? You. And as far as that's concerned, you'll be safer in jail than out of it once word gets around. What? People here in Dodge City thought a lot of Herman Bleeker. That little sort of groundhog! That's no excuse for killing him in cold blood. What? You heard him, Mamie. You killed me. Hey, 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 Bleeker! This, 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 this is the biggest, biggest night of my whole life. To hear somebody finally shut Mamie up and make her like it. The marshal's a gentleman, you little weasel! He knows how to talk to a lady. And, 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 and to hear you say how much the town thinks of me, Mr. Dillon. What's this all about, Herman? Well, I... I'll tell you what it's uh, all about. Yes. This little grub worm ran out on me in Cincinnati three years ago. Like to broke my heart. I've been hunting him ever since, and last night I found him. I wailed the living daylights out of him. <laughs> yeah, he looks like it. 
But why did you bury his clothes? Mr. Dillon, would you want to be married to a man that dressed like that? Uh, she, she pretty near murdered me, though, Mr. Dillon. I've been up there in bed all day, just too bruised and embarrassed to hobble downstairs. Oh, we had our ups and downs, Marshal, me and Herman. You know how it is. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, Chester, give me the keys to the handcuffs, will you? Yes, sir, I got them right here in... Well, I guess they're over in the... What's the matter, Chester? Oh, Mr. Dillon, when we were digging out there, I guess I must have lost him. Chester, can't you file that thing any faster? You might just well relax, Mr. Dillon. Took a half hour to get that one off Miss Mamie's wrist. Oh, no. All right, all right. But just hurry. We'll... I'm a filing as fast Matt, as I can. Matt, what? Matt, Matt, oh, Miss Mamie gave me this bottle of Irish here to make the waiting a little easier. And it's Jameson's. Oh, well, fine, Doc. Fine. Uh, Chester, let that go for a minute, huh? And open it up. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Hey. <sighs> Can you imagine it, boys? Little Herman Bleeker married for years to a woman like that. Yeah, I don't wonder what my... Oh, I'd get nightmares. Here you go, Mr. Dillon. Oh, thank you, Chester. Doc. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, here's to the weaker sex. Mr. Dillon, which one is that? <laughs> Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Jeanette Nolan as Mamie, with John Daner, Ralph Moody, and Byron Kane. Parley Bayer is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West. In gun smoke. As colorful as the Western Roundup and twice the fun, that's the Gene Autry Show, which comes your way every Saturday evening over CBS Radio. It's one of radio's most distinctive programs, flavored to taste with songs of the sagebrush and melodies of the mesquite country. The Gene Autry Show is 30 minutes you'll enjoy, packed full of comedy, songs, and the genial personality of the one and only Gene Autry. The whole Melody Ranch gang is on hand to entertain you tomorrow night, every Saturday night. So tune in the Gene Autry Show and hit the pleasure trail over most of the same CBS stations. Clancy Cassell speaking. And remember, Broadway is my beat brings you startling mysteries Saturday nights on the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. 
Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. What's the rush, Miss Kitty? Come on, sit down and have a beer with us, uh, Kitty. I'd love to, Matt, but I just stepped out for some thread. I gotta get back to work. Some thread? That sounds pretty domestic for you, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, but it's an occasion. I'm making a wedding dress. What? Oh, yes. no, Miss Kitty, not you. Oh, my, no. Well, that isn't for me, Chester. Worse luck. <laughs> it's for Artist Nash. It's gonna be beautiful. If I say so myself. Well, if I ever need a wedding dress made, I'll sure come to you for it. Well, I'll be here, Matt. Let me know. See you later, boys. So long, Kitty. She's a, a fine girl, Mr. Dillon. Kitty? Oh, yeah, yeah, she's great. She's... Well, well look who's back in town, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, Frank Craig. Hello, Marshal. Ah, uh, Frank, I never expected you to come back. I, uh, don't know what to say to you. You might say welcome home. Yeah, I might. At least you're honest, Marshal. Sure. Where have you been for the last year? Out west. Wyoming, to be exact. And my sympathy for the peace officers of Wyoming. Man can change, Marshal. Grow up and get over his wildness and start to think about settling down. Some men can. Well, I'm one of them. I don't aim to cause any trouble, Marshal. Came back here to marry Artis and take her with me, that's all. You heard from her since you left? She's pretty as ever. She'll pass. Every man in Dodge was crazy about her. She was my girl from start to finish. Things can change, Frank. She's still my girl, Marshal. Ben Martin might differ with you. Ben Martin? Mm-hmm. That bullneck plowboy? He never had a chance in... What are you saying, Marshal? You don't aim to cause any trouble, you say, and yet you just happened to roll into town three days before Artis is due to marry Ben. You're claiming you didn't know about it, huh? Artis wrote me a farewell letter, Marshal. It doesn't make any difference. Like I said, she's still my girl. She's not marrying Ben or anybody else. Not while I'm alive. Like I said, Frank, Ben may differ with you. I used to chase him home crying when we were kids. I don't think he'll chase that easy now. Ben took over the Circle Bar B. He's got 25 boys riding for him. He's a big man around here. Swings a lot of weight. Marshal, I said I wasn't looking for trouble and I meant it. I came back here to get artists, that's all. If any man tries to stop me, I'll kill him. I'll see you, Marshal. Chester, see if you can find Ben Martin. Have you meet me over at the jail office. <laughs> I thought he was a thousand miles away, Marshal. I didn't think he'd ever have the nerve to come back. Well, Ben, the two of you are bound to run into each other, so I figured you'd better know about it. Uh, what's he expect, Marshal? Artis forgot him a week after he left town. Does he expect to force himself on her? Maybe, you know, Frank. <laughs> For my money, he's a crazy half-wild saddle bum who should have been hung five years ago. He says he's settled down, though, Ben. He's not going to settle down here. Look, Ben, I don't like killings. Now hang on to that temper of yours. Sure, sure, I'll hang on to it, Marshal, just as long as Frank Craig stays clear of me and stays away from my girl. Otherwise, I tell you right now, Marshal, I... Is that you? 
Mortis. We're in here, honey. Come on in. Someone said you were here at the jail. Evening, Mr. Dillon. Miss Nash. I'm sorry if I interrupted anything, but... Ben, you know who's in town? Yeah, Frank Craig. That's what we were talking about, honey. He says he's come back for me. Take me away with him. What do you mean he says, Miss Nash? He came to the house a while ago. He knew about Ben and me, that we were going to be married. But he came anyway. I sent him away. That does it, Marshal. Right, hold it, Ben. Now, there's no harm in him just talking to her. A man's got a right to protect what's his, Marshal. Protection's my business, Ben, and as long as I'm Marshal here, it'll keep on being my business. Now, in three days, you got a wedding coming up. I'd hate to see it ruined by a killing. Mm-hmm. I have nothing against Frank Craig, Mr. Dillon. I wouldn't want him killed. Neither would I. Oh, good night, Miss Nash. Ben. Good night. Think it over, Ben. Don't lose your head. Yeah, sure, Marshal. I'll think it over. How long are we going to have to keep on riding herd on Frank Craig, Mr. Dillon? Oh, just till he and Ben meet face to face and have their say, I guess. My, that Frank Craig sure is a fancy dresser. Silver spurs, red silk handkerchief, yellow boots. Well, now, here's the marshal right on the job. How are you, Doc? Well, Matt... Now, here we got ourselves a nice little killing coming up. Hey, you hope we have, you mean? Oh, no, it's not the fee. It's a romance of the thing. Yes. Yeah, sure. Young man comes back in the West to see his girl, finds she's on the point of marrying somebody Chester. else. Hmm? Watch me for the play and keep me covered, huh? I don't know what you mean. Over there. Oh. oh. Ben Martin and two of his boys, they just came in. I'm going to go over to the bar next to Craig. Now keep your head up. Yes, Mr. Dillon. Uh, you better give me some room, Doc. Oh, well, how are you, Frank? Yeah, I saw him come in, too. You've been standing over there watching me for two hours. Now you come up and speak. I fight my own battles, Marshal. Frank, the way I'm playing it, there's not going to be a battle. Well, Ben, it's nice to see you. Marshal, I'd rather you weren't here. I guess you know that. Yeah, sure, I know that. Don't worry, Ben. Dylan's neutral. That still gives you three to one odds. What more do you want? Frank, we don't need you in this town. You were gone for a year and we got along fine. So if you climb on that horse of yours and ride out again, we'll still get along fine. My girl won't, Ben. You haven't got a girl in Dodge City, Frank. Well, sure I have. And I want to thank you for looking out for her while I was away. As far as she's concerned, you're still away. I might as well warn you, there are a couple of my boys on guard at her house armed with rifles. Ben, I never needed a guard to hold her. If you come within 50 yards, they got orders to kill you. You'll be there from now until the wedding. Oh, yeah. That wedding. I'm afraid that's been called off, Ben. You see, Artis and I have other plans. We got a wedding of our own coming up. Well, you dirty... Hold on! Now, if either one of you draws, he's drawn against me. I wouldn't draw on him, Marshal. I feel kind of sorry for him. So help me, Shut up, Marshal. Both of you. Gonna... Now, you both had your say. And each knows how the other one stands. Well, here's my stand. If Ben wants to keep a guard at her house, it's all right with me. You've had a fair warning, Frank. So stay away. I wish he would try to bother her. And on the other hand, Ben, Frank's got as much right to the run of the town as you or me or anybody else. Sure, as long as decent citizens hide their valuables. You can't go by rumors, Ben. Nobody ever proved a case against him, you know that. A piece of stout rope would prove I wouldn't try it, Ben. 
And if you and your boys want a drink now, go on over to the Longhorn. Stay out of the Texas Trail here from now on. You, Frank, stay clear of the Longhorn. You're quite an optimist, Marshal. Yeah, maybe so. Well, are you leaving, Ben? Yeah. I'll be seeing you, Frank. Come on, boys. Frank, you've got nothing to gain here and everything to lose. Miss Nash has made a choice, and whatever was between you once is water down the river. Why don't you pull out? Because she's still my girl, Matt. I know, and she knows, too. You wait and see. <laughs> Your move, man. Yeah, let's see now. So I move there. You'll move there. Jump in my king, block the whole corner. Nah. But if I move here... <laughs> you remember, oh, Mr. no. Mr. Dillon, you, you can move. No, you don't, Chester. Yeah. No, you don't. I'm playing Matt. Not the both of you. Well, Chester and I kind of run together, Doc. Enforcing the law, that's fine. Playing checkers, no. Matt, <laughs> it's still your move. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. All right. Sex. <laughs> well, I'll be... Uh, that, that's the move I was going to tell you to make, Mr. Dillon. Oh, <laughs> Thanks, Chester. Uh, 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 Doc, you're beat. Let's call a game. Yeah, you sneaked up on me. That's what you did. You snuck up on me. <laughs> oh, well, that's all right, huh? Uh, sure is a quiet night. I figured one of them two would make a play before this. Yeah... Well, if we can get past noon tomorrow with Ben and Artis married. Well, even Craig ought to know when he's beaten. Well, I don't know, Matt. He never did when he was here before. Well, then he better learn. Trying to get a girl to change her mind is one thing. Bothering a married woman's another. You know, Mr. Dillon, it seems to me Miss Artis Nash is the one that could put a stop to all this. If she'd just speak her mind out plain... Matt! They're what? Huh? Oh, Kitty. now what's the matter? With Kitty, what's Matt, the matter? they want you over at the express office right away. You too, Doc. Oh, what's me? wrong? Hold up, Matt. Somebody shot the clerk. He's dying. Will you let me through here, please? I'm sorry, mister. One side, please. Yes, one side, please. All right, stand back now. Give us some room here. Can you get through, Doc? Yeah, yeah, Matt. I can get through. Yeah, uh, stand back. Step back. Chester, will you move him back? Make him stand back. Yes, yes sir, Mr. Dillon. Yes, sir, let me have a look now. Just let me have a look. How does it look, Doc? Uh, well, there's a lot of bleeding, Matt. I don't know. I'll, I'll do what I can. Mr. Dillon. Easy now, fella. You're going to be all right. It was... One man, Mr. Dillon, wearing a mask over his face. Red silk handkerchief. A uh, red silk handkerchief. Oh, Frank Craig's the only man who. Yeah. I know. <laughs> We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, tomorrow night, Vaughn Monroe and his musical company settle down for an evening's melody-making at Duke University. Eileen Woods is Vaughn's guest songbird. Band leader Vaughn, the Moon Maids, and the Moon Men join in playing and singing the top tunes of the week. Enjoy every bit of it tomorrow night on CBS Radio. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. <laughs> Pretty late, Mr. Dillon. Maybe he's 
not going to come back here. There's bedrolls here, Chester. All his belongings. Man doesn't leave his stuff in a rooming house unless he's planning to come back to it. Yeah, he might have got the wind up after he shot that clerk. Maybe he just hit the saddle and lit out. No, not Frank. That's one thing about him. I've never seen him scared. He'll be here sooner or later. I can't figure him, Mr. Dillon. He must have needed the money awful bad. Yeah, I guess so. My, this hiding out in the dark gets on a man's nerves, don't it? <laughs> yeah, it sure does. Help some if we could just smoke. I don't suppose... Shh. Somebody's coming, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I hear him. That's him, all right. Now watch it, Chester. All right, hold it, Frank, and don't move. It's Matt Dillon. Uh, uh, thought it might be somebody else. Light the lamp, Chester. Yes, Mr. Dillon. Frank, I understand you left the Texas Trail right after dark. Nobody's seen you since. Where you been? Just friendly conversation, Marshal, or is this official? It's official. Then I guess I won't answer that. I see you're still wearing that red silk handkerchief. Any reason why I shouldn't be? Marshal, what's it all about? Murder. If that express clerk dies. I ask you, what's it all about? Where's the money, Frank? The way I seem to get it, somebody held up the express office and shot the clerk. You're accusing me. I didn't do it, Marshal. Where you been? Sorry, Marshal. You're under arrest, Frank. No, I'm afraid not. See, that would ruin all my plans. You better lay your gun on the table over there. I'm sorry, Marshal. Some other time! Look out for the lamp! Grab him, Chester! Don't shoot, but grab him! Oh, he went through the window, Mr. Dillon! Never mind, Chester. Grab a blanket. Let's get this fire out before it burns the whole place down. Come on! Matt, don't look so sour. In an hour, it'll all be over. Uh, that kitty, I'd be a lot surer of that if I had Frank Craig locked up in jail. No trace of him, huh? Not a sign. Then forget about him, Matt. He could be halfway to Wyoming by now. Well, I wish I could think so. I wonder what artist Nash is thinking about him. What business has she got thinking about him when she's going to marry Ben in an hour? <laughs> I'm afraid you'll just never understand women. Well, who does? Frank Craig's a born drifter. He'll never settle down. He's wild as a range colt. Never been broken, never will be. And sooner or later, he'll come home tight across his saddle. How any girl can get herself interested in a man like that beats me. Not me, Matt. I know exactly how a girl can get herself interested in a man like that. What? I'll see you at the wedding. I got to help artists finish dressing. Morning, Miss Kitty. Good morning, Doc. <laughs> hey, good morning, Matt. You working up your courage? What for, Doc? I'm not getting married. Uh, how's the express clerk? Oh, he's bad. And he's getting worse. I don't think he's gonna make it. What about Frank Craig? Nothing, not a sign. I think he's still around town somewhere, but we can't Morning, Mr. Dillon. Well... Doc? Doc, look at that. Well, look at that. And the alpaca coat... Borrowed shirt, green galluses, and the pink silk tie. <laughs> oh, well, Chester, I haven't seen a get-up like that since I hauled out of Boston. <laughs> well, I figured it was only due respect to the bride. Uh, well, where, where's your gun, Chester? Oh, goodness gracious, Mr. Dillon, you can't wear a gun to a wedding. Well, at this wedding, even the bridegroom's wearing a gun, Chester. I'm wearing one, and so are you, so you better go get it. Meet me at the church. <laughs> So pretty, I wish I was marrying her myself. You better forget it, Chester. Ben's got enough worries as it is. 
He sure does look fidgety, all right. Yeah, he's got reason to. Room for me here, Matt? Oh, yeah, sure, Kitty. Oh, here, Kitty. slide right in here. Yeah. Here we are. My dearly beloved friends and neighbors, it is the privilege of all of us to be gathered here together in the sight of the Lord and in the presence of one another for the purpose of uniting this man and this woman in the bonds of holy matrimony. It won't be long now, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, the sooner Matthew the better. Barbara Artis Nash and Benjamin Martin, there is, I am sure, no need to <coughs> emphasize the solemn and sacred nature of the great institution into which they are about to enter. I never and heard all of this before. Above and Do you still the want to marry her, Chester? Beyond and above the decay and corruption of the flesh and the devil. Your manifest presence as you come here together and forsaking all others stand hand in hand to have to have and to Frank Craig. He's just standing there, Mr. Dillon, just standing there and looking. Slide out to the side aisle, Chester. Maybe we can get to him quietly without breaking up the meeting. I think it's already broken up now. I just fainted, Mr. Dillon. She fell right on the floor. Yeah. Come on, Chester. Pardon me. Uh, would you let me through, please? I I'm sorry, lady. Would you... One side, please. Huh? He, he was right here by the door. Outside, Chester. Uh, hell, no sign of it. Matt. Did you find him, Matt? Not yet, Ben. <laughs> Put that gun away. You want to kill some bystander in the crowd? There's only one man I want to kill. I should have done it three days ago. Yeah, I know, Ben. What'd they do with Miss Nash? They carried her into the minister's study. That dirty, low... Walking right into the church. Scared her out of her wits. Marshal. Marshal Dillon. Oh, over here, Reverend. Marshal. A terrible thing has happened. He forced his way into my study, pushed me out the door. Craig? Yes. He had a horse tied behind the church. He's gone and taken her with He's him. He's kidnapped her, Matt. He's kidnapped Save him. your breath, Ben. Get your horse. Come on, Chester. Let's ride. I never did think we'd get back to town, Mr. Dillon. I'm saddled, sore, and beat. Yeah, Chester. A hundred men hunting him, and he slipped past all of them. I swear I just can't figure it. <coughs> Any trace of him, Matt? Uh, uh, not a sign, Kitty. Some of the boys are still beating the riverbed south, but I don't know. Guess he kind of made fools of us, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I guess so, Chester. Mash! What? Any luck? Uh, yeah, sure, Doc. Oh, bad. Yeah, mine too, Matt. That clerk died a half hour ago. Mm. So now it's murder, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, now it's murder. Hold up, boy. Well, let's go into the office and get out a bulletin. A bulletin. What a good dad will do. <laughs> Light the lamp, will you, Chester? Yes, sir. There we are. Mm -hmm. Hold it, Matt. You too, Chester, don't move. <laughs> the only place nobody would ever think of looking. Right here in the jail. Yeah, that's what we figured. Well, Miss Nash, you seem to be in pretty fair shape for a kidnapped victim. I'm not a victim of anything, Mr. Dillon. Unless it's my own foolishness. That's what most people would say, I guess. Maybe they're right. I only know this. When Frank came back to town, I knew then that it wasn't over and never would be. I'm Frank's girl, Mr. Dillon. For better or worse, right or wrong. I'm going with him to Wyoming. He's wanted on suspicion of murder, Miss Nash. He didn't do it. He couldn't have. He was with me when it happened. What did you say? He slipped past Ben's guards and came to see me. 
That's why he wouldn't tell you where he'd been. He didn't want to get me in trouble. He's telling the truth, Marshal. Yeah, maybe. Mr. Dillon, you might ask Ben Martin what happened to my red silk scarf. I missed it right after he came to see me that afternoon. Go on. He didn't do it for the money. But to ruin me once and for all. If we were lying, we wouldn't have come here, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it makes sense, all right, but... It... Chester, who rode up out there? It's Ben Martin, Mr. Dillon. I think he's coming in here. Where's your horse, Frank? In the corral back of the jail. All right, go out the back way. Get it and head for Wyoming. Take one of my extra horses and leave it at Bison Flats. You can buy another horse from the Indians there. Matt, I don't know how we can ever thank you Never for mind you. that. Just get going before I change my mind. And uh, good luck to both of you. Thanks, Mr. Dillon. Anybody here? Yeah, come on in, Ben. Saw the light on. Figured you must be here. Any sign of him? What's the matter? The clerk died. Why'd you do it, Ben? I don't know what you mean. Where's the red scarf you stole from Miss Nash? I gotta arrest you for murder, Ben. I don't think so, Matt. I don't think I'm gonna let you do that. You've seen me draw before. Now you better give me your gun, Ben. Don't do it the hard way. What you call the hard way, Matt, may be the easiest way of all. So win or lose, I guess... I'll... <laughs> Something fell out of his pocket there. Yeah. His marriage license. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Herb Ellis, Viffy Janis, Tom Tully, and Bar Barney Phillips. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Thank <laughs> you.